brought us to a screeching halt. It made our network still powerful and very high performing, but in a lot of ways brittle. We were afraid to change them. We were even afraid to implement better security policy because it meant massive network change. And, and that just can't be. We needed a way, we need a way to be able to adapt and evolve our security policies without complicating the network. Better yet, I want to get back to the simple network I had in 1999 without a VLAN segment for every different group of users and devices and logins the world around. And that's where adaptive policy comes in. With adaptive policy, I can get back to my simple network designed to be as easily routed as possible. And I can layer on top of that security groups using Cisco's proprietary security group tagging, available only on Cisco switches, and it allows us to do micro-segmentation by group, to apply different security policies to every group within our sites without complicating the network. We can deliver both power and simplicity. And if you do it uh, in, in the Meraki way by applying your groups globally, once you set up your different groups and group policy in a single site, you can then roll that out across your organization to tens or hundreds or thousands of sites in just a few clicks. And SGT, security group tagging, isn't brand new. We've been doing this at Cisco as part of TrustSec for years. But by making this simple, we can drive the dream of not just delivering this technology simply by using dashboard and making it as easy as possible, but actually simplifying networks back to what they were really designed to be and layer security on top of it. And I really want to take a look at this in a demo. So if we could switch to the demo, and we'll take just a really quick look. My demo team, here we go. My, my demo team has built out this network for us. And he told, us, he told me it's, a, it's supposed to be a chain of burger stores. So that's why it has a burger up there. His last name's also Burger, so I don't think that's the real reason uh, it has that. Um, but this is just a simple test network. It has three sites, and the first one is designed as a legacy site. So here's store one in Denver in the US. And if I wanted to set up segmentation here at store one, I could go into my security appliance, and very easily, I could set up the different VLANs required to segment into the different groups. This is the old way. Uh, here are the different segments, and, and, and you're all familiar with this. I've got a segment for IoT and a segment for employees, et cetera. And then on the Meraki dashboard, it's pretty easy to go into the firewall rules and be able to craft different policies uh, for a different group. And here are the different policies, and you can see there's comments. Management to terminals is not allowed. Terminals to IoT is not allowed, et cetera. And as the sites get bigger and as the number of groups increase, then this complexity gets harder and harder to manage. And we need more sophisticated rules and automation and the complexity can become crippling. It's why most systems don't print out all the rules in a row. It just looks, because it just looks crazy, right? But we, could, we can do better, and that's what adaptive policy is about, and that's why we've shifted the Meraki switching roadmap to a Cisco Silicon uh, strategy. Here is what a new and modern site will look like. Store two, which is in San Francisco, um, of course, all the firewall stuff still works, but we don't have to use that anymore. Instead, we can go to our adaptive policy screen. And you can see adaptive policy isn't held in the individual network, but it's held organization-wide. So these groups are, are uh, true across my thousands of sites, or in this case, just three. I have unknown, I have Meraki internal employee. I'm going to just add a group for IoT devices. Oops. I was told this keyboard was crazy in it, and they're right. OK. So here I've got a new IoT group. And that group now is able to, did it add? Sorry. I'm going to try again. I'm going to learn how to use this keyboard. But anyway, I can add a group. I assure you, I could add a group. Um, and if I wanted to, I could go back. Alex Berger is going to add the group. For me. Oh, come on, man. It wasn't just me. 
All right, anyway, don't worry about it. So I can add groups, I assure you, I could add a group. And then I have to be able to assign that group using you know, authentication. Every device has to be assigned a group, just like we would assign a VLAN. Now, many of you use ICE to assign policies and VLANs in your infrastructure. Of course, you can do that now. You can assign a group, an SGT group, an adaptive policy group using ICE. But if you wanted to, you could also have a VLAN set up for a default adaptive policy or a switch port, and it's just the same way you would have done that assignment in the past. In wireless, I can go to access control. And now, in addition to setting a VLAN, I can also set up an adaptive policy group, and I can pick from one of my groups. I can do the same thing with a switch port. Uh, I can look at every single switch port in this entire site, whether it be 100 or 1,000. I could pick one of these devices, like this terminal device, and now I can pick an adaptive policy group to assign to that as well as just having the, um, the VLAN assigned. And that gives me real power, real ability to set not just how the packets are routed, but what tag, what security policy will be applied. And this is the most important part. Organization-wide, I can go in and set up micro-segmentation. So now, by switching to my policy page, I can see which groups are allowed to communicate with which other groups, and I can set this globally across my entire organization using secure group tagging and the power of Cisco Silicon. So if all of my terminals today, the terminals are only allowed to speak to unknown devices, untagged devices, everything else is blocked. But if I wanted terminals, for example, to be able to communicate to other terminals or to employees, I could push that change and off to the races I would be. And now terminals can speak to other terminals and other employees. And I can control this all globally and I can do this using adaptive policy, using micro-segmentation at a global scale. It, it gives you an incredibly, um, incredible amount of power, and we can use this power to simplify our networks and to use fewer features to do more. And I think that's really the, the dream of Meraki, to simplify powerful technology. And we can go back to the slides for just a minute. So the next thing I want to talk about is the Meraki gateway, and there's, there's not too many slides here, so, oops. Uh, so, so don't worry. This is the new uh, Meraki gateway, and we've just launched this uh, three months ago, two and a half months ago. And it's a very simple device. It's a square, but, but look how beautiful it is. It's so simple. It's beautiful. And, and I'm, I'm, I am really proud of this product. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it does, it does something that's very simple. It is a, it's a cellular gateway. It runs LTE. You could plug it into any router, whether it be an SD-WAN router from Rocky on our MX platform, or an ISR, or a V-Edge appliance from Zella, or even a competitor's products, which I know none of you would ever use, but you could. And you could turn into a next-gen wireless WAN device using a Meraki gateway, an MG21. It has internal antennas, but there's an external antenna system. It's designed to be the simplest to deploy wireless WAN device in the world. It really is incredibly beautiful. I have it mounted in my house, and I love it. But maybe more than that, it's powered by the Meraki dashboard. The real power of this thing isn't that it's a great LTE gateway and a NAT device, and it is. But the power of it is that it gets, it inherits 100% functionality from the gateway, from the dashboard, rather. And the dashboard gives it real visibility, real historical analysis, real understanding of what's really happening on the cellular network for the first time. And we need that. We have to take this thing to the next level, and we have to make cellular gateways a mission critical part of how we build WAN networks. WAN, wireless WAN and, and mobile gateways like this, this is the future of SD-WAN. Every SD-WAN site is gonna have a mobile gateway, at least as a backup device, at least as a backup connection, if not for day zero or primary WAN. And we have to make this mission critical. We have to automate it and control it using our regular networking uh, expertise. And we could jump over to the demo for just another minute. This is a site in San Francisco that we've been running for a while using the Meraki Gateway. And you can see there's a ton of devices on it. Uh, we like to test every product in Meraki, so we, we have a wired fiber connection, you should know. Cisco sprung for it and everything. But, um, but, but we've been running this gateway for a while. And if I pull it up, of course I can, I can set it up, but you'll see in a lot of ways what we've done is leverage the power of Meraki. It looks just like every other Meraki device. I get this historical connectivity graph, I can see that I, 
I might have had an outage in the last day or the last week here. Uh, cellular devices don't identify themselves with MAC addresses on their network. They identify themselves with IMEI uh, identifiers. So you can find that here. And if you, want, if you needed to know that in order to order another SIM card or onboard in your service provider network, it's available on dashboard. But maybe more importantly, and this was just added recently, we have full uplink statistics available for this device. You can see the signal strength is not that great on this device today. And I've got you know, a poor signal strength. But I can see what's really happening. I can look at live data across the network on my cellular links. And I can see historical data for the last day or week or month. And I can really understand what's been happening with this cellular connection, not just the, uh, the bandwidth and the jitter, uh, the, the latency and the loss in the bottom here, but the real RF signal strength on my 4G modem. That's RSRP is signal power and signal quality. And I could see signal power and signal quality over time. I can give real feedback to my service provider, to enterprise service provider who's giving you, you know, real SLA over their wireless WAN. And should that SLA not be met, you can give them real data and show them why. Right? And we can finally take the power of Meraki and use it to manage wireless WAN, to hold our service providers accountable to their SLA, and to drive wireless WAN into the mission critical world, not, maybe not even just as a backup, but as a primary connection over time. I'm incredibly excited about this because I really believe that this is the future of SD-WAN. SD-WAN is going to have to be wirelessly enabled. Now, obviously, this isn't the last Meraki gateway, mobile gateway we're going to build. This portfolio is certainly unfinished. There's going to be gigabit LTE and 5G after that. There's more historical analysis. The number one request we've had on the Meraki Gateway portfolio has been about alerts, having live alerts be whenever the signal strength or quality drops below a certain threshold, whenever jitter is too high, whenever a backup wireless connection might not meet the SLA, should it be called into service, our customers are looking for alerts, and we're, we're building that stuff right now. Of course, this product is unfinished. And that's really the story of all Meraki products. I get a lot of questions about the Meraki portfolio, especially uh, weeks like Cisco Live. You know, Meraki's come so far, now that the, the Wi-Fi portfolio at Meraki is so complete and so powerful, do you think you're done focusing on that and you're gonna be moving into other technologies? Are you gonna start focusing more of your effort in other places? And of course, we do focus in other places, but the wireless portfolio isn't done or complete our Wi-Fi 6 rollouts are just beginning. The concept of wireless health and the analytics and machine learning that can be used to drive troubleshooting and understand what's really happening in our networks, that stuff is just beginning. Our wireless, one, can we go back to the demo? One more, one more minute. Our wireless portfolio is far, far from complete. And that that's the way it's supposed to be. In fact, the dream of Meraki is that when you buy a Meraki product, as powerful and as great as it, as it is today, that is the worst it will ever be. When you buy that product and install it, that is the worst it will ever be because it will always be improving. We are pushing updates and improvements to this product all the time. And in my last minute, this is, this is the demo I want to show you. This is a very, very long-standing customer, and this is one of our official demo networks at Meraki. And I assure you, this will be the only 802.11n, three generations old Wi-Fi demo you get at Cisco Live this year. These are the APs on this network. And the newest of them, the newest of these access points, was deployed in 2011, nine years ago the newest of them. I know because they're noted in the notes, new deployment, 2011. And this, these access points have been automatically upgraded every six months, every nine months for the last decade. In fact, our newest and greatest wireless troubleshooting applications run on these access points. I still get historical data and analysis. I get usage statistics, deep packet inspection showing per application based bandwidth usage, and our wireless health product, the absolute uh, highest end AI-based wireless uh, assurance and wireless troubling, troubleshooting product uh, in the market. Wireless health runs on this, the MR12. That's been shipping, that, 
that we started shipping more than a decade ago. It was up, this one was upgraded just a few months ago on version 25, the newest and greatest Meraki uh, feature. And this MR12, it is still unfinished. We will continue to improve it and roll it out. It's supposed to be unfinished. The portfolio is always getting better, and I can't wait to see what you'll do with what comes next from Meraki. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. How are y'all? Good? Um, it's going to be a fun 30 minutes, let me just say that. Um, and you're going you're gonna to enjoy it, I'm pretty sure about this. So, where do I start? Data center innovation. Um, really, the way I want to look is really like this gentleman all day long, and I'm pretty sure you want to do this. Uh, and so, this is more the inspiration where we want to be when we talk about how the network is running. You really want to be in that position and saying, yep, everything is fine. So a lot of the things you're going to see, what, I, what I'm going to talk about today and what I'm going to present, you're going to hear actually from some of our customers around, how do we get to the state <laughs> that operating the data center is actually becoming easy um, and pleasant. And this is clearly a task that we need to do across what we're doing on the Nexus switching side, on the controller side, what we do with operations tools. Uh, what we do around programmability and APIs to get to that state that it becomes seamless and easy to operate. So with that, um, come back to innovation. You know, innovation is kind of a funny word. Everybody loves to talk about it. Uh, and it's really not about just, oh, I have a cool new idea. It's really about, does the innovation help uh, to get you where you need to be to deliver the outcome? And so that's why what we picked here really is uh, a couple of topics to work through this. But before I dive in, uh, I just want to point back, you know, we have to, once a year, there's a lot of things that came out in the last six months from Cisco around data center innovation. I just put a couple of on here, whether this is around the ACI extension into Azure, that I don't know whether most of you know, we actually officially announced this in November, and it's available. We did ship our first Phonic X switches, which is a little teaser, and I will talk more. And obviously, we do a lot of work on how do we do hybrid cloud and how do we operations around this. So lots of innovation happening. Again, all of this was to focus on how to make it easier to operate cloud infrastructure. So with that, um, let, me, let me set the seam a little bit, besides it needs to be easier. But there's a second very important piece uh, that needs to come together, which is really the infrastructure automation in itself is important but it really needs to connect with the application automation in the front end. Because in the end, whatever we're going to deliver as a network service is driven by what the user in the data center, which is the app, needs to get done. And so what I want to talk about in the next couple of minutes is really how these things tie together. What we can do around connecting application automation with infrastructure automation. That's my number one. Number two is, what we're doing to help you with the infrastructure automation, in particular the day two around analytics, to make this, instead of trying to figure out what uh, issue is where, to make this much, much easier to deal with. And then obviously, I'm going to end and talk a little bit about infrastructure itself to make sure you see where we're going on that end. Um, with that, let me dive in. Uh, how do we link application automation with infrastructure automation? And I picked some tools here. I'm not saying these are the only tools out there, but I stick, picked some tools. And really the buzzword that everybody talking about is infrastructure as code. And what I'm going to show is how do we these, use these tools that application developers typically have. And I'm pretty sure if you ask your application teams, they would say, yeah, of course. We use Terraform. Yes, we use Jenkins. And then he says, yeah, I use ACI. And how do we bring these together? And the idea really behind this infrastructure as code is that you can automate the whole stack from the application deployment to the infrastructure deployment. You can translate all the manual tasks in a piece of software and then execute the software. And you can rely on practices that are very, very well known for software developers and application developers, how they manage different versions of code, how they check in and check out code, and actually apply this to how to run the infrastructure. And you're probably looking at me and saying, Wow, does Thomas say that I want you to all learn how to code? The answer is absolutely not. What I want you to work out of after this is 
to see how simple that actually can be when you use tools, actually when the app team uses the tools that they use today, and you actually can plug in with what we have as ACI and seamlessly integrate. And to show you this, I want to actually invite Lionel up to state, stage. Please join me, Lionel. Uh, Lionel is a technical marketing engineer. Uh, he used to be out of Brussels, but we got lucky we moved him uh, to San Jose. But Lionel is going to work you through a little example how this whole workflow from the front to the back is actually working. Thank you, Thomas. So first, we have, as Thomas was saying, we need to have an app. So the first thing we have here is the app we are going to work with. It's a very simple app. It's a client and an application. The client needs to talk to the application for the business uh, reasons. And we want to have a zero trust policy. We want to limit as much as we can what it can talk to. So we are only allowing them to communicate with each other and to communicate with our application automation platforms because we need to be able to manage it over time. The things to be able to do that, we are going to need a few tools, the tools that Thomas showed us. We are going to put them inside a workflow. We are going to build a whole pipeline. You will hear that word a lot in the, the CI-CD uh, world. We're going to build a pipeline of tools that are ingesting each other. We have here Terraform, GitLab, Jenkins, WebEx team. And then we have the infrastructure piece. We have the VMware, the ACI multi-site multi orchestrator or ACI fabric, and your app. So let's start with the number one, the Terraform. So in infrastructure of code, I, have, I had to show you code, right? So here we have the HCL language, the ASHICorp configuration language, which allow you to define infrastructure as code for a whole bunch of elements. ACI is one of them. So in ACI, you can develop your EPGs, your, your whole configuration using that language. When you have written your language, you have to take version of them to be able to roll back and, and go forward. So that's where we go around GitLab and Git repositories, where we will commit our change locally and then push them to the central repository. That gives us one auditing, one element to manage. A good feature around GitLab or Git repositories is that every time somebody push code, it can trigger a workflow. And in this case, it can trigger the next step, which is Jenkins, our pipeline manager. Talking about Jenkins, Jenkins also has some code. So you can write your pipeline in JSON, which is itself not really code, but text files. And you can pull that in the same repository, because Jenkins can pull that file out of a repository and just use it. So you have one place of all your configuration for the pipeline, for the application, for everything, is that one repository. Every time you make a change, it triggers the whole pipeline. But the pipeline looks more like this when it's configured. It's a series of steps that Jenkins can measure every step, how long it took, did it go well, did it go wrong, and what happened. So for every one of those steps, you are going to get feedback from it. And feedback is quite important. That's why we have added into the systems a continuous feedback loop. We are using WebEx team to be able to do some, something that we call chat ops. We are using WebEx team as a feedback loop to users to see how the pipeline went. And if there is an issue, you, are, you receive a notification from WebEx team, and then you can go see your Jenkins. That's really part of it. Now the last part is the application itself, right? I have pushed the code, I have modified my, my infrastructure, and now I deploy my application. And my application itself is also very dynamic. Yeah. It's its own code. On, on, on that note, let me go back. On that, on, that, on that note, right, so you just work through, I have this application defined, and we know these app developers, they want to change something. What happened? So if you want to change something, it's all code. So you just modify the code, push it back, and restart the whole pipeline. Everything is the same process, which makes it very easy to just re-trigger it, ah. re-trigger it, re-trigger it. Very cool, very cool. So, show how does it actually look? I think everybody in the room knows how ACI works, I hope at least. So how does it actually look? Yeah, so the important piece for ACI in this is that zero trust policy, right? So we want to isolate the different elements so that they, they can only talk to what on the ports they need. In ACI, we have that whitelist policy model. So we create groups, EPGs, which contain each of the elements, and then we define the only element they can talk to each other. So here you can see the three EPGs we, we are using in this element, the admin and the two uh, web and the uh, client. And then we are using contracts to say what they can talk to each other. Each of those elements 
contain the endpoints that we have defined. And, and you can see each of the endpoints. It can be container, bare metal, or any uh, different system. So it's really the system, uh, the complete application, and zero trust because it's only supporting those ports that we have defined. So when you say zero trust, you really mean what I think most people think is like there's a whole segmentation done. Is that, is that really what this is? Yes. So they, can on, they are segmented in their own little zone, and they can only talk with the other ones on what you have defined that they can talk to. That is very amazing. Thank you. Thanks this a lot. This is a cool example. I really appreciate you walking us through. Uh, and yeah, thank you, Lionel. I, I, hope, I hope you took out of this, if, if you look at this, I really kind of take the tooling on the front and that your app development team has, describe what you want to do, and then just roll it in and, and deploy the infrastructure, the configuration that you need for the app automatically. And you literally can, as I said, as a code, and you saw Lionel showing us, you can roll and roll and update. The other good piece about it is, and we didn't show this here, the same will work if whether the application sits in your own data center on an ACI fabric or whether you extend this with ACI anywhere into Azure and AWS. It's the same thing. There's no difference. So that's the link between automation that your application team wants to do and the automation that you probably want to do on the infrastructure. So now let me come to the second piece. Let's assume you got this all done. You're happy that you automated the first part of your day. Now comes the second part and the next day and the next day. How do I make sure that I actually have a good stat on that my infrastructure is running as running how it should be? And so here's a set of tools that actually we had for a while with this assurance, and we're adding uh, something called the Network Insight Suite or Network Insights capability to make it so much easier to really move from a more reactive to a proactive approach in monitoring the service of the infrastructure. And so what I want to do here is really um, give you a little glimpse. I don't expect you to actually see all the details, but this is like a GUI front end. It's a software extension that is built into your existing ACI APIC controller and as well the DCNM for Nexus Fabrics. It's the first time you're going to see from us a set of tools that's the same. It works across both Nexus and ACI, and that's where we're going to go. It makes your life really, really easy because you can run it either for one or the other or both. It's the same look and feel. Um, one piece I do want to point out, and has a little bit of a pride, everybody talks about telemetry. Everybody talks about analytics. What is special here, what we can do is you see this, like you have a good view with telemetry, the standard variety, garden variety one. What you really want is what I call better or advanced telemetry. You really actually see what you want to see, which is the ability to correlate flow information that goes to the switch with the status of the switch. That is something where you do need a sensor in the hardware. And then if you have a Nexus 9000, you have this for the last three years. You now can actually turn it on and actually put the amplifier there, and you're going to see it. So with that, uh, I do actually want to uh, introduce a good customer of ours, which is Bosch. Uh, and the reason why I want to introduce them, because they're a user of assurance. Um, Bosch, as you might know, German company. No coincidence, I'm German. No. Uh, leading global supplier of technology, 400,000 people worldwide, has different division, mobility, industrial technology, consumer goods, uh, energy and building technology. Uh, Bosch was looking for a data center solution that really helps them scale out and map better what they want to do from a business strategy with what they need to do, uh, and what they need to do on the business strategy to map this to what they need to do on the technology side. And so with that, I do want to invite Jan Holtzman up on stage. Jan was Bosch for 14 years. Uh, he is now responsible for designing, building, running. Hello, Thomas. The network, the central network, and the global core. So thanks for joining me here, Jan. And let's talk a little about, um, yeah, we can actually just stand here. Yeah. Just talk a little bit about why did you pick, or why did Bosch actually, it was you at that point, why did you pick the Cisco Assurance product? What was the motivation? First of all, Thomas, thanks a lot for inviting me here on stage with you. So great question, why did we pick it? So this was for multiple reasons, to be honest. But the major important reason there is really, for day two operations, we want to increase our efficiency in that area. Yeah. But let me elaborate a bit more on that one, what I really mean about it. We are now with ACI since around about three years in a productive state. And we had been very successful with that one. And the key for it was automation. We, 
Immediately from day one, we invested in our automation tool suite, and the first part was really having zero-touch deployment scripts available so that we can spin off new ACI fabrics once Rack and Stack from the DC Optim was completed. On the second side, we also invested in a kind of framework with a front end, with a self service front end, which we handed over to our customers, to the server teams, to the storage teams. And with that self service framework, they leveraged our code to deploy all of the ACI configurations on the interfaces they required for the daily use. So earlier, they forwarded tickets to us with requests please do a configuration on the interface. And now they are doing it whenever they require it on their own. So we had really been successful on that topic. Yeah. And we rolled out a lot of fabrics over the years and did a lot of migrations from Brownfield into the ACI, spinned up new environments for Greenfield topics. But when, it's, when getting more and more business in the data center, it also means that you need to deal with all the events in the APIC. But on the other hand side, of course, also, we are doing that for business reasons. That's, that sounds really interesting. And I think what I really just picked up on is you did actually some of this front end automation to make it work with the infrastructure yeah. automation. So looking back, I think you were here two years ago when we actually came up with Assurance. Two years in, I know you have a bunch of fabrics. So what's the, what's the experience so far? Our experience is so far really good. So we have deployed around about 30 multipod fabrics around the globe, scaling from 20 leaves up to 400 leaves oh, right wow. now. Um, when we started now leveraging network assurance engine for our own purpose and at this stage, we wanted to do this also very efficient. So we yep. leveraged the sketch Eula, which is integrated in the network assurance engine, so we could attach multiple ACI fabrics to one single assurance engine. And that's for two different reasons. It's a great way. First of all, it reduces the amount of web front ends, the yep. consoles for our operation center. And on the second hand side, it also reduces the infrastructural cost because we only have to deploy it once. Oh, that's awesome. So this is already a great topic on that side. And on the other hand side, we now were able, we have a central network operation center at Bosch. And these guys are dealing with different types of technologies. Yep, yeah. They are not only there for the data center purpose, they do campus LAN, Wi Fi, load balancing, and stuff like that. So they are now experts of each and every technology. We are now leveraging the ability of Network Assurance Engine that, and enable them to take over more and more responsibility within our day two operation business. And we already started to handing over the responsibility for day two operations and event handling for multiple fabrics to them. Sounds like, sounds like a real win. Of That's course it is. That's very interesting. And what I really like, once Germans are moving, they're moving. <laughs> <laughs> so, since I'm here and you're here, you know, that's a chance. So maybe like one comment, what are you looking for? Maybe what we could do more? What are some of the additional features? Okay, let me start with that one. I have seen the insights topic and I also watched it a bit on the world of solutions, what it can do basically. It looks pretty good from, from this perspective because it really closes the gap in the day two operations. Yeah. So far we are mainly looking a bit about the configuration compliance or the policy on this side. Now we are getting also tools for the data plane operations. And that's a great opportunity, and I think we'll have there a closer look in. Oh. But on the other hand side, one challenge back towards you. It's now really challenging. We have the APIC, we have Network Assurance Engine, we have Enhanced Endpoint Tracker. We are getting maybe insights. Yes. So we have a lot of different consoles, and we have a, one operation center. They deal with a huge number of consoles. So my flavor here would really be go in the integration way for a single pane of glass or something similar. That's great feedback, by the way. I can tell you the work is, in a, is underway. Maybe we're 12 months from here. Let's see where <laughs> we're going to go. Uh, you, will, you will see some good integration. We start off as Network Insights. You will see things coming together. Right, so, great. But Looking thanks forward. for the feedback. So maybe last, last sentence, if you like, look like two or three years ahead, where do you think this is going to go? Where should we go together on this? Oh, I have a dream, Thomas. <laughs> Let me tell you the story behind that dream. Um, it's a couple of years back, and I attended an early preview of Network Assurance Engine, yes. which was held by Tom Etzel. Ah. <laughs> and this was in the really good old times. The tool was still called Candid, and we yes. all, all of my team, they still Most like this old name. Most of you don't know this, probably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but the great story at this time was he presented the tool, how it is behaving. So having the policy on the one hand side, the configuration, yeah. the intent, having the fabric state, bringing this together, and it immediately was clear, basically, for me, it can become a game-changing technology if you're going in a direction of auto-remediation, you can detect a fault, you could solve it automatically, yeah. and then 
that would be the dream, basically, because we were close to a self-healing network and reducing the downtime so the customer might not even recognize it. Okay, that sounds, sounds like we are moving in the right direction. Yeah, it's a challenge, so I know. I really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing, Jan. Great. Uh, look forward to work closely going forward with Bosch, and it's a beautiful partnership. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. So with that, automation on the application, infrastructure automation, data analytics. Now, you probably wonder if this is all good, but is Cisco keeping up with the infrastructure under the hood and modernized? The answer is of course. And I do not think that everybody of you needs 400 gig today, but for the 50 people I can count that needed, we have it. That was a joke. Uh, my last section, so we do invest in 400 gig. You actually see the pictures here. You actually can touch these boxes if you go down to the data center corner. Uh, again, I don't expect everybody to use 400 gig. What I do see is the need for building out an infrastructure that over time can get there. And as you might imagine, every 400 gig port can be used for 100 gig. So if you know that you're in the next one or two years or three years need to move there and you don't want to replace, you can actually build with confidence at this point. Um, these are standard Nexus 9000 switches. We have Nexus 3000 switches. You can extend the infrastructure you have today with the same capabilities you have today. Everything you just heard about, how we do automation, will work here the same way. But anyway, I don't want to go really into the switches itself. What I really want to do is actually bring one more customer on stage, which is OVH Cloud. So Alan, uh, join me here. Alan is the, and I'm, I'm, I'm really bad as a German pronouncing French, uh, <laughs> but Alan Fiocco is the executive vice president of product and CTO of OVH Cloud. The quick thing I probably should do, OVH Cloud, French company, very, very impressive company. The third largest cloud hosting provider, you have like around 400,000 service, which is a large number. And what is really interesting about is a lot of your customers are startups, and you take them when they're young, when they need agility, and then they're growing. But maybe we're gonna talk a little bit about what is OVH focusing on? Uh, I know it's the customer experience, and you're really not just looking at the data center, but the edge to the data center. Maybe you can explain a little bit why that is, and you know, what are some of the considerations you sure. have there. Sure, thanks, thanks for inviting me first. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, at OVH uh, Cloud, what we do is uh, we provide hosting services for uh, VMs, bare metals, websites, what, what the traditional cloud uh, provider would do. But the thing that we are doing perhaps slightly differently from uh, anybody else, is uh, we believe that the, um, the network is actually a complete integral part of the service. So first, we're not charging for traffic, neither ingress nor egress. So if you bring your workflow into a VH Cloud, you, you get access to the full capacity of your workflow without having any surprises when it comes to paying the bill, basically. But in order to do that, Something that is very important is that we, we have deployed a massive uh, backbone, and this backbone is actually connected to peering points with no congestion point at any point in the network, which yep. means that you know, we have 20 terabits of capacity in the backbone, which exa equate exactly 20 terabits of peering points capacity, no congestion whatsoever, all the way up to your servers, and so you have access to the full capacity. That's, that's, that's a very impressive approach, and you know, I know, but part of it is you, wanna, you wanna, don't want to have spikes and then don't know what happens, or you don't want to have uh, DDoS attacks, which I know are very common yeah. in the hosting world. Great. So that's your concept from the edge of the data center, but then what do you actually see happening in the data center? What is around bandwidth? I know when I first time came out, one gig, and now I know we're more like, where are we going? Well, we, so 400,000 servers, as you can imagine, not every, not every one of them will be connected at super high speed. There are still <laughs> a, a lot of them that will be connected at relatively slow speed. However, at the top end of the line, uh, our bigger servers are actually going to be connected four times 25 gig, uh, two times for public network, two times for private network, so that the customers can basically decide where he wants to, to right. manage that. Uh, that goes into a non-blocking multiple lanes of 100 gig fabric. Um, which is going to evolve over time to 400 gig once we, we have the need for that. Uh, the next phase is going, in particular for storage, we're going to bring 50 gig, multiple times 50 gig to the servers and then yep. 100 gig. 
Um, the place where we're going to deploy 400 gig is um, primarily in the backbone. We have multiple data centers yep. on the uh, US East Coast that we need to connect with much higher capacity than we do today. We have so many 100 gig lambdas that we need to groom that into 400 you need, gig. You got the big pipe. Exactly. Step after that is um, we have campuses where we have multiple data centers. So the entire connect will be uh, 400 based, and then that will move into the fabric right. and so on and so forth. And so this is the interesting piece about us because Alain has the, the Nexus 3400 in, which is like 400 gig capable, it's like 12.8T. But as I mentioned earlier, not anybody jumps to 400 gig. So yeah. really the idea was, can I get large scale 100 gig and have the option to go to 400, yeah, right? So, That's so, so we tested those works with 400 gig, obviously, but yeah. uh, the first deployment is actually happening right now. And uh, we're deploying 100, 128 uh, uh, 100 gig yeah. interfaces on the fabric, right? So uh, that's, that's, that's the current deployment. That's very impressive. That's very impressive. So maybe uh, to close after this, uh, to close on this, so this is like the bandwidth story. Some other trends, maybe the future of data centers, I know you have a lot of ideas there. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's bandwidth and it's services, right? Yeah. So, so what happened with the, um, when you operate an infrastructure like a mega scale provider, um, the, the real challenge is not so much bandwidth. Of course, you need to increase bandwidth uh, over time. But it's actually how do you deliver the services at those speeds, right? And continuously having to increase the capacity of delivering complex services, network services, at higher and higher and higher speed, um, quite frankly, I mean, the cost is getting out of control, right? Yeah. Uh, if we continue to grow at that kind of speed, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to cope with those network services. So the, um, the future for us is going to be to disaggregate switching capacity with network services. And in order to do that, um, it's also going to, for us, is going to simplify dramatically the fabric, the network fabric. And we're going to have network services proxies or, or servers, if you wish, that will deliver the services to the customers. So in order to do that, a lot of ideas, but we're looking at yeah. having an IPv6 only fabric, uh, which we are deploying today already for certain customers, um, and using SRV6 to be able to send the traffic that requires additional services onto the farms right of servers. And by this way, we can actually have two different scales that will grow and progress at their own pace. Interesting. Very interesting concept. I think the reason. I'm so intrigued, besides obviously, it's a successful growing company, which is awesome. Uh, it's a lot of interesting thinking through how to architect correctly, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we see this with a lot of other customers as well. How do I balance the need for bandwidth and where the service need to be, and how do I build actually really cost effective? Which kind of comes back to, in the end, how quick can I get the service up and running and be profitable? Yeah. With that, uh, thanks a lot. Thank I you. really appreciate the uh, joint partnership. And thanks for sharing today thanks, the OVH story. Thank thanks, you. Alan. Um, I hope you got a little bit of a sense uh, of all the uh, innovations we have cooking, we delivered. You got some uh, stories from our customers. And clearly, there's more to come. Uh, and I'm not going to be here and pull like, the rabbits out of the pocket, so to speak. But there's more to come, right? There are some of the terms. I just put them up here, but that's cloud first. How do we help the networking team if they don't want to deploy the fabric on-prem and just try it on the cloud and then make it easier to port it back? There's things around ultra-low latency. You probably heard a little bit about this company uh, that we have around ultra-low latency NICs and switches. There's a whole story on S3 WAN and how we bring this together with ACI. Uh, there's edge computing. OEH is probably in that bucket and there are others that have capacity in the edge and how to build data center service there. And then clearly analytics. We brought out these application set. Jan made the comment, make this easy to consume. Uh, and one of a little glimpse, and this is just a teaser for you. You don't have it yet. But you probably saw this Intersight tool that runs as a SaaS. You can log in. Today you can manage your compute and your storage. Imagine there's a little tab popping up and there's networking as well. So that's just an idea what you probably should expect to come from us around analytics as SaaS, analytics as a simple integration. So with that, uh, I do want to say thank you for spending 30 minutes. Um, we're right in the demo floor, the show floor. I think this is a picture from last year, but it's the same thing. 
the data center demos are all in the corner if you go this way. Everything I talked about, all the products I mentioned, you can actually see and you can get more detail there. So really appreciate the time and I will hand it back to Tony. And welcome back to the studio coming at you live here in The Hub. I am Steve Moulter. I'm joined by my friend David De La Cruz. How are you this afternoon? Hey, Steve. We get to be on set together. I, I, I think it's the first time this week. I think it's the first time this week. I want to remind you to keep reaching out to us all day tomorrow. The rest of the day today, hashtag C-L-E-U-R on all social media. We are paying attention, I promise. Anytime you post, we are going to post right back to you. So keep connecting with us. So David, we just wrapped uh, the last innovation talk of today, Thomas Scheibe. Um, Nish is going to be with Thomas in just a moment. We'll keep an eye on things out front. But his real target is digital transformation. And I, I just keep believing that digital transformation has got to be one of the most powerhouse themes of the show this week, right? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. I mean, digital transformation is one of those things I think that's on the tip of every single customer's and partner's tongues. Um, you know, in, in, in Germany, uh, where, where I'm active, uh, there's so many companies that are trying to improve the pace of digitalization because um, you know, it's, the opportunities for growth are there, the opportunities to improve your processes are there, and at the end of the day, our customers' customers are demanding it, so it's got to be there to go. And it's integral to the internet of the future as we continue to talk about what that internet service delivery is going to be, again, with the rollouts of Wi-Fi 6 and 5G. Uh, integrating your network, integrating your operations is going to be a huge part of that, and again, digital transformation, I think, is at the core of that. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, I mean, if you, even if you think back three, five, or seven years ago, the pace of change has been incredible. And think about you know, how you and I used to work five years ago, it's completely different. We were just talking about our notes before, actually, right. how that has been digitally transformed as well from old paper cards to you know, digital note-taking system that we have now. Ooh, talk about your transitions. Nicely <laughs> done, my friend. I'm looking out here into the show hall. It looks like we have got Nish Parker out there with us, uh, hopefully in the innovation talk area and with Thomas. Yes, Nish? Yes, I'm here, and I am here with Thomas Scheibe. So Thomas is our VP of product management here covering data center, and he's just finished here at the Innovation uh, Talk Theater. So Thomas, how are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for asking. <laughs> You're very welcome. So um, you just talked about NAE, and obviously yes. there's a lot of customer traction, but tell me a little bit more about this topic and what you want people at home to Absolutely, take away. absolutely. So NAE is one of these acronyms. It's really the Cisco Network Assurance product. Uh, we actually introduced this two years ago here in Barcelona. I just had one of our customers, one of our really great customers on stage, which is Bosch. Uh, the product is actually deployed with more than 300 customers at this point. Uh, very well adopted, and customers really like what they can get out of this in terms of assurance function around their intent and what is actually configured in the, in the infrastructure. So, yeah, product is well received and clearly a lot of additional development going on. Got it, and I think you were teasing at the end of your presentation there a little bit to, to give people an idea of what to expect next. So tell us a bit more about what, what's up and coming, what's next for us? Yes, there was a little bit of a tease, but I think what I, maybe before I go to the tease again, uh, what we basically announced this week is the extension of Assurance with Insights, and so we call it the Network Assurance and Insights Suite, which is uh, basically bringing out additional capability that will work with the existing fabrics that our customers have. To not just look at Assurance, but also do uh, better troubleshooting as well as a more proactive approach to guaranteeing service quality. And so that is actually more than a tease, that is actually product available. But yeah, there is a tease, there's clearly more ideas around how can customers actually consume this, how can they use this, and obviously there's some ideas around, could we make it easy on the cloud, can I actually pull out my phone and just look it up here? So there's some of those ideas, and yes, clearly there's probably more to come. Absolutely, so year after year, Cisco Live, it gets bigger, it gets better, and obviously we've got a data center section here in the world of solutions, yes. so tell me a bit about the data center presence at the show. Yeah, if you, if you actually want to see and touch these things, everything that we actually talk about in the innovation session is available to see, to, to touch literally the switches, the hardware, including 400 gig, those are actually there. You can see all the controllers, you can also the monitoring tools, you can get a really beautiful um, walkthrough and demo interact with some of the engineers that actually built the products. So I highly recommend it for the people that are actually local. The ones that are online, they're a little bit out of luck, but a lot of these are also available as uh, cloud demos. So I encourage you to take a look. Definitely, so virtual demos online, but also coming to Cisco Live year after year, actually getting the experience, meeting yes. with the engineers and seeing the technology in yes. person. So you had that, guys. Let's take a look at a few videos around data center. We'll be right back. Okay. Intent-based networking has transformed how data center applications are deployed. 
bridging the gap between business intent and underlying infrastructure. But day two network operations paradigms are still largely reactive. Network failures are often accepted as part of IT operations, costing companies money, time, and even consumer confidence. By providing continuous verification, Network Assurance Engine ensures that the network is doing exactly what it's intended to do. Cisco IT has been at the forefront of software-defined networking and automation. We have deployed over half of our application portfolio spread across 17,000 endpoints in our ACI environment using automation. By continuously and proactively modeling the network, the Assurance Engine provides instant visibility into our SDN network and predicts where failures are likely to occur. We can now remediate any issues before they impact our clients, ending our reliance on rudimentary operational tools and low-level troubleshooting techniques. Rather than relying on custom scripts to identify network faults, Assurance Engine provides us instant validation of the entire network all the way down to what's actually programmed on the hardware. The appliance itself took just minutes to deploy, and within the first hour, we uncovered numerous network faults previously undetected using standard monitoring tools. We've cut down the time to identify and isolate problems, driving down our overall mean time to restore. Today, the Assurance Engine is the first place we go for problem management to validate that the network is behaving as we expect. With NAE, we have transformed how we execute network changes. We use NAE to validate all network changes to check if new alerts are generated. This validation goes beyond checking for human errors, assuring us that no stale configurations are left on the network. This drastically reduces the risk of an outage when changes get deployed. Since NAE deployment, Cisco IT has seen an overall increase in our operations efficiency and productivity. We have reduced our mean time to restore by two-thirds. We see 20% shorter change windows and we're able to remediate bad changes faster. And the predictive model is the only way to evolve and remain competitive. The Cisco Network Assurance Engine is the key component to this new worldview. Cisco Network Assurance Engine. Disruptive innovation that gives you the edge in running network ops. The only constant in life is change. And so it goes with our networks and data center infrastructures. Change is good. It means the business is growing, that new opportunities are being created. Change can also be risky. It can add complexity. It turns out we become apprehensive when we can't see what's about to happen. No one wants to be that guy who fat-fingered a subnet, misconfigured a switch, or, or programmed the conflicting deny policy that brought down the application. But what if you could predict failure? What if you could know the impact of any and all changes before they were made? You might be less afraid. Cisco's Network Assurance Engine mathematically verifies the entire data center network for correctness. It continuously builds the most comprehensive and mathematically accurate models of the network across intent, controller policy, the configuration and data plane state of every network device. And then it runs thousands of checks based on over 30 years of Cisco's operational domain knowledge. And with this, the engine can instantly pinpoint any deviations from expected behavior across the entire network. Here at the top is a timeline of the system. These dots represent analysis points against the network so that you can look back in time, like a DVR. And just below this is a dashboard of issues that the engine found in the fabric. Now, if we look at the change management section, you can see all the change-induced errors across forwarding, the security policies, fabric configurations, and more, both syntactic and semantic errors. These errors manifest as smart events. In a single view, the smart events pinpoint exactly what went wrong, where, why, and how to fix it. Simply put, it's a virtual expert, an incredibly smart one, watching your back and giving you candid feedback continuously. So instead of eyeballing your changes, doing spot checks for weeks in the lab, hoping that these changes are correct, you can now have the assurance, the confidence that your changes are correct and consistent with your intent instantly. More assurance means less anxiety for that to-do list. Get faster change approvals due to exhaustive checks against your policies. Reduce risk for changes made in production. 
Simplify audits with a trail of what changed and how it impacted the network. Reduce uncertainty in migrations and eliminate stale configurations and policy drift. Funny thing is, none of these concepts are new. Software developers have long had a rich set of tools from IDEs to version control, functional testing, build testing. It's no surprise that DevOps has been so successful. Well, the Cisco Network Assurance Engine promises to bring that agile development paradigm to network operations. Now you can take the guesswork out of networking and embrace change because change is good. Do you need a network for 5G? Or Wi-Fi 6? Yes. And only one network delivers both. I'll join you remote for the meeting. Tim, we're on in two minutes. Can you review the client deliverables? Okay, WebEx. Start my meeting. Okay, joining meeting. Hey, Lisa. You ran Asia Pacific. Yep. Do you know Henry? I sure do. Getting to know you. Getting to know all about you. Getting to like you. Getting to hold you like me. Getting to know you, putting it my way, but nicely. You are precisely our cup of tea. Getting to know you, getting to feel free and easy. When I am with you noticed, suddenly I'm bright and breezy, because of all the beautiful and new things I'm learning about you, day by day. Introducing Cognitive Collaboration, the right information for the right people at just the right time to build stronger human connections and help teams work smarter together. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
We're here at Cisco Live Barcelona 2020 and we're asking everyone, what would you say to your friends or colleagues to get them to come to Cisco Live? Come over, it's fun and you learn a lot of things. There is a lot to do and not enough time. Pick what you want, go to the sessions, come to the world of solutions, mix it up. You not only learn Cisco solutions or the partnerships with other companies, but also you mix and mingle with the customers and peers, and it's really fun. It's a great experience. You have to visit the world of solutions to see what's up and coming. So it's good to see the partnerships that Cisco is building and progressing the future of technology. Experience Cisco, experience technologies, help your business to be better and greater. Meet people with the same interests, good location to get together. I have already texted some of my friends, they have to come next year. Now that we work in a digital world wherein we tend to do a lot of work from home, this is one opportunity for us to meet face to face and this is one opportunity for us to actually interact and get to know one another. To see really lovely people, people um, who want to help you. Yeah, I'd say take the chance if you can go here, it's super exciting, you will learn so much, just do it. And that really is exactly what it is all about. If you have never been to a Cisco Live before, as you just saw there in that video, come down, be a part of it. We want to have you here in the room with us to experience all the excitement, the people, the noise, the technology, everything that makes Cisco Live truly the greatest event ever, whether it's here in EMEA or in the US, wherever you happen to be, come and be a part of it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, it is Thursday morning here in Barcelona. It's our final day of the show. It's hard to believe that we've arrived here. What an amazing amazing week it's been, starting with that opening keynote and then all the way through driving everything that is Cisco. Wherever you happen to be around the world, we're so glad to have you on the live broadcast. Remember, please keep reaching out to us all day long using hashtag C-L-E-U-R. We're going to be with it right up until the end of the closing keynote this afternoon. And for all four of us hosts, uh, myself, Steve Moulter, and then also Nish and David and Zane, we want to talk to you guys all day long, so please stay right with us. Right now, though, we're going to kick things off with Maybe one of my favorite people here at uh, Cisco. Somebody who, as far as I'm concerned, we do not have a complete Cisco TV broadcast without having our own Susie Wee here on set. Uh, I don't get to talk to you this time, but we've got the great Chintan Patel here with us in studio, and the two of you get to have a great conversation. I'm just going to stand over here and listen, so Chintan, go do what you do best. Good morning, and thank you very much. And I know, you know, you talked about the keynote, and we finally got Susie on the show, which is great <laughs> to see. So thank you, Susie, for making it. Thank you for you having me. You were on stage on the first day. It was such a fantastic session. And you shared some exciting updates around DevNet, and, and what I would arguably say are some of the biggest changes we've made in certifications for Cisco in our history. So could you absolutely. tell us a little bit more about that because I'm sure everyone wants to hear. And you're absolutely correct on that in that we've had Cisco certification program for 26 years mm -hmm. and this is the biggest change that we've made in 26 years. And what we have is with the new Cisco certifications, there's a CCNA, a single CCNA that cuts across architectures brand new. CCNP, CCIEs, the, CC, the technology concentrations. Mm. So with all of these, they are entirely new to bring you the newest technologies and make sure we have the engineering skills that we need. Mm. But in addition, what we've did was add an entirely new set of software certifications, DevNet certifications. So we have the DevNet associate, mm -hmm. the DevNet professional, uh, technology concentrations with the DevNet specialist. Mm -hmm. And what this is going to do is prepare us for this world of infrastructure expertise and the world of software expertise coming together to drive the network of the future. And there's been a lot of buzz. So have people started to take those exams now? Are people getting immersed in them? The exams are ready for yeah. all of these yeah. on February 24th. Fantastic. So February 24th, 2020. So that's the people key are day. signed up for these, they're yeah. ready to go, and it's really exciting. Okay. And, and you shared something at the keynote around perhaps a select few that might be a little bit lucky if they get their exam <laughs> certifications? Yes, yeah, so we know that, uh, 500, yes. So, you know, we know that our CCIEs are very proud of the number and they deserve it. They work yeah. so hard for yeah. that. But we have a new chance with these new DevNet certifications and what we're going to do is we're going to recognize the first 500 people okay. who get any DevNet certification okay. and they'll be the DevNet 500. Fantastic, so you heard it folks. It's a great opportunity to be part of this exclusive club and I think we might have some exciting things in store for those 500. Now, 
The other thing I noticed here at the show was um, a lot of people actually building things on top of the, uh, the platforms that we're providing through DevNet. Um, what are some of the things that people, you, you've heard here at the show that people are building, the integrations and the applications? Yeah, so what happens is, once again, now our entire portfolio is programmable. It has APIs, it's an entirely new network, which means that a lot of people have been working on things like automation and struggling with how do I automate my networks? And if you take a look over there in the DevNet zone, then what happens is there's a lot of people who are getting very hands-on with the APIs, who are really thinking about how do I use this in my entire workflow to automate my infrastructure. Mm. And once I get into that automated infrastructure, then we have another set of people who are looking at what are the applications that I can build and accelerate mm -hmm. by having control into the network. So we have interesting IoT applications, mm. you know, robotics applications that are using edge routers that can host applications. You know, we have things where we can use the network is a sensor to feed up both security, you know, yep. threat intelligence, yep. network is a sensor, and then provide more insights. And then people are coupling to their business where they want to know, hey, how can I actually drive my business? You know, so if I uh, bought some infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have a, a major coffee shop mm -hmm. that has uh, basically bought SD-WAN infrastructure across the globe, they've used wireless, and after we've kind of gotten them connected really well, they said, how can I know my worst problem, which is when someone's waiting in line too long and they walk out of the store. Right. The infrastructure tells you that and that solves a business problem and we can solve that with our wireless. Fantastic, and, and I know there's a lot of work going on across EMEA. Uh, you know, Kuhn Jacobs and Julio Gomez have been driving our programmability initiative. Your team's been really supportive of that. So what can people expect uh, in, in the region who are watching the kind of things that are yes. coming out? I am so thankful because the DevNet community is a global community, mm. so people say, where are all your people? Are mm. they all in the US? It's like, no, from the start, it's global, but it's because we've partnered. We've partnered with our SEs, we've partnered yeah. with like every country, and actually, you've been doing a lot of innovation and work for DevNet, so you can talk about what we've been doing together. Well, we love it. It's, it's having such an impact with our customers and our partners. We're seeing a lot of transformation happening, you know, certainly for partners here, the ability to build things for our customers on top of the platforms that we're providing, exactly the applications you said, uh, new revenue streams, new opportunities, which is really important, but solving business problems, right? I mean, Absolutely. I think that's what it comes down to is, is can we give better visibility, telemetry into the things that are going on in our customers' businesses? You know, and what's been fantastic is by working with people like you, with our SEs, with our customers, with our partners, then that's hands-on touching with helping solve their problems, help them give them the skills they need, help them think about the business solutions they can put together. So we'll continue pushing that with our SE Maker movement. One last thing, as you finish this event, there's another big event happening in March. Do you want to just share a little March? bit about that yes. to the audience? <laughs> so we love our Cisco Lives and the DevNet zones at our Cisco Lives. Mm. And what we have also is a standalone DevNet venue called DevNet Create. And we're holding DevNet Create in March. And what we do is we hold it in Silicon Valley. It's in Mountain, Mountain third View, one. California, third one. Right. And what we do is we bring together app developers yeah. and infrastructure developers. Mm. So this world of like the app dev and the infra dev, they actually come together on here. And what's happening is that the app developers, you're like, do they really need the infrastructure? Do they care about that? They get so excited to meet the Cisco infrastructure developers, mm. like the partners who are out there and say, yeah, I deploy the infrastructure for the city of something. And then an app developer is like, what? My app could actually work in that city because a Cisco partner can get me into there. Exactly. So it's a whole new opportunity and DevNet Create is where that combination happens. Fantastic, we can't wait to make it there. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank DevNet you Create is going to be awesome. Steve, back to you. Now I feel like our broadcast is complete. <laughs> we got our Susie in here. DevNet is such a superstar and such a rock star here, always at this show. Thank you for the time in Chintan. Great Thanks job so as always. We have got an exciting morning of broadcast ahead of you. Right now we are going to go out to our Cisco advocates with what we call one of our advo chats. Uh, this time we're going to have an advo chat on enterprise networks, and as soon as we're done with that chat, we are going to come right back here into the studio, and we're going to have a great conversation about what's happening in small business. Make sure you stick around for that. As always, if you want to speak with one of our Cisco sales representatives, great, they would love to talk with you about all the exciting new technologies and cool things going on, so reach out, cisco.com slash go slash say. Working in IT presents some unique challenges. I think I got a virus. Traditionally, we've needed an IT person on site to deal with any issues 24 hours a day. But with the Meraki dashboard, we can monitor our networks and troubleshoot issues from anywhere. So the IT team finally got to take a happiness day. We went to the beach. Tracy really took advantage of it. 
no regrets. Glad to have you back live in studio with us. We are in a great segment right now. We are going to take a moment to speak with and recognize our phenomenal sponsors here at this event. Very, very grateful for them. And we're going to begin with NetBrain. And I'm going to turn my attention over to the left this time, where I've got Jason Bodro here with us, VP of Marketing for NetBrain. How are you, Jason? Hello, good, Steve. Good morning. Nice. We were talking a moment ago. And again, I was able to walk by the booth yesterday. You guys were jam-packed, giving yeah. loads of demos. You got a divided area. You were so busy in the middle, I couldn't even walk into the booth. So congratulations. Thank you. I want to start by talking talking a little bit about uh, network operations. First of all, do you guys really believe that network operations do in fact need transformation? And if so, why do they? Yeah, and why now, right? Because why I now? think a lot, of, a lot of it, one of my favorite things about coming to Cisco Live every year is understanding what's going on in the industry and the transformation. And of course, we're hearing a lot about the transformation from what was typically physical networks to SDN and ACI. And of course, now it's SD, WAN, and towards the public cloud. And the thing is, you know, one of these technologies isn't displacing the other. It's really augmenting, right? So networks are becoming more heterogeneous, end to end. And so much of this automation that's, bringing, uh, that's coming to the network is, is bringing simplicity through abstraction, but when things go wrong, the complexity still lies underneath the surface. So teams in the operations side are struggling to troubleshoot and respond to incidents amongst all that complexity. So let's talk about the NetBrain approach. What exactly do you offer? What is the primary story that you're telling to customers today and throughout the week? Yeah, so NetBrain, we're a network mapping and diagnostic automation solution. So we talk about network automation in the context of incident response, day two uh, troubleshooting automation. So, so much automation today has been focused on the day one, right, provisioning. Right. So we think it's time for automation to come to day two network operations, and that's what we mean by by NetOps transformation, uh, bringing in uh, automation and augmenting every existing workflow with that automation. So what is that workflow? It's an incident response workflow. It's a ticket that's coming in, typically from a service now or a BMC remedy, right? And, and a typical enterprise organization may have hundreds or thousands of these tickets every day. So something that's happening with that volume, that's ripe for automation, right? So we try to augment those workflows from the, the moment a ticket comes in to the moment a ticket closes with two things, with visibility of the network and with you know end-to-end -end visibility of the network and automation. Very, very good. Let's talk a little bit about medium time for resolution because we hear it pop up all the time. It's one yeah. of the catchphrases that we hear wherever you go. Yeah. What are the challenges that we face in MTTR and how do we begin to overcome them? Yes, so especially, I think the, the, team, the, the term MTTR, it's so overused, right? But the, yeah. the, the, the real part is the mean, mean time to repair, the average. So to improve an average of something, you have to be continuously and systematically better over time. And so we think automation, the approach with automation is through a continuous feedback loop of lessons learned and, and every incident has some sort of a, a resolution and there's a lesson to be learned about that problem. So we ask ourselves, if it took four hours to troubleshoot a problem, is it going to take four hours next time to troubleshoot a similar problem? The answer should be no. We should digitize the lessons we take from that, uh, that event, codify some sort of diagnostic automation, and ultimately from left to right as a tipic gets escalated, it should be shifting that workload to the left, right? Less escalation from tier two to tier three architects, more uh, driving that automation, driving that workload down to tier one response. We even think there's opportunity to drive workloads to what we can call tier zero. Before a human even opens a ticket, there's opportunity for automation to augment through maybe an API triggered automation from a ServiceNow ticket, for example. Do you see in the future that we may actually reach some level of standardization in terms of the practice and how we do what you're just explaining? I think pr quite possibly. I mean, if you look at, you know, we talked to hundreds of customers uh, throughout shows like this and, and we under, you know, try to understand what is your troubleshooting process. And so much of it, it follows a very typical workflow, the day, you know, the life cycle of an incident. A, a problem comes in, it's usually a ticket. There's usually a, an IP address. Usually it's a source and a destination of an application, for example. So can you, can you standardize the mapping of an application flow? Can you embed that, map, that mapped application flow inside of a ticket? What are the top three to five things that you should be checking for when you troubleshoot? Well, why don't you just automate those and embed the diagnostic response from that inside the ticket? And then, and then there's, there's a, there's a curveball there, which is there's going to be a, a wild card of things that you can never anticipate, right? So how do you, how do you automate something so reactive and shoot from the hip like troubleshooting? So it, it has to be absorbing lessons learned continuously and, and ongoing so that every unknown problem eventually becomes a known problem. And then those known problems have associated known diagnoses and those, those diagnoses can be automated. And this is a deep embed for NetBrain in terms of how you are responsive in this way with your particular customers. Are you just really hand in hand on a daily basis with them to get to these points? Yes and no. I think the thing we try to do is we try to integrate into their existing workflow and we try to 
to augment that with automation, but more importantly, we have to provide a platform to enable the customers to drive that automation themselves. Automation has to be customized uh, to the unique network, to the unique use cases within that network, so ultimately that's why a platform has to be there, and, and, and a low-code or no-code way to automate that helps network teams, not DevOps teams, not programmers or scripters, helps network teams create that automation. And, and the part of the network transformation, the NetOps transformation, is who is the automation for? It's not for just the people that build the automation, the, for the few. It needs to be for, for every network engineer, it needs to be uh, able to access and use that automation. So an enterprise that has 100 or 1,000 network engineers, they need to have that automation at their fingertips, not just one or two people, but, but everybody. Absolutely. Every day. All right, so for those people who are with us here on the streaming broadcast and not live here in Barcelona, if they want to get more information or they want to get started working with NetBrain, what would you like them to do? Yeah, so certainly if you are here, we're in booth number seven in the world of solutions. If you're not, uh, if you're not here at the show, so visit us at netbraintech.com and learn more. And if you're interested to see what sort of mapping and visibility automation looks like, uh, you can uh, basically get a, an evaluation version of NetBrain. All right, fantastic. Jason, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you so much thank you. Uh, for your sponsorship here. We are really grateful for it and for that partnership that we have with you at NetBrain between you and Cisco. And uh, congratulations on the great work that you've been doing. Great, thank you, Steve. Welcome to AdverChat. So this is the area within Cisco Live where you can kick back and relax and enjoy hearing from Cisco customers who'll be sharing their experiences on how Cisco technology have helped them tackle challenges that they may have had in their businesses and how it's helped them achieve their business goals. Now it's relaxed and it's chatty and we want to hear from you as well. So at the end of our advert chat, we're going to be having some Q&A. So the title of today's advert chat is Enterprise Networking and we're going to be talking to the senior network architect of Riva, one of Europe's largest uh, supermarket chains and we're going to be finding out just how you can quantify the real business value that customers are seeing from artificial intelligence and machine learning in Cisco's DNA Center. So please give a warm welcome to my armchair guests, <laughs> Hans Vasters, Senior Network Architect from Riva International AG, and Cisco's own Boris Elgar, EMEA Enterprise Networking Marketing Lead. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're looking forward to hearing all of your stories. Uh, so Hans, number one spot in Austria, that's pretty impressive, and, uh, and leader in food retail. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty good going. So could you please give us a bit of an overview on Riva and your role within it? Yeah, okay, so Riva is a big re retailer in Austria. We, we are located in uh, 11 countries all over Europe, from Russia to Italy. So we have uh, approximately 5,000 stores in Europe. Um, and in fact, I think around 60 warehouses. In each country we have, of course, a headquarter and they're all connected through the network using Cisco components. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Boaz, please could you share with us your role within Cisco? So I'm uh, part of EMEA for Enterprise Networking. Been around for more than 16 years, so nice. it's been fun. Oh good, oh, that's good to hear. Um, so Hans, what does your network look like at the moment in terms of locations? You mentioned multiple locations. Mm -hmm. And what tech solutions do you have in place? Yeah, in fact, uh, as I said before, we have a headquarter Never. in every country. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have uh, in each country, of course, the stores and the warehouses. Uh, they are all connected either through leased lines or yeah. IPsec-based uh, internet VPNs. And uh, in all together, we are have implemented that net network uh, using around uh, 11,500 switches, 750 Cisco routers. Um, we have approximately 20,000 access points uh, controlled by 100 wireless LAN controllers. Uh, we are using the Cisco VAS for wide area networking optimization. Uh, we are using Cisco firewalls for security. So the let's say the old ASAs, as well as the new FTDs. Uh, we have proxies from Cisco, so the WSA, so almost everything you can think of. The yeah. Cisco shopping list, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> 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 oh, brilliant, so plenty yeah. of Cisco smattering in there. Yeah, and in fact, the hub is Austria, in our case. All the countries are connected, so uh, in Austria, 
we have the, the services on the internet, so the DMZs, but uh, as well as the connections to the warehouses and the stores. Uh, and each country is more or less a copy of Austria. So the setup, let's say, is straightforward. Uh, that doesn't mean that it is sometimes not a little bit complex, but yeah. because it's always a copy, we try to overcome some complexity. And I, and I think that, you know, I spoke with Hans earlier that their network is so critical to their business mm -hmm. because all the warehouse, everything is on that. Um, what other things do you have there that are running that are so critical to the company? Yeah, when we start with the stores, of course, it's our ERP system that is used in the stores um, for the incoming goods as well as for commissioning, so to, to do their orders. Uh, if this goes down, um, in fact, we cannot deliver goods to the store, so we cannot sell anything. Uh, then we have the warehouses. If the stock management, the uh, store management application goes down, we cannot receive goods because they cannot be placed in the warehouse. And, and trucks cannot... Yeah, one time we had the, uh, we, we were even in the news because we caused traffic jam on the highway. Oh, right. Because the trucks could not be unloaded and they had to queue up and uh, they were all the way down to the highway. And that was in the so news. the network is very critical to the business. It's not, you know, it's not nice to have. If, if the network is not working, that's really serious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Baez, could you tell us um, what is intent-based networking? Oh, that's a long, a long question. But yeah, intent long really is the, uh, is the future of how networks are evolving to. Mm. Instead of starting and managing each and every one of these devices, uh, companies started actually, the first was software-defined network, really managing via controllers. But intent-based networking and what we do it in Cisco called Cisco DNA, digital network architecture is a, a closed loop. So first you have your business requirements. Okay, what do you want users with applications, how it's gonna work, okay? And to do that, instead of going in each and every device, you wanna do it with just a dragging of, a, of an icon and everything happens. So for example, if I have all my IoT devices, I want them to be only in specific places. So that's one critical part. How do I take the business intent and transform it into the actual operation all the way to the infrastructures, all the way to the IoT devices, to the printers, to anything out there. That's a lot of things, especially in net networks like uh, um, Reve. But the second point, which is even more, and what we're going to talk today about, is actually feeding back to what was happening there. So if there is any issues, you would like quickly to be able to notify and do even the changes. So, and this is where we're going to the future with artificial intelligence where actually before issues happen, the network will be able to solve them. So you have first the business requirement translated and going all the way to all the networks, but also understanding all the things that are happening, mm. telemetry, all the information, which is a lot of it all going back and giving you a very clear information what's happening and what needs to be done before anything happens. So that's really in a nutshell what intent-based networking and Cisco DNA, digital network architecture. Okay, oh, great. And, and when we talk about assurance, what, what is assurance? Assurance is really taking all the loads of information out there, okay? All the logs, all the SNMP, everything, and really taking all that and making something sense about it. And, and I think uh, Reve and Hans can give you some great examples I'll give you just maybe one. Uh, uh, yeah. Imagine, yeah, you have a customer who says, um, last week I was in the office on Monday and I had a, not a great experience uh, with my mobile. Something didn't work uh, nicely. In the old days, what Hans used to do, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is start going to the different logs, to the routers, to the SNMP and everything. It could have taken hours to find out and going backwards, no chance. Assurance, one clear example is I can just go back in time and really understand if it's the mobile device, if it's the access points, if it's the switch, if it's the router, anything, I'll be able to have a very clear understanding and saying, you know what user, actually the issue is that you didn't have the latest, uh, um, you know, 
software or something like that, or the, the Wi-Fi, there were too many people there on that point, we need to fix that. Okay, so that's really a, a, an example of how assurance makes the life easier. Yeah. We like an easy life, don't we? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and so Hans, what were the reasons that you started working with Cisco DNA Assurance? Yep, um, we were always in a discussion with Cisco on how to do things, to do things in a better and a smarter way. Yeah. And uh, we always discussed about how can we achieve to get a better all of uh, all over experience for our users. Uh, how can we solve problems faster? And uh, also, we, we are only a team of nine people, so uh, it is very because in fact most of the times all the people are pointing at because we are in the middle and. Uh, we also have the problems with the workload, so it, we, are, we are also looking to get a smarter tool to be able to give some task away to the first line support, to the hotline. Uh, and that before it was not possible, but that were three things we were thinking about. And with DNA Center, we found a solution or an, an, an approach for this. Yeah, so, so what would you say then that the DNA Center has really solved for, for Reva? Yeah, in fact, um, now we have a better overview of the network mm -hmm. from my point of view. It's, um, uh, we could free up resources in our team yeah? Yeah. because it's not even a problem maybe to get an additional head uh, in our team, an additional head count. Uh, but then you, if you get that approved, you still have the problem to find the knowledge, the knowledge which, uh, people on the market. And it's, very hard to find knowledge with the people on the market. So, and I think that is something we could overcome with the DNA center. Yeah, we now the, the, the hotline, the first line support is better equipped. Yeah, we can explain them in, so, in short sessions what information they can get out of the DNA center. And so they are able to solve problems and, uh, on, the, on their own and they don't have to call us all the time or to yeah. pass a ticket through to us. Which makes a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we can focus more on projects, we have more times uh, to work on, on, on future uh, developments and things like this. Okay. I think that, you know, usually when you start a project, you usually ask three things. How can I save money? How can I make money? And how can I stay out of trouble? <laughs> and I think in insurance specifically, you know, one of the great things about it, it really saves time and saves money at the end of the day. Yeah. So instead of wasting the nine people chasing after their tail, trying to find out really, is it, you know, this issue or there, if I can do it in, you know, minutes, that's a huge saving. And it also, you know, it helps with the security as well. Okay. Um, so, what do you feel are the key benefits that Reva is getting from, from AI specifically? Um, the key benefits, um, as I explained, bef bef now we could give away the task, the first right, line, the yeah. line. And um, the key, well, one of the key benefits is, it's, um, you know, let's say for me, it makes my job more easier. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a tool that makes your life easier. Yeah, you, you have all the information on your fingertip. You don't have to look around. Um, and it's, it's, it starts with, typically it's a problem if a, if, a, if a client, a customer calls and says he has a problem, maybe he gives you a wrong explanation and you start to look at the wrong end and it takes you one hour to understand what was his real problem to come to a conclusion what is the root cause. So and I think that is a key benefit. Now you have a better overview and it's easier for you even if if the users give you wrong, wrong information uh, we have, we can be more proactive yeah that is also one key benefit i think yeah. um, another important thing for us also the dna center helps us us to do a better capacity planning and all that stuff you can imagine yeah because it the dna center is a central point it has all the information and we can get everything also yeah. yeah. And, and I think if I can add, I mean, solving the issues is great, but what artificial intelligence gives you is the way to really have some benchmarking and really understand in a specific place something is wrong. So maybe you can explain about the uh, branches and how, you know, you have 
Yeah, with a with a, a AI network analytics, with a, uh, artificial intelligence, you get additional information. You get additional tools that you can use for different purposes. Yeah? For example, you have the network heat map, and if you look at uh, a particular store, at a particular warehouse, you can see, for example, it gives you a cap different KPIs. One KPI is the uh, average data rate a client uh, had to connect to the wireless network. And if, if it always has a, had a low data rate, then you can think, okay, maybe there's really something wrong with the wireless network because if you have a good wireless network, a good quality, then the client should connect to high data rates. So the average should be high. Yeah, another example is maybe we can also use a, the site comparison. So um, not every store is like the other one, but most of the stores on the field look similar. Yeah, or in fact, they are definitely the same. They're the same building. And then you can compare sites, you can information. Uh, so once one uh, store is working properly, the other one is not working properly. So what is the difference? What KPIs can I look at to see where might be the problem in that store? Mm. And you can, we also use it, for example, not even to solve problems, also for capacity planning, you can use it. If you look at the average throughput in a particular site, yeah, you can say maybe there's really a problem with the number of access points or you have to think about the design of the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, so what would you say is next in the world of enterprise networking for, for Riva? So if uh, we look at the DNN center, the next steps, uh, or one important step for us would be because if I come back to the first line support, the hotline, mm. they are using their own tool. So in fact, they still have to look at additional tools. So a DNA center is one tool they have to look at. And what we did before, uh, we, they already have, when someone from a store calls in, the agent gets information about that particular store. And uh, they use a tool called Remedy as a ticketing system. And uh, what we implemented before was very simple. So they get the information about are the cash de dashs uh, running, are the payment terminals up and running, and we implemented something trivial for the access points. We just did a ping to the access point and they could see if all the access points are up and running. And what we want to do now, we want to drive this integration into Remedy because you have this, uh, uh, this parameter called health score inside the DNA center. Yeah, you, uh, and we want to integrate these KPIs into Remedy so that the agent gets a better view of the store. So maybe he immediately can say, okay, it's not a problem of the network. I can see that the network health is 100%. The clients are at 95%. So it must be something else that is not working. Okay. I'd like to talk about another point, which, you know, when I speak with different customers and we're talking about DNA and specifically assurance, people are worried, is this going to be now a major hassle mm. to build this thing? I mean, it sounds like it's doing fantastic job, right? It does a lot. It does a lot. Yeah. So you're saying probably now I need to change everything. Yeah. Well, actually, no. And that's the great thing about it. Um, when you have the um, main device, it actually takes all the information from all the different devices in the network. So in essence, there, isn't, there is minimal you know, interference. Actually, there is no interference. Correct me if I'm wrong, Hans. No, you're absolutely right. So the only thing we had to check before we implemented the DNA Center Assurance was to check that we had the, the controllers with the right images, and that was it. Then we just installed the DNA Center, integrated the controllers into the uh, DNA Center, and there were, yeah, we, we had to implement the, uh, import the maps of the stores to get an overview of the network, and that was uh, what we did. So basically, it's always good to have the latest uh, versions uh, uh, operating systems in the devices, and that's it. So, you know, I just want to make sure that people are aware when you talk about DNA, uh, Cisco DNA assurance, it's not, not a lot of hassle. It's quite easy deployment out there. So, um, you know, that's something that really made your life much easier instead of uh, reconfiguring and doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. 
I'm enjoying hearing hearing words like "oh, making my life easier," it's <laughs> saving me time, it's saving me money, hopefully keeping you out of trouble as well. Um, and before we open up the floor to uh, to questions, Boas, is there anything else that you want to um, want to add about uh, Cisco's DNA Center? No, I think that you know we are seeing very successful deployments on these things, and we see. Um, here we're talking about assurance, but there is also software-defined access. That's another critical, important thing. Um, but um, in essence, you know, that's the future. Uh, any company out there who needs to manage, like a company uh, the size of Reve, yeah. it's going to be more and more complex. More and more devices. You have even watches connected, and and, and mobile devices, and, and IoT devices, and everything out there. If you're still in the world of managing these devices without a control base, without intent-based networking, um, you're going to have a much bigger challenge. And uh, unfortunately for IT guys, they don't increase their manpower. It stays the same, but the amount of devices that you need to uh, solve, uh, to take care of, is, is growing exponentially. So I think assurance you know, is one of the easiest way to start with uh, Cisco DNA intent-based networking. And if people want to find out a bit more about that, where where would they go within the show to kind of? Well, you can go to the enterprise networking, uh, the campus there. Okay. Uh, there, you'll see the demos, how it's actually done in real world. Um, definitely worth visit. And you two are going to be reunited. Is it Wednesday? Yeah, we're going to have a PSO session. We're going to go a little bit more in depth. Over there, we're going to show some, uh, uh, you know, the real world, how, how things are happening. So you're more than welcome Wednesday to join our uh, PSO session. There are going to be like 300 people there. So looking forward. Brilliant. And where, and where does that take place? It's on the uh, entry of the World of Solutions, I think on the right-hand side, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Um, and so now I just want to open it up to any questions from the floor. We've got a microphone at the back. So if you just pop your, your hand up, if you've got any questions for the chaps. You're so thorough. <laughs> you got a question? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you just uh, explain the differences between Cisco Prime and uh, DNA Central? Uh, this is my first question. And the second question is, uh, how backward compatible is DNA Central? Uh, in terms of if the customer has older wireless, con uh, wireless controllers, WLCs, can they still manage using uh, DNA Central? These are my two questions. Thank you. So in terms of the uh, second question, um, I can't tell you exactly from which version, but it definitely all the, the you know the Catalyst 9K, et cetera, that works perfectly. If you go beforehand, uh, you might need to do some um, upgrades uh, to be able to have the full capabilities of the DNA assurance. But it, we need to take it offline to see exactly which versions, which uh, products you have out there. And there was a second part of the question. Is that you done? R remind me the question yeah. again. <laughs> oh, sorry. You have the microphone again. Yeah. So the, the advantage of Cisco DNA is that it's a it's a complete solution out there. You have the SDA, you have the assurance, you have everything there. Whereas Prime was initially just of getting information and, and getting that uh, uh, data from it. So I would say, if I was now an IT manager your way forward is going to be with DNA because you're getting all the features out there, but much, much more. Lovely. Any other questions for Hans and Boaz? So Hans, are you looking at, uh, we just came from the NRF where, you know, we were, a lot of the showcasing of some of the um, technologies that people are starting to really use in the retail environment. So from a, you know, a perspective of, of the people that are actually running the stores, are they looking at doing things like, you know, what are the things you're looking at doing, like any of the dwell time type analytics, any of the stocking analytics, or the, you know, even, even the price changing, right? In, in big stores like yours, uh, those kind of things are time consuming too, where, hey, can I use this network to do the... Uh, you know, automatically update. There's applications now that will allow me to update my pricing like instantaneously or change my pricing. 
are, are the people uh, running the stores looking at those kind of future, you know, cost-saving applications? Uh, yes, we are already looking at the DNA spaces. So that's something we can use on top of DNA. And uh, we are just about to deploy DNA spaces in uh, several stores in Austria, um, especially to use it for analytics. Um, there are some brands who only wants to use it for presence of a customer. Uh, we already had a request from one of our biggest brand because they want to do indoor navigation. So that's for sure harder than to do presence and some analytic stuff. Yeah, uh, but there are requests and we are working on this. Yeah, that's great. So Boaz, now that we heard that, so DNA spaces and how does that relate to DNA center, DNA assurance, and uh, kind of, uh, you know, Hans said you, you put it on top. So can you kind of explain how that yeah, works? Yeah, DNA spaces, in essence, we're saying, why just connect? Why not leverage the location of people? So I'll give you an example. If I'm a company who has a retail or even a shopping mall, and I'd like to see exactly where my customers are going, or if I want to you know, have them connect and then say, hey, there is a, a special prices if you go to a specific location. And this is really what DNA Spaces is all about, is really giving intelligence in that you'll be able to first understand and learn, you know, in manufacturing or even in, in retail and in, in hospitals, all these places, you know, we can get so much more of the network than just connectivity and understanding where people are going. Retail is a very strong thing, especially if you, you know, you want to see what's working and what's not working. And that's exactly what DNA Spaces is all about. It really gives you understanding, knowledge, and it can also be a, a two-way relations with customers mm -hmm. on how to, um, how to do more with your network and your spaces. And uh, so if, if I go to the part earlier, of the company, uh, I want to make money, I want to save money, stay out of trouble. So here, that's also being able to do make more money, to really understand more, to have a better relations with customers, and therefore be able to do more in the business with that. Brilliant. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Well, Please join me in thanking Hans and Boaz. That was really, really insightful. Thank you, Thank you for sharing your experiences. Remember to keep reaching out to us using hashtag C-L-E-U-R. We are in our sponsorship segment here at the show. We are back with NetApp and one of my very favorite people to speak with, uh, not only at NetApp, but also here at these shows. So glad to have uh, Lee Howard here with us, Chief Technology Officer for FlexPod. Welcome back, my friend. Uh, Steve, I've got to say, you look very dapper for the birthday celebration that we're here. It's, it's 10 years of UCS. Uh, we, we've got a, a decade of FlexPod uh, going forward. That, that's a wonderful uh, birthday suit, we'll call a it. A birthday suit. I think you and I are both in our birthday suits. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, snazzy as well. This show just took an entirely strange turn. <laughs> All right, so um, I want to congratulate you first for everything that you've been doing here at the show. Uh, whenever you and I get the opportunity to get together and talk, we, we always start out by marveling at the lifespan of FlexPod. I was mentioning it a yep. moment ago here with Adam as well. It's really quite remarkable. And I, I, I asked him why it has lasted as long as it has, so much long-term success, and I want to ask you that same question. Well, I, I think it's, it's largely because this is a, I would say the industry premier platform for innovation. We couldn't have been here had it not been for our partnership with Cisco. We couldn't have been here had it not been for our partners. Being able to go out and take this platform, wrap their business around this so that they're able to develop proficiencies, differentiate their own offerings. And I think at the end of the day, the person that really benefits is the end user customer out there. Uh, you know, we've got uh, over 6,000 petabytes uh, that have been sold of capacity. It's a 13 $0.8 billion dollar, uh, business that we've done and continuing to grow. You know, I wish my kids at 10 will have a lifetime earnings of uh, $13.8 uh, billion, but uh, it may not be in the cards yet. There. Yeah, it may not yet. A little bit of a slow start. Now, I already get the sense your son is 18 months. I think he's going to be brilliant. I think he's going <laughs> to make it. Um, Digital transformation is really at the heart of all of this. As mm -hmm. we continue to transform not only the industry, but uh, 
organizations start to transform the way they do business? Everything from their data center all the way on down through the stack. How is FlexPod uh, approaching that and helping them to get where they need to go? Well, I mean, you look at the 170 plus CVDs that we have on record. I mean, it's, it's the most that you have out of uh, any combined technology within Cisco. And that 250 plus person years of, of uh, engineering that has gone into that has really allowed us to differentiate where you're diversifying out the business risk of choosing FlexPod. All the remediation testing that we do, all the uh, interline is a new firmware for one of the components comes out, say a Nexus switch, we're going to be able to tell you, here's what your upgrade path is going to be, so you're not, as a customer, having to do that. It's peace of mind for the partner, it's peace of mind for the customer, and I think where we differentiate ourselves, we're not really focused here on doing a tech refresh. That doesn't help anybody. We're out of the business of workloads, we're focusing on workflows, and that's adding in the human mm. element, and I think you know, the way that people interface with their data, uh, they've, as you can see, they've trusted the data with us. We're setting our cadence of innovation on quality of life improvements. I mean, look at what we're doing with Intersight integration. Yeah. Being able to have visualization into the environments, pulling in app dynamics, pulling in CWOM, what we're doing with our OCI platform, um, it's, it's a collaborative uh, environment where everybody is bringing their best of breed innovation to bear and the customers and the partners are the, the, the beneficiaries of that. So beautifully put, that's a lot of what Liz and Danny were talking about Absolutely. up in the keynote yesterday uh, into the first innovation talk as well and it all connects together. What's next? You and I are going to talk to each other again in June mm -hmm. uh, when we're together in Las Vegas. What is next for FlexPod? Where do we head from here? I, I think you're, you're, you're looking at, you know, we've, we've got Perform taken care of. I, I think Cisco really does a good way of rationalizing the environment. You know, your, your databases, we're going to have a huge industry disruption of those uh, in the next 18 months. 47% of, of SQL installs, 40% of Oracle installs, so that core bread and butter workload that FlexPod's always been a, a part of, we're going to have a huge disruptive refresh. But instead of just going in and looking at that specific database, how can we expand beyond that? Genomic workloads, where we're doing life-changing elements not just on allowing children to be able to come in and have uh, cancer treatments where they couldn't come in because the dye contrast was too radioactive. We're increasing the uh, clarity on lenses uh, within hospitals to do this, and then taking those same genomic lessons, we're applying it to agriculture, drought-resistant wheat, so that we can feed the world. I mean, that's what gets me up in the morning is, you know, designing, uh, architecting is fun, but whenever you see that, that ripple effect that, that the labor that we're putting in, those engineers that, that are, are, are coming and, and, and building this, this technology for us, that ripple effect is really what, what keeps me thriving and keeps me excited. So a lot of AIML uh, work you're going to see coming forward. And again, bringing in IoT to the, uh, to the fore forefront, I think Liz in her new position uh, where she's covering both UCS, IoT, and the cloud business, this is how you deliver real-time uh, innovation to your customers. This is how you put that data to work for you, the lifeblood of your business, that's how you, you, you bring it to bear, so it's an a innovation center, not a cost center uh, with NIT. I just decided while you were talking right there that I need to keep you with me right here on set for the entire rest of the day. You gave me about 30 different things that I want to dive deeper <laughs> into, and I wish we had the time to do it. Uh, maybe you and I will have to do it offline, and then we'll share it with Absolutely. other people at different times. Absolutely, that sounds times. great, Steve. Lee, thank you so much. I always love the opportunity to talk with you. I look uh, forward to doing more of it, and congratulations again to NetApp, and thank you again for that hey. platinum sponsorship. Hey, we're, we're here for you, Steve. Really do appreciate you it. You are indeed in so many different ways. In this corner on the terminal, we've got Amy. And in this corner, using Cisco Meraki, we've got Corey. As the IT director, I like to introduce some friendly competition to keep everyone sharp. That's why we're having a race to see who can set up the new office the fastest. Ready and go! Here we go. Type it out, type it out, that's it. The one-touch VPN provisioning from Meraki really didn't make this a fair fight. No fair! He's using performance-enhancing IT solutions. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Cisco TV studio here at Cisco Live in Barcelona. Um, we've just wrapped up the Enterprise Network's Advo chat and uh, we're now shifting gear to one of my favorite topics because I used to work in this uh, customer segment at Cisco for the last 
four and a half years, uh, and it's where I started at Cisco, grew up, so to speak, uh, and that is SMB, or small business. Um, really looking forward to having a chat now. We've got two great panelists who are experts in this field. Uh, I've got Hammer Marshall, who heads up a small business for UKI at Cisco, and also joined by Richard Oliver, ge uh, the general manager of IT and managed service portfolio. Sorry. Senior Manager of IT, SDN, and Cloud at British Telecom. Good morning. Welcome to the show, morning. guys. Um, so, we're going to chat a lot about small business today, but um, I want to get straight into your questions because um, we've got a lot to talk about, I think. Um, we know that small business has been very big this week at Cisco Live. Um, there's been a lot of buzz around the escape room where we actually tried to get out of as well. Uh, we struggled a little bit with it. It was trickier than uh, it looked. Um, and uh, you've been talking a lot about the Cisco design portfolio, which I think is a new term for a lot of people. Um, how is Cisco designed changing the game for Cisco in general and also small business as a whole? Yeah, so Cisco designed is our new brand for small business and actually is a huge game changer. If you think about the world economy, two thirds of the workforce actually are employed by small businesses. Their turnover in the private sector I think it's something like six trillion. Um, and so you have this energy around small businesses. But also, if you think about a keystone, they're the keystone for every economy, right? So you've got small businesses. In the UK last year, they said that every, five, every hour, there were five new small businesses being born. So it is a huge underpinning of every economy and every organization. And I think this is a big game changer for Cisco because we've gone from enterprise to much more around a holistic view of our customers, both small, medium, and large. Yeah, awesome. Um, Richard, uh, you've got an interesting perspective, I think, on this because you're, you're, you know, because you're a partner and, and, and BT has such a broad uh, sales base, I guess, for our small business as well. Um, IDC actually did a really good report called the Future Scape SMB um, 2019 Predictions Report, and that said that two thirds of SMBs have digital transformation as a key part of their strategy by 2023, which is quite a sp surprising statistic because you don't really think about small businesses transforming digitally per se. Um, it's key, I think, for both us and partners to have an offering that specifically addresses the SMB market, but. Um, from the BT perspective, um, what are you seeing happening with the small business customers in the UK? Is this a, a trend you're seeing reflected there as well? Sure, and you know, firstly, thanks for the invite to come along and talk to you. Um, yeah, so in BT, uh, in our UK enterprise division, we, we specifically focus on the small sector. Uh, and, and predominantly what we're doing is taking a lot of the learnings that we're seeing in larger organizations, a lot of the concepts that they're trying to drive, but, but really package that in a way that small customers who haven't got the direct skills themselves, they, haven't, they want to focus on what they do great. You know, we really want to take all of that technology, package it specifically, working with Cisco, working with the way that you're simplifying your technology, and kind of bring that all together. So absolutely our customers, they want to be able to drive the change that they see across the industry, but they clearly need partners and, and, and technology to be much more integrated, much more simpler for them, so they can do what they do best. So, so we really, really focus on bringing all of that together with them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the competition, especially uh, amongst SMBs, is incredibly fierce. So anything that we can do to sort of help them along on, on that journey, I think, is fantastic. Um, to, to both of you, uh, you know, either maybe best if you start the answer and then you might be able to um, add some, some color as well, Hema. Um, the, the same report also said that um, in, uh, by 2021, 60% uh, of SMBs worldwide will use alternative channels to uh, procure or, or to get advice on some of their technology decisions, um, including various service providers. I'm sure BT is also one of them. Um, what are the benefits to small business customers to working with a service provider such as a BT or, or similar ones in other countries? I think I think the thing we're focusing on is that is that the customers, you know, they focus on what they do best, uh, and they want outcomes. So, so I think the role that we have got is to understand their outcomes and turn that into a solution and a service. So I think, you know, as they look to technology, what they don't want to be is technologists in terms of IT. What they want is actually to turn to partners and providers who understand where they're trying to be, understand what they're trying to achieve, and be able to present that in a way that they say, right, great, I can see the outcome of technology. So I think that's our role broadly. Yeah, and I think the various channels is really important. 
we have to start at where the, what the customer wants and the heart of the customer, and we've got to give them choice. So partners and service providers provide something that is a solution to small business. They provide locality in a lot of occasions. They provide much more of a value add to those small businesses and small customers. And I think it is important to ensure that we provide that choice to our customers. Mm. Um, we can't just get them down one route. So some customers want to buy online, some customers want to be part of the service provider package, some partners want to, some customers, sorry, want to buy from local partners. So our channel and our routes to market is critical to the success of those businesses and Cisco. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the larger enterprise customers obviously have the benefit of, of maybe having a direct connection with Cisco. They can get advice, you know, from a Cisco expert, but, you know, some of these small businesses may not have that ability to, to connect with, uh, with Cisco directly. So, so having a, a great partner that can give them great advice on, on technology and, and how to, you know, use it to better their business. And I think, uh, Richard, you said, you know, it's, it's really about giving the, uh, managing the technology to, a, uh, to an extent where the, the customer can just focus on doing what's best for them, focus on their own business, right? Yeah, yeah we know they're not experts, but, but they know where they want to go, they know what they want to be. What they don't want is to spend their energy building the technology that can provide that outcome. Our job as Cisco and BT, certainly in, when we're providing solutions, is to be where they are, as you say, whether that's digitally, uh, we run local franchises, so we can be in the high street, we can be uh, around the country with them, and really kind of create solutions that they can package and bundle. It's all about repeatable, they don't want the complexity. Our job is to take that away, package solutions that they can present to their, to their business that drives that digital change. Yeah, and I, and I would also say that actually it is a direct relationship with Cisco because our channel and our routes to market are an extension of our Cisco world. And actually we couldn't go to market without them, so I would say that by working with service providers or local partners or e-coms, you are actually getting that connection with Cisco um, in a much more agile, quick, speedy way, um, and it isn't cumbersome, and then you get that choice on how you actually go to market. Yeah, perfect. Now, I think uh, the big white elephant question is uh, that bizarre contraption that you guys have got <laughs> sitting in front of you there. So I've been told you've brought a, a hook a duck game, so you've got some ducks in there with some interesting statistics. Um, but uh, I think there's probably a perception out there in the market that Cisco is very enterprise focused. Yeah. And I know we've been doing our best at this show and also you know, through other Cisco Lives and the content that we're sending out online as well um, to change that perception. Um, but I think there's still a lot of common myths floating around, right? Yeah. Around how Cisco works, what our products are like and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, let's, let's try and bust some of those myths, I guess. Right. So. Okay. There is there is an old saying in TV: never work with animals, children, and now plastic ducks because this is going <laughs> to be really go, interesting. Though. But we thought it'd be a good idea to try this on the basis that what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to hook a market, right? So let me see if I can do this. Uh, if I can't, we're going to pick it up. Do you know what? I've cracked. Oh, you've got it. You've well done. Hey, you've got it. And I've gone the wrong way. It's always so, a bit harder on life. So let's have a look at the first one. So. The first one is Cisco is too big. Do you know what? I think there is this uh, perception that Cisco is too big. Um, actually, big is good. So if you think about it, for small businesses, they have a $50 billion safety net with Cisco. And there are some really interesting things that even I found out today. So every single Cisco device that is security and product actually has AI and machine learning built in it because it goes up to Talos and Talos delivers that intelligence back. That is a fantastic safety net for small customers. And actually big also means that we can work with small customers to innovate and disrupt the market. And I think it's a co-relationship. And we've all heard the term co-creation. And I think that's what big and small and medium do together. Great. Right, Rich. My turn. Friend. <laughs> okay, let me give it a go. Okay, left-handed here. Are you normally left-handed, Richard? No, I'm, I'm right-handed, but... I well, giving you an extra help. challenge. Yeah, give me today. a challenge here, left-handed. <laughs> no, I'm going to pick it up. Right. <laughs> so the second one, complicated. Complicated. 
So if I, uh, I kind of give a perspective from being a partner, so you know we work with many technologies, but we spent a lot of time working with Cisco and Meraki. So Meraki was uh, a partner that we've been working with now for over three years, it's part of the Cisco acquisition. Um, and what they really did as a partnership is that they enabled us to move away from integrating technology. Cisco and Meraki have really got that simplifying technology, bringing it together, focusing on the customer experience. And I think then when we bring that together with our organization and we look at how we're simplifying the network, you know, our, our job starts with the customer. Our job is to simplify all of that. So I think what we've got going now between us is with what you're doing with Cisco and Meraki, which is creating a suite of solutions right across the small business sector. So they really can have a solution that's integrated, it works together, we can build it into our networks, both fixed and mobile. And so we've really kind of busted that complexity in my mind. Uh, and feedback from customers is great. We've seen huge growth in customers taking not just one product and then they have the job of bringing it together. They're saying, well look, you know, how do we, how do we start taking more of these products? So we're selling networks plus security, plus LAN, plus Wi-Fi. These things were really complicated for us and customers in the past. And I think we've done a great job at bringing that together. And I just see that growing and strengthening and the customer feedback's awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, Meraki especially is a, you know, a great solution, I think, for a lot of SMB customers. If you um, didn't catch the Meraki session yesterday, um, there is an opportunity to stream those on CiscoLive.com so our guests back home can have a look at uh, the latest and greatest in Meraki as well. Um, the, yeah, you guys have got one more duck, right? How We've got one more duck. You're going to fish that one out as and well? And unfairly, that will be a 2-1 to me. Yeah, I'm going to say, this could uh, be embarrassing when you go straight in and get, and get the third one. No. So, <laughs> You're not so the, third one is, um, <laughs> the third one is expensive. That's a really interesting conception here around expense. And actually, if you think about the Cisco designed portfolio that has been designed and created specifically for small businesses, we have a portfolio that actually expands all levels of dollar value, shall we yep. say. Now what's really interesting is that we can now, if it's $1,000 and above, we can now actually provide Cisco Capital. So the technology that you buy is being very similar to when you buy a sofa or a car, you can do it on 0% over 36 months. So I don't yep. think it's expensive. And actually, if you think about the value that service providers add to that, yeah. in terms of that product and that value and the ability to be connected to broadband, have the network visibility, have security, and be able to collaborate with your customers, suddenly you have a solution that actually is probably much cheaper than most technologies. Yeah, look, I, what I would add to that is that, you know, that, the, the, that is a classic myth, right? So we, when we talk to customers, expense is the one that you, you think you're going to see. And actually what they're looking for is how it drives value, right? So it's actually how you can present the solution in a, with, with value, right? So, so we are taking Cisco technology, certainly, and we build it in so it's a monthly bill. It is about, it's how they can understand the way that they're consuming the number of people they've got, the number of sites that they've got, the types of infrastructure that they're using. So, so actually expense, in my mind means that you haven't really understood the problem that the customer's trying to solve and you haven't been able to present the value of that back to them, basically. Absolutely, I mean, it's like the old analogy of, uh, you know, buying one 300 pound pair of boots or buying, you know, eight 50 pound pairs of boots, right? I mean, it's about, maybe there is a smaller investment, a larger investment, sorry, up front, but the value pays off and the, the longevity and the, the, the um, benefits that you get a solution and the hidden costs that aren't there, absolutely. Um, you guys got any more ducks or, or are we? No, we're done with the yeah, ducks, done, I think. We're all out of ducks. You've we're a bit worried all. about them. <laughs> You've got them all. That's fantastic. Um, so, Richard, thank you so much for being on the show. I think we're no going to transition to a different um, topic that's also incredibly, incredibly important for uh, small businesses, which is the topic of cyber security. I think a lot of small businesses uh, think 
that, oh, you know, it's, it's one of these things that only affects the big guys, you know, I'm not a target, that sort of thing. Um, but it is definitely, definitely important. If you do want to learn more about uh, small business, um, Meraki or any of the other solutions that were mentioned today, please go to um, cisco.com slash go slash sales and you'll be connected with an expert in your region that can talk to you about those topics. And uh, him and I are now joined by a new guest, which is James Lee, our global uh, commercial and small business security lead from Cisco. James, thank you so much for being here. Good morning, David. Excited to be here. I'm glad you're here, because um, we have more ducks to catch, I believe. <laughs> I, I, I love this. So fishing is so topical in the security industry right now. This is, this is genius. Yeah, because we have that great term, don't we, called fish pond, which is exactly what you've got in front of you. And uh, a fish pond uh, is somewhere where you learn about security problems. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. Yeah. Indeed, looking forward it's to it. perfectly on topic. Awesome. So, um, yeah, why don't you guys start trying to fish out these ducks and we'll uh, have a chat about what's on. What's I noticed that my ducks are significantly smaller than the previous guest ducks. Is there any reason for that? Or, yeah, uh, we just thought it would make it harder because security harder. is quite right. complicated. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull that. I'm, I'm just, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to pull, pull my duck out. Yeah, because as a like left-hander, a... It's, it's a challenge. <laughs> so, 72%. Um, now, this is a really interesting data point. So, this is the um, percentage of small business customers that think they've been breached. And that is, a, that is a staggering data point. But I worry about the 72% that have been breached, but I also worry about the 28% that don't think they've been breached, but probably have. We, we talk about two types of customers in Cisco, those that know they've been breached and know those that, and those that think they're secure, but, but probably have been breached, Just haven't right? discovered the breach yet. Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, and it's, it's challenging times for these customers. And I think, um, uh, it's interesting. I was, I was reflecting this morning on, on my working day and how that had transformed over the last 30 years. And I think that's a metaphor for how challenging it is for small companies to secure themselves. So when I started working back in 1993, my alarm used to be set at 7.30 in the morning. I'd get up, have breakfast, read the paper, get into the car, go to work and turn on my computer. And the first time the security person in my company needed to worry about me was at 8.59 when I got into the office. Um, now, I mean, what, what, what's the first thing that you do in the morning? Right? You whip out your phone. You, you, you get your phone out, right? Yep. And, and, and so immediately the security teams have got to create policy that secures you as a user, wherever you are, whatever time of the day you're accessing data, um, whatever application you're connecting to, whatever device you're on. And the device challenge itself is, is kind of crazy. We think there'll be somewhere between 20 and 30 billion devices connected to the internet this year. And, and simply that's between 20 and 30 billion different ways that the bad guys can, can hack into our customers. So Doesn't so it's, sound easy. It's, it's, it's challenging, it's yeah. challenging. Yeah, and I think it's really important to understand that you know, 72% breach, you know, that, that could wipe out small businesses. Absolutely. Right? They, in, in terms of cost, in terms of people, in terms of assets. So I think that, that breach is really important to think about how do we then help those customers secure because you want to make sure that they're doing what they're doing best mm -hmm. and we're kind of at the back end trying to make sure and protect them. Doing what we do best. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right, I am going to try Go this. For it. Go because for it. She was quite successful. You're right-handed, you see. This has been designed for right-handed people. Look at that. Little hands Absolute as well. Absolute <laughs> expert. <laughs> 2017. So t 2017 uh, is, is uh, I mean, I think t what's interesting about, uh, about the last two or three years, quite frankly, is that, uh, is that the challenges are getting more sophisticated. It's getting more difficult for our customers to, to deal with these threats. Um, and and we, 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 we talked about 72% being the number of customers that have been attacked. I mean, qu quite frankly, the, um, the industry isn't doing a good enough job in protecting our customers right now. So um, we're at Cisco Live this week. In a couple of weeks' time, we have... Uh, RSA, which is the world's biggest cybersecurity conference, there will be 600 vendors exhibiting at that conference. There are over a thousand vendors uh, in the cybersecurity industry, um, and, and the level of fragmentation in this industry is, is kind of crazy. And the reality is that you could deploy every single one of those vendors, and you are still going to get breached. Um, and again, if I think back to when I started working. Um, and, and I was reflecting on the, the antivirus industry, which is an interesting kind of, again, metaphor for the complexity. There were probably four or five different antivirus vendors back in, uh, back in, back in 1993. Now there are 50. Wow. 
Um, and, and securing the endpoint, securing the laptop is still a, a really big priority for our small customers. When we think about securing the enterprise, we talk about application security and workload security and all these kind of big concepts. For, for small customers, it's simply, I need to secure my endpoint and my, and my laptop. And, and how do I do that when there are such a huge number of, uh, of endpoint vendors out there? We, we have to make things simpler for our customers, and that's something that we're putting a huge amount of focus on inside, uh, inside Cisco. Yeah, yeah. Cool, we're moving on to the next duck then. We are. Provided right, again, you can hook it there. Such a better job I am, I I'm, I'm going to be the hooker duck expert by the end of the day. What have we right. got there? James, this is an interesting one, 69%. So this is from the uh, Poneman Institute report, right? Right. 69% of respondents uh, said that cyber attacks were becoming uh, more targeted. Uh, what, what are the top two cyber attacks that, that was, were in the report and, and how can Cisco technology help prevent these? Yeah, I, I think so. So what, what do we see? We see that in most cases, when small customers are being breached, it's coming from a, uh, a phishing email, right? <laughs> and a phishing email, and phishing email. got it in there. <laughs> and, and phishing emails are getting ever more sophisticated. So the concept of a phishing email is, it's an email that's in some cases very sophisticated, very targeted, designed to get you to click on a link and share your, share your credentials with a hacker who then uses those to, to, to log in, steal your identity and, uh, and, and, and do his nefarious stuff. Um, and we, we now talk a lot in the industry about the bad guys are no longer hacking into our customers, they're logging into them using, using stolen credentials. Um, and one of the interesting things about phishing emails is that technology alone can't solve those problems, right? I'm, I'm a big Arsenal fan, right? And, and I can guarantee the, uh, the end of the transfer window is coming up on, on, fr on tomorrow, Friday. And I can guarantee if someone sent me an email saying um, Lionel Messi is about to sign for Arsenal, I, I'd be clicking you'd on that link. That link. <laughs> right? You wouldn't even hesitate. <laughs> you wouldn't even hesitate. I'm in the industry. <laughs> and so some of these emails are so sophisticated. So that, that I think increasingly, and I have this conversation with customers, it's not just about technology. We need to do a better job in educating our customers on, on being, being a, little more, a little bit more suspicious and a little bit more savvy on how they, uh, how they deal with some of these challenges. But at the same time, we can then give our customers fantastic technology that even if the bad guys do happen to steal our customers' credentials, and we hope they don't do that, um, technology like, uh, like Duo, which is multi-factor authentication, uh, means that even if someone logs into your account using your details, that app, the Duo is going to push a message through to your phone to make sure that you authenticate whether that, whether that connection was indeed valid or not. Yeah. Perfect. I think is there is there one more duck? How are we looking for there ducks? Is. There, there is. There is. Oh, look at that! Oh, look at oh, that. that! How did you do that? Is that pretty good? Were you cheating? Uh, we do need to apologise to the audience for James being an Arsenal fan, but you know, <laughs> that's his genius. you know, when <laughs> Liverpool, he's first fan. Oh, I'm a Liverpool oh, fan. Oh, you can make it our unbeaten <laughs> record. I'll be gutted. So 16 percent. This is really top of mind. Only six. Only 16 percent of customers are seeing an improvement in the time it takes for them to detect a breach. Um, and, uh, and this is a very simple challenge, but one that's what's really top of mind. So uh, picture this, right? So I'm, 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 I'm on CNN, I see a news article, and it, and it talks and it says the new, the new HEMA virus has hit the wild, and customers globally are, are being hit by this. So I'm going to call you up, HEMA, and I'm going to say, HEMA, I've just read about the HEMA virus on CNN. Have you been hit by it? Are you safe? And the answer is, you don't know. Nope. And, and but why this, is it so difficult for them to, to detect these breaches? Because, because I talked about the complexity of the products earlier. There are so many products. We have email security products. Um, we have firewalls. We have endpoint security solutions. And there just aren't the platforms in the industry that are aggregating these technologies together to allow customers to understand whether they've been breached. We have a beautiful product in Cisco called CTR, Cisco Threat Response. And it takes feeds from my laptop. our products. <laughs> Brilliant, um, and, and it allows customers very simply to um, to find to, to go online and, and find what we call indicators of compromises, which are file hashes. Post them into a browser, hit search, and it will tell you where our where where is our advanced malware protection technology seen that seen that breach, where is our email security technology seen that breach, where have our proxies seen that that breach, bringing it together in a central console, and and that that's a very Simple concept, but one that the industry historically has done a pretty lousy job in, in dealing with. So we're pretty excited about bringing CTR into, uh, into the market, which is, which is happening right now. And it's something that absolutely scales all the way down into some of our smaller customers. And, and that's relevant because we have a big talent gap in the industry, so that there are about 
two million vacancies globally in cybersecurity. So if we can give our customers simpler tools to understand when they've been breached, we're going to address some of those talent gaps that, uh, that, that cause the, the market so many challenges right now. Yeah, and it's, it's got more sophisticated. Right, breaches, hackers have got more sophisticated and I think that's what I mentioned earlier in the earlier segment is around AI and machine learning and our Talos portfolio. But for small businesses, we have everything from two-factor authentication to Umbrella and Duo to AMP in case you know somebody comes in and plugs in a USB. So we've got that portfolio end to end it does get more sophisticated, and as things get more sophisticated from a hacker's point of view, we get more sophisticated with our AI and machine learning to ensure that we try and stop those breaches. Absolutely, and that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for both of your time. Uh, if you do want to learn more about this, uh, we've had a lot of great sessions here at Cisco Live on security. Uh, you've heard it here, the bad guys are getting better at being bad, and, uh, but Cisco is catching up and delivering some great solutions for all sizes of businesses. We're now heading over to the App Dynamics Innovation Talk with Danny Winnicker. Stick with us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Innovation Talks Theater. My name's Toby, and I have the pleasure of being your host today. And it's really nice to see that everyone's made it here to Cisco Live 2020. There's a lot of us here, but together we are building the bridge to make it possible for you to do anything. And at Cisco Live, you'll learn new things, be inspired, and create the path to endless opportunities. Now, we're going to be having 14 innovation talks here in this theater where we will share with you our latest solutions innovations, and of course, best practices. Now, today, we will be exploring the world of app dynamics. And to tell us how to compete on user experience and win application visibility and business insights from app dynamics, please welcome on stage Danny Winokur. Thanks, Toby. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How you doing? People hanging in there post-lunch? Yes? Good. All right, so as Toby said, we're going to spend some time today talking about applications. And it may seem a bit counterintuitive for a conference that has at least a tendency historically to focus on infrastructure. But as we talked about in this morning's keynote, if you had the opportunity to see it, things are now really starting with the application in a world where we have digital business, right? And so. I want to come at it from that perspective, and I'll sort of paint a picture of how we understand what's going on in the application world, and by understanding that, we can actually take the infrastructure and make it much more relevant and better connected to serve the needs of the applications and ultimately the business results that drive all of our organizations. So what's going on right now? When we go out and we talk with the largest enterprises in the world, what we see consistently time and time again across every single industry. I don't care what vertical you're talking about. It could be transportation, it could be healthcare, it could be financial services. What we see is that they find that they are now competing in a world of experiences. These are digital experiences delivered through applications and there is a bar that has been set by what I describe as the digital design native companies. Right? These are companies like Facebook, like Google, like Uber, that began their life in the cloud, in a digital domain, and they approached it in a way that was design-led from the very beginning. And so they created an expectation among users of simplicity, of speed of update, of agility, and a beautiful design so that things would move quickly, be responsive, and easy to use. And we all have come as individuals to be accustomed to those kinds of experiences. And it doesn't matter whether we're in our role as an employee at a company using an internal application or whether we are a consumer interacting with an organization that might be a vendor or someone that we're working with as a customer. In both cases, we expect those applications to be flawless. And what we see time and time again is the companies that figure out how to do that and do it well are the winners. They steal market share, they steal revenue, they steal market cap in their stock market valuations away from the companies 
who are failing to keep up and failing to compete in this new world of digital experience. Now, this is a world that is challenging because what you see is that customers are speaking with their wallets and with their feet, right? 84% of consumers are saying that they have experienced problems with their digital services and half of them would actually be willing to pay more for a product or service that delivers a better experience than their competitors, right? So they actually will just move and go to the other thing. This makes it very, very challenging. And it puts a burden not only on the application layer, but it also places a burden on the infrastructure. Because the infrastructure is what the application depends on in order to run. And so the technologies that are being used increasingly by development and operations organizations in order to deliver these world-class experiences need to not just include application technologies, but it also needs to include all of the layers of the stack that are down the stack and that the application depends on in order to deliver the full experience. So what are we seeing happen with the technology? We're seeing a fourth new generation of technology taking hold across enterprise IT. It's what I'm referring to here as cloud and microservices technologies, but it follows on the heels of what I would say were the three major prior generations of IT technology. The mainframe, client server, and web technologies, right? And the question you might ask is, well, why? Like, what is it that has brought about the advent of cloud and microservices? And I would argue that there are a few different things. One, obviously, is that technologies continue to evolve and grow, and there's new innovation and new ideas for how we do, how we do things. But just as importantly is the fact that in order to compete in a world where more and more is being done digitally and where experience is your competitive currency, you need to iterate really, really quickly. Why? Why do you need to iterate quickly? Because a bunch of executives or business planners sitting in a corporate headquarters in a conference room are not going to be able to know what is the winning experience in a digital application. They might think they know, but they're almost always wrong. The companies that have proved this model have done it by actually developing hypotheses based on real user research, implementing their hypotheses very, very quickly into an application, and getting it out fast into production, and then making sure you have instrumentation and telemetry that gives you data back in real time about how the users of the application are using it, where they're succeeding, where they're having trouble, where they're abandoning, using those learnings to reform updated hypotheses, re-implementing those updates into the application, and again, getting it right back out into production. And then round and round you go in an iterative loop. And the companies that have succeeded in perfecting the technologies and the operating model to iterate quickly through that loop are getting more shots on goal than their competitors. And those shots on goal increase their chances of scoring and their time to success in creating the best experience. That's why we see cloud and microservices. Cloud and microservices takes monolithic application architectures, breaks them down into small bite-sized components that pizza teams can work on, right? Agile DevOps teams, the size of a team that can eat a pizza. Those small groups can now iterate very, very quickly using agile methodologies, and they can therefore run that iterative loop that I just described to get the best winning experience out in front of their users. But, so that's the advantage, but there is a dark side, right? The dark side is that you now find application estates within mature enterprises that look something like this, right? What do you notice about this picture? It's really complicated. There's a lot going on. There's a hybrid mix of different technologies, things that are spread across a variety of different deployment environments. So all four generations of technology, the mainframe, the client server, the web, the cloud and microservices technologies, all mixed together into a jumble with components using every one of those diverse technology stacks. Some are deployed publicly, some are deployed using cloud technologies privately, some are deployed using traditional architectures on premise, some are still deployed on mainframe for particular things that involve like back end data processing. You put it all together, and it's not unusual that we see a single application using all of these components where you have front-end components on something like Lambda, iterating really quickly on the front-end, spanning to some client-server components in the middle, in the middleware, 
going all the way back to a mainframe for core data access on some sort of data processing system. And you put it together in one application, and it has to deliver a flawless, responsive, no downtime experience that you can iterate on quickly to win. That's really, really hard, and it's putting IT under tremendous pressure. So one of the sources of pressure is what I alluded to at the very beginning, which is not just about the technology. It's also about the fact that most IT organizations have historically been set up with different teams that work in rather siloed ways. So you have your infra team that is really focused on the stacks and the workloads that they've traditionally been focused on. How do you build the racks? And how do you get your compute and your storage and your network? How do you create instances and VMs? And now how do we expand that to handle the cloud? But usually done in a way that is not particularly well connected to what is going on up at the application layer. Then conversely, you have your app teams, right? And the app team is focused on a abstracted topology, an application topology that has things that are moving around up and above and on top of that infrastructure. And these two teams don't particularly have the same common language. They certainly don't have the same tools. They don't have, uh, uh, they're not accustomed to looking at and using the same data sets and the same vocabulary. And it has historically made it difficult for them to work together, which in a world that was moving more slowly and where applications were just internal support for the business, but hadn't yet become the business, that was OK. They could sort of functionally optimize themselves. For this new world, it's not OK. Because if they fail to work together, they can't achieve the velocity that is required to win in this experience-driven world. So here's, what it, here's how it plays out. Here's what it looks like in action. Right? As we have the IT war room, something goes wrong with an application that is now essential to the delivery of a company's core products and services. You have a war room gets created, and you have all the different functions in the war room that are there representing the different components, and they're pointing fingers at each other, right? Well, my thing looks good. Does your thing look good? Yeah, mine looks good. Well, it must be yours. Nope, nope, mine looks good too, right? And meanwhile, over on the other side of the hall, you've got the business people who are trying to make their way in this new digital world of experiences where they can't execute a business initiative unless it is coded into an application and deployed, pulling their hair out. They're like, our results are suffering. How on earth am I going to succeed in this new domain when things are constantly going down, or there's delays or latency on my pages, my customers are abandoning, and I see profitability beginning to suffer? So what does it look like in numbers? It looks bad, right? 48% of downtime incidents costing over $100,000, and 22%, almost a quarter of them, costing more than half a million dollars per instance. We go into organizations routinely that have mission-critical core applications that are going down as many as three, four, five times a week, in some cases, a couple times a day. Right? And that speaks nothing to the reputational damage that happens when your application is written up in the newspaper. Your users get angry. They can't access core services that they rely upon. And as the earlier data showed, when that happens, those users abandon. Right? And so it's not just the cost and lost revenues at the time, but you actually lose customer goodwill and you get churn. And you now see your business results begin to suffer further. So what do you do about it inside the organization to solve? Well, the problem is that the traditional organization is designed this way. Right? You have a business team, a development team, and an operations team. And they operate pretty separately, pretty siloed. That is a disadvantage in this world of rapid iteration where you need to get to the experience. Because as we've discussed, a business initiative must now be implemented in code. And developers are now coding the infrastructure that is run by the operations team. So if your business is encoded in software, and your software is encoding your infrastructure that is being deployed by ops, those three teams must work together as at least a virtual team, if not an actual team. And they have to be tightly coordinated with an intimacy of collaboration in a model that we're referring to as biz DevOps. Right? So we need to help organizations make this change, because there are a couple components to it. 
One is the human element of it, which is that people have trouble changing. They're used to doing things a certain way, and so you have to overcome that inertia in the human operating model around how the teams actually work with one another. But we can actually help them do that by applying technology. And this is where App Dynamics comes in. Right? So what does App Dynamics do? We monitor these complex hybrid multi-cloud application estates with all of these diverse technologies, and we do it using something that we call the business transaction. So if you saw the keynote this morning, you heard me explain that what a business transaction is is essentially a pathway through the components of the application estate that together accomplish a key outcome for your end user. They sort of create the building blocks of the overall experience. So it could be uh, applying a discount to a quote. It could be checking out or doing a payment processing, right? Those it could be booking a car service, right? Those are actions that together ladder up to create a full application experience, but each one delivers an important outcome for your users. And what the business transaction does is allows us to cut through the noise of monitoring all of these individual components of technology and instead look at the core unit of monitoring as that outcome-driven experience that your users are having so that when something does go wrong, it's placed in a context. We understand why it's important, what it is, who it's affecting, and most importantly, how to root cause it and fix it. Right? And so that's what we do in the context of a business transaction. But importantly, one of the other innovations that AppDynamics has brought to market was not only the ability to monitor the technical performance of the application, but also the ability to monitor business performance inside the application. Because the application has become the business, it now contains within it incredibly valuable business data. What are the dollars and cents, the pounds, the euros that are being transacted with your customers? What are the most popular SKUs or products that are being put into the cart? What's the conversion rate at the different stages of your user funnel? Whatever your relevant business metrics are, you can tell the system, and it will begin to monitor, monitor them in real time, the same way it does technical performance data, and then allow you to build rich visual dashboards that show you how your business is performing and places it in a correlated way against the context of technical performance. So as you can see in this particular dashboard, which I also showed this morning, we actually have the business metrics at the top around insurance quotes and loans approved and bill payments, these are essential to the business leaders of the organization, lined up against what is going on with the business transactions that make up the back-end outcome-driven building blocks that make up this application, right? So that we can now begin to understand how the business is related to the technical performance of the application. Now, this morning, we announced a third additional capability on top of the business transaction and on top of the business IQ capabilities that give you the business information monitoring that I just showed you. And this is our new App Dynamics Experience Journey Map. What the Experience Journey Map does is adds that third complementary component, which is a lens through the actual eyes of your end users, the screens they are actually looking at. And it builds, using AI and ML technology, a pathway through the app in the form of the actual front-end screens that are seen on the mobile device or in the web browser. And it stitches them together and then actually shows you user abandonment and technical performance on each screen, screen by screen. So now you have an additional lens. You can say, I understand my back-end components with the business transaction. I understand overall business performance through the application, and now I can combine them on a screen-by-screen -screen basis through the lens of the actual user journey itself. And that allows you to now focus on what really matters most, because it may well be that you see a problem on the back end that isn't actually affecting your users, and you have different problems that are affecting your users. So you want to prioritize the ones that are affecting your users before you start bothering with more subtle optimizations on the back end that haven't actually had any user experience impact. So this is what allows you to really, really leverage the full breadth of what is possible with AppDynamics, and we're very excited to bring this feature to market.
So before I continue, I thought it might be helpful for you to hear from some AppDynamics customers about the value that they're getting and how they're combining this array of capabilities to run modern, experience-driven digital businesses. So why don't we go ahead and run the customer video? We see the industry is changing so fast. The speed at which things operate are not like they were even just five years ago. If you were to look at the market, the way the technologies are evolving and advancing with the likes of AI and IoT, the demand for performance is more important than it's ever been. We need to be leading edge. The customers expect everything to be available 100% of the time, and they expect everything to happen as soon as they click the button. Customer experience is your business experience now. You know, that, that's how they gauge us as an organization. Within seconds, you, you know, you've gone from having a little problem by one customer and it's escalated halfway around the world. For Carhartt, relationships are a big driver in how we do business. And it became really clear that AppDynamics had that right culture to work with Carhartt, that sense of urgency and you know what was the art of the possible, so to speak. Since we've had AppDynamics in place, it's created a one pane of glass experience across development and operations to truly understand what customers are experiencing and how the system is performing. We're maniacal about solving issues even before customers notice. With AppDynamics, we could actually find these things faster. At the technical level, it gives you an MRI of your enterprise where you can see all those corresponding layers. We can see the cloud, we can see these services. I can orchestrate that and roll that into the enterprise so quickly. Our use cases for AppDynamics are not just in IT. We're also using it to create business dashboards and give business business insight. With Business IQ, we were really able to put our data into one platform and one dashboard and unify how we were able to access all of it. When you're talking about AI ops, running a world-class infrastructure and having customers rely on you for everything that they do, you have to have insights. The insights that we can get from AppDynamics is really key to us becoming a world-class product. If we don't have AppDynamics, it would be really like driving a car at 100 miles per hour with your eyes closed. You can't afford not having the visibility that AppDynamics provides to our infrastructure. Okay, so hopefully it gives you a sense for how some of the leading brands around the world are actually leveraging this combination of capabilities to gain the visibility that they need, but just as important as the visibility, these lenses that allow you to actually prioritize and focus across all of this information that comes in with just raw visibility, allows you to focus on what really matters most to create a competitive advantage in this experience-driven world. So in the opening, I promised that I was going to make this really, really relevant to the infrastructure. So let me show you how exactly that happens. If we think about the operating model challenges within large organizations, when you drill into the operations teams, those challenges often look something like this, right? I talked about the separation of the business teams, the development, and the ops teams, but now we're drilling into the ops team breaking it into its sub-silos. And within operations, we often see app ops totally separate from infra ops, which is totally separate from net ops, which is totally separate from security operations. And the only way they can start to move in lockstep and move quickly with the business and the development teams to win is they have to figure out how to work first with each other. And one of the things that makes that hard for them is that they're using legacy tools that they've invested in over the course of years and in some cases decades. They know how to use them. They're loyal to them. There's an inertia in making any kind of change. And yet those tools are not interconnected. They don't have the same data. They have different perspectives on what is going on. They express them with different vocabulary, different user models. And it becomes therefore very difficult when these teams are forced together into a room for them to have a productive conversation around what is really going on because they don't share a single source of truth or a common data model. What we've been doing at Cisco since the acquisition of AppDynamics is working diligently toward a vision that we have to actually put these things together in a way that allows interoperability and allows data exchange and allows a common data model ultimately so that these teams now have the ability still through their tools of choice 
but now they can look at a shared source of truth expressed in a tool that's familiar, but correlated on the back end so that the answers that are being produced through each tool are in fact the same. What that does is allows them, the, sorry, the people then that are using those tools, it allows them to come together in a much more collaborative model where they're working together to solve problems based on facts and shared data. So that vision is a vision that ultimately we believe will allow us to bring data in from all of these different domain-specific controllers, not replacing them because they'll, we'll continue to have specialized domain controllers for the network that obviously have areas that they go way deep in compared to how you control compute or compared to how you're going to control your application. But they can share data into a correlated system that runs AI and ML technologies to produce valuable insights that you can then access and query for the human user. You can also pump them out through APIs on an open platform for integration with third-party tools and services that allow for the automation and the actioning of events that are going to make it easier to manage these large, complex digital businesses. And this is what we refer to as an AI ops operating model, right? Using AI and ML within operations to go beyond simple DevOps or SecOps and actually give you automation across the full operation stack with data that, under, that, that is understood from each of the historical silos correlated and turned into something meaningful. So today, we announced another important innovation, which again, you saw Liz and I demonstrate this morning on the main stage, which is an important step in this journey on this vision that I'm describing, where we've actually combined App Dynamics with Intersight, which is Cisco's infrastructure automation and management platform in the cloud, so that you, for the first time, can have your app operations team that is using App Dynamics paired with your infrastructure operations team that would be comfortable using something like Intersight, they can actually now have their tools exchanging the exact same data and producing insights and a shared source of truth that allows them to troubleshoot and immediately solve problems, right? And so that looks something like this. You get a closed loop operating model between these two historically separate teams so that they can actually start solving problems together much more quickly. And they can even go a step further and actually begin doing cost optimization, leveraging a combination of the app dynamics application information and the topology data paired with what Intersight is able to see with its workload optimizer across all of the different on-premise and public cloud infrastructure and instances that you're using with cost data so that you can do optimization of your app in addition to troubleshooting and performance optimization. Together, you end up now able to go all the way from the very top of the stack with business information and end user experience through the App Dynamics Experience journey map that we launched into the back end of the application, down into the compute layer and into the network, and you put it all together and you're able to now have a correlated view up and down the stack across two or sometimes three separate teams that are operating the full stack of technologies that produce that application. So I had shown this morning, if you were at the keynote, a sort of working example of this with the next gen financial application, right? A fictional application that uh, is online banking, right? And financial services. So you've got your insurance quotes, your, your loans approved, and your bill payments. And you can see that there are warnings coming up here, but I can now just simply click within that warning for the $450,000 uh, uh, dollars that are being produced in insurance quotes and say, hey, I want to explore this further because I see below in that prior screen that there were some problems in my business transactions, but I don't know if or how they're related. So I want to now go into this new feature. This is the experience journey map that we launched this morning. And it lets you see the full screen-by-screen -screen path that your users are taking through the application. And you can see in this example that it goes right to the, the little orange triangle there and says, hey, there's a problem applying discounts. That's actually where the users are feeling the impact. So sure, there may be other alarms that you see on the back end. 
I'm going to ignore those other alarms right now because I'm being told on the front end that if I look through the eyes of my users, I need to prioritize my efforts right here. And so I can now do that and go down into the stack, still in App Dynamics, and see that I've got problems on quoting services, I've got problems on discount services. I don't care about the quoting service problem right now because the prior screen showed me that the other aspects of my quoting, including quotes sent, no problem. Normal abandonment, normal technical performance. So those back-end problems haven't hit my end users. But the VMs that are alarming on discounts, absolutely. That's 70% abandonment on the prior screen. It's affecting my users, and so I need to fix that. And that's what then takes me in to Intersight, where I call up my infra ops colleague. They open up their tool. So now we're looking inside Intersight, no longer App Dynamics. And I start at the very top, and I can actually see that I've got my applications. Within my applications, I've got NextGen Financial as one of the applications in my estate. And I can then go and look at the dependency graph specifically for that application and begin to drill down into the VMs. They're the exact same VMs that AppDynamics was showing me. And I get a recommendation to actually solve and apply a recommendation on increasing the memory that's available to those VMs, which then solves the problem at the VM level. I go back into AppDynamics, and I see that everything now has turned green solving the problem. So you see that power of correlated data across the two tools that are sharing that data on the back end. So you saw then the ability there to do workload optimization within Intersight, the ability to access common data sets across AppDynamics and Intersight, and the ability to apply machine intelligence to make smart recommendations on how to solve problems and how to optimize workloads. Together, it's a very powerful combination that is unique to AppDynamics and Cisco. You're not going to see anything like that from another APM tool. So anyone else doing performance management, application management, they can't do it. And you're similarly not going to see anything like that from another infrastructure tool where you have that dynamic data exchange all the way up to the app layer. So this, we believe, is helping to pioneer a coming together across these, historics, these historically separate operating teams to give you, again, that closed-looped operating model. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, there are a number of other ways to follow up if you'd like to get more information. So we have demos in the Reimagine Your Applications area um, here within the world of solutions. We have a, an offering that we make available that is a, essentially a starter pack to experiment with AppDynamics. We call it an AppDynamics visibility pack that's a very lightweight, fast, and easy way to get started. And we also, on February the 20th, are going to be running a global virtual event called App Dynamics Transform 2020, where we'll go into much greater depth with a number of the top executive leaders from Cisco, as well as myself and a number of other players from App Dynamics. And we will go through in much greater depth what's going on with the latest and greatest on the App Dynamics roadmap and what's possible together with Cisco. So, Look for that on February 20th. You can see it on our website, and I hope you'll join us there and that you enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. Thank you. For us, trust means taking care of and respecting a customer's most sensitive data. And in order to do that, it means that we have to have world-class security and privacy wrapped with transparency. And at AppDynamics, it's essential to us that we earn that trust every single day by taking the commitment that it requires very, very seriously. Tell me a little bit more about the security team here at AppDynamics. The security team at AppDynamics is a very diverse team, built almost 50% security, 50% DevOps, so that we could bring these two teams together to really build an advanced practice. We understand that customers rely on us to ensure the confidentiality and the integrity of their data. How does AppDynamics enhance the security and resilience of its products? Through a couple of ways. One is with constant, continuous monitoring internally with our operations team. And the second way is we take a secure by design approach where we build security in from the beginning and we're constantly evaluating our code with manual and automated methods to make sure that we're delivering a secure product. What about the combination of AppDynamics and Cisco 
impacts or supports the approach that we take to security and privacy. Cisco is, is, is the largest security vendor in the world. We get to leverage all those great tools and technologies that Cisco has to protect our environment, to protect our customers. We partner very closely with them in terms of things like processes and expanding the voice of security and privacy in industry. What do our customers need to do in partnering with us for our SaaS service to make sure that they have a secure environment? There's a lot of options that they have available to them right out of the box. Things like secure configurations, connections to make sure that they have proper logging and access control and authentication and authorization and even encryption. And I would like our customers to think of us as an extension of their team. We know we can't do it alone. When you look at industry and you look at security, that's the way we're all gonna win. The history of Cisco has been in making infrastructure, boxes, but the future of Cisco is really to create this intelligent, intuitive IT infrastructure. And that's where we're going in the future, to really be able to automate, to optimize your IT infrastructure around your business performance. I think that's the most important thing, and AI is gonna take us there. We say in AI, he who has the best data wins. We have so much data. We have deployed over 50 million networks over the last 20 years. We have domain knowledge across the entire stack. You need a full coverage. You want to bring all the relevant data that's tied to what you're trying to achieve, what the application is trying to achieve. You need to correlate that all together. One of the most common questions that I've uh, had is, um, what kind of algorithm are you using? And what we came up with is actually a learning architecture. IoT devices generate terabytes of data per second, and this number is only going to grow. And one of the things that we've learned is that instead of doing machine learning in the cloud, it's better to take machine learning and bring it close to where the data is by the IoT devices. This can lead to massive improvements in reliability, scalability, reduced latency, privacy, and security. Customers need to deploy distributed applications on distributed computing. It's getting too complex for customers to manage it across their data centers at different locations. We use AI is actually using machine learning to do the infrastructure management in an automated way. Our customers can analyze their own data and understand how to optimize the costs, improve the governance, and be more secure in the new multi-cloud world. And AI can help with exactly those pain points that our customers already have. We are Cisco. We have control over hardware, software, telemetry. So we know we are short of something. We know how to go and fix uh, you know, to fulfill the gap. We have uh, the brightest luminary in machine learning and deep learning in the industry. We Cortex, uh, we can count of uh, over 60 people who are really shaping uh, ML and AI in Cisco. By having a group of people watching different area and exchanging that into a forum allows us to track a much broader set of problems and approach to solve those. So at the end of the day, what customers care about is their business performance. They don't care about, you know, spending a lot of time diagnosing where in the IT stack the problem is. Cisco is focused on being able to help them automate all of this, being able to auto-configure, um, being able to auto-heal ahead of time, being able to predict the problems before they occur, and then ultimately being able to optimize for business performance. technology, the world is just exploding in complexity. The modern day application has become the foundation of business and the relationships that we now have with our customers and that partnership is instrumental for helping them succeed in the digital journey. Right out of the box, AppDynamics is helping provide a visualization of the entire application landscape. We're able to show you everything from the code that's driving the application. We can show you how it's impacting end users on their devices or on their mobile and browser environments. And we can also go deeper into the infrastructure and show how things are performing at a network or infrastructure level. We are a service utilized across every industry. Our customers span fast food restaurants, to banks, to travel, to retail, which means the impact that we can have is massive. 
Artificial intelligence is fundamental to the approach that we're taking at AppDynamics, and it's really been something that has been built into the product from the very beginning. AI is allowing us to be a lot more proactive and predictive about any potential issues that are occurring in the application environment. And essentially, this is going to enable our customer to free up their time to be much more innovative. With Cisco, we are able to bring all of these things together into a system and a vision that, that we call the central nervous system for enterprise IT. So just like the central nervous system of our own human body is the unifying thing that controls the modern digital world. The world has become so digital, and it doesn't become digital without the confidence that you can create an incredibly engaging experience between your users and your brand through a digital journey. Think of us as that security blanket to really make that happen. And that's something that I don't think the world could live without. People, services, and machines are more connected than ever before by the code you write and the experience it creates. That's why you can't afford to react to performance problems. You have to proactively solve for them. But how do you do that in today's complex application environment? With Cognition Engine from AppDynamics Cisco, an AI-powered solution that drives IT decision-making and business forward. Cognition Engine uses machine learning to understand your environment and create dynamic baselines for application health. Issues and anomalies are automatically detected, giving you real-time insight into performance problems, while AI surfaces potential resolutions to both accelerate decision-making and help you avoid war room conflicts. With Cognition Engine, businesses can finally build a proactive approach to performance monitoring that connects business and outcomes. When people think of Alaska Airlines, they think of airplanes, they think of airports. And that, of course, is the actual business that we're in. But what we're very cognizant of is the fact that e-commerce is the first interaction that many people have with us. Alaska Airlines is the fifth largest domestic airline in the United States. And we do our best to be competitive through scrappy innovation. We were the first airline to sell airline tickets online. That culture of innovation is driving us to have more guest centricity and more product focus to provide the absolute best guest experience. Our customers are accessing our site with multiple different platforms, from web to mobile, kiosk at the airport. It's extremely crucial for us to provide consistent digital experience. Guest experience through our digital platforms is key. If we don't get that right, then they certainly won't become loyal guests. Our technology teams are working in an incredibly complex and data-rich environment. AppDynamics is providing us a deep visibility into our application's performance on front-end and back-end. That holistic view gives me the peace of mind that we are actually delivering the right experience for our guests. Cognition Engine is taking that dynamic baseline to the next level. The ability to quickly figure out the root cause is a big deal for us, and we are using Cognition Engine to make our mean time to resolution even faster. Our mean time to detection went from hours to less than 10 minutes, which is a huge win for us. From 2017 to 2018, we were able to reduce the number of SEB1 outages that we had by 60%, and we're continuing to sustain that. We are using a hybrid environment on-premise and in the cloud, a lot of microservices and serverless computing. The adoption of Azure and using the cloud has been a great enabler for our teams. It allows them to break up little bits of business logic to experiment with them and deploy them quickly. With AppDynamics, the developers, the engineers who are focused on trying to solve a guest problem can not only consider just the user experience or just the performance of the service in the back end, but how everything ties together. And in partnership with AppD, we can be sure that we're building solutions that are healthy and reliable. We can get a holistic view of the performance that really manifests itself in the things that matter to our guests. I'm really passionate about how we're using the latest technologies to solve real pain points for our customers. The fact that we are making travel experience easy, joyful, and something they look forward to every time they travel makes me excited. Having real-time visibility, having real-time analytics, and having that data be so trustworthy we can take automated action on it is a requirement for us to be world-class and something that AppDynamics has truly helped us do. 
The more that we automate those tedious jobs is great because we can work on innovating and looking at the new latest technology to bring in. There's an opportunity for Cisco and AppDynamics to come closely together to give you insights to not only at the application tier, but at the network tier. We're living in a bold new era. Advances in technology are transforming everything, making our lives better, but also more complicated. This new era requires agents of transformation who will embrace an AI ops mindset and face the challenge head on. AI ops helps improve operational agility to outperform any competitor and keep enterprises running strong without ever losing sight of business performance or customer experience. Offering a new command of vast computing resources as instinctively as the central nervous system commands the human body. AppDynamics and Cisco deliver that evolution. The central nervous system for IT. Generating robust new power to digitally transform the enterprise in unprecedented ways. Starting with providing visibility of the breadth and depth of data from network devices, data centers, and application metrics. Then delivering a heightened level of intelligent monitoring. Infusing operations with the power of artificial intelligence, which drives deeper insights and triggers actions. Operating so efficiently that the notion of what's humanly possible is challenged. Ultimately changing the way we all connect, work and learn. At AppDynamics and Cisco, we invite you to harness the potential within your business to drive positive change and become an agent of transformation. Hello everybody and welcome to AdvoChat. So AdvoChat is the area within Cisco Live where you can kick back and you can relax and you can hear from Cisco customers as they share their experiences of how Cisco technologies have helped them tackle challenges within their organizations and also help them achieve their business goals. So this AdvoChat is all about professional networking and building your brand and beyond. And just a few moments, we'll be hearing how our Cisco customers from around the world have been learning, connecting and building their personal brand as part of the Cisco Gateway program, which is Cisco's networking community. Uh, so please welcome my uh, armchair advocates, <laughs> um, Cisco advocates, uh, Christoph Neulinger, uh, Senior Network Specialist, Wouter Hendricks, Technical Team Lead Network and Security, and Cisco's own Barbara Fontella Barro, Advocacy Brand and Creative Marketing of Amir. So please join me, give them a warm round of applause. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much Hello. for joining us. So uh, Barbara, perhaps you could uh, start by telling us a little bit about the Gateway program, please. Sure. So the Gateway is our peer-to-peer -peer community for all Cisco customers across the world. Uh, they can join and interact with other peers, uh, share their ideas, learn about the latest news from Cisco, uh, also access educational content, and all uh, while building the, their personal brand, um, like showcasing their story, uh, accessing and speaking opportunities like these ones. And also it's gamified, so they get points, they get rewards, they climb up uh, different levels until getting to Gateway Rockstar. It's quite fun. Brilliant, okay. Um, and so then perhaps you could both introduce yourselves. Perhaps, Christoph, could you, uh, we start with you, please? Yeah, okay, I'm Christoph Neulinger. I'm coming from Generali Company, which is a big insurance company, and I'm responsible for data center networking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I joined Gateway two years ago, something like two years ago. Okay, and Walter? My name is uh, Walter Hendricks. I'm the team lead for network and security at uh, Missing Peace in the Netherlands. And we're a small managed service provider, uh, providing managed services for small and medium businesses uh, in the Netherlands. Nice. And so when, and I suppose why, did you join the Gateway in the first place, Walter? Uh, I joined in Cisco Live Berlin uh, four years ago now. It was my first Cisco Live. And then during the keynotes, there was the announcement that there was this new customer advocacy platform. And at, well, it was first time Cisco Live. It was so many things going on and I thought, well, just head over there, have a look around, see what, what this is about. I mean, everything was new to me. 
uh, and they had the uh, they had the app and there were some uh, challenges in there say hey here uh, if you want to learn something about this, you can go there and they really guided you around. It really helped me to, well, discover Cisco Live uh, events and, well, been playing ever since in the Gateway. Never look back. True. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Christoph, what's been your favorite activity that you've taken part in since being a Gatewayer? I really like the discussions on uh, um, the Gateway. So it's a chance to post your own questions, getting technical advice from your peers, and also the possibility to, to answer the, this, or the question of others or give some ideas what's new, what's about. So it's really interesting and helpful to get this information. Oh, excellent. Um, and well, so when was the first time you participated in a case study or a story on, on the Gateway? Um, I think it was in the first year, there was the opportunity to do an, uh, an upshot uh, story. Yeah. And it's basically a, a ghost-written piece. You do an interview of about an hour, they, and they just ask you, well, what is your story? What do you want to tell about? How would you like to have it uh, written? You can review it. It made a really nice piece. I still have it pinned on my LinkedIn uh, profile as well. <laughs> it's a really, yeah, really good written piece. And it's just basically about, well, what do you want to tell about, about your work, about what you're doing, your experiences? OK, brilliant. Um, and you participated in various speaking opportunities as well, am I right? In I did. Uh, last year uh, I was in uh, Chatpel here as, uh, as well, and this year I've, well, I'm here again, and I've also been invited to a data center uh, chat session tomorrow. Okay, all right. Um, and uh, Christoph, how would you say that the gateways helped you in, in your career? Okay. Um, I would say, uh, as a networking engineer, it's not my strength to get in uh, to position me to sell myself so it does help to have a way like the gateway where you get into contact and it's easier like with the challenges Barbara mentioned it's easier to get uh, into activities getting seen from others mm. so that does help and I think also getting to the level of rock star it sounds like yeah now you <laughs> hear some it's the only way I'm not musician a musician I can't do any music so it's the only way to get a rock star <laughs> Jesus properly maybe we can we can explain what's what's a rock star is we have different levels in the gateway, so you, you get activities that, that you can complete, like sharing something on social or reading a, a news, reading a case study. You can also give us feedback directly to Cisco, and it's like your gateway to Cisco, basically. So they, they start earning the points, and they go through four levels, and I think Walter has 80,000 points at the moment after four <laughs> years. So, uh, yeah, you have to unlock badges and get points to get to Rockstar. It's a, it's a long process, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Walter, would you say that the gateways helped you in your career as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody has a LinkedIn profile, uh, but basically you put your CV on there and then what? I mean, if you're in the same job all the time, there's not that much going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the challenges in the gateway, uh, they say, hey, here's an, a nice customer story, here's a new product, here's something interesting going on, and you can choose to say, hey, just with a simple click, I want to share this on my LinkedIn, hey, I want to send a tweet about it. You, you can edit your own message if you want, but it keeps your, uh, your social profile uh, up to date and interesting. I mean, I'm getting a lot more, well, interaction with other people, more, more followers just by, well, resharing the interesting stuff I see on the gateway. It's, it's like positioning uh, our customers as industry thought leaders mm. uh, because they are experts in their, in their technology. So that's yeah, of cool. Course. Yeah. Um, and, and Christoph, so how are you going about building your professional network and interacting with peers? You mentioned the discussion, plenty of gateways. Yeah. Like Uta as well said, it does help to have this on LinkedIn. I've got yeah. some like when I announce that I'm speaking here, it's like you get people seeing it, clicking it. You get in right. more uh, presentation to the outside and the same with the showcases. And uh, this way uh, you uh, increase your visibility. And uh, the problem in uh, the companies most of the time is the internal experts say are like, uh, we better hear the outside. and. If you uh, say you recognize, okay, he seems to be really the expert, even from outside recognized, it does help even inside of the company. Okay, and how would you say that both of your relationships with Cisco itself has changed since being a gatewayer? 
Well, yeah, I feel more, yeah, more connected, more part of what's happening. I mean, you're always the first or what is the first outside of Cisco to know what's happening, what new things are happening. If there's a new, yeah, like I mentioned, if there's a new product or anything, there even was a, a challenge where you could get uh, your hands on an engineering sample of the Wi-Fi 6 uh, access points. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. if I hadn't been part of the gateway, there's no way I would have an engineering sample of Cisco just to, well, try out, see how it works. Uh, I, I took, off the, took off the cover, had a look inside as well. I mean, there's, that would not have happened if it wasn't in the gateway. So really, uh, really cool stuff, yeah. What's, what's yeah. been your favorite challenge so far? Ooh, there's so many. Um, there, there, well, but the favorite bit about the gateway is that you never know what kind of challenge will be on. I mean, every day you open the app and it can be something like, well, there was one, share a picture of your, uh, your pet with a Cisco uh, swag. There was uh, another one, uh, post a review. There, there, there are fun questions. Yeah. There's, uh, there, there's trivia uh, going on. There's also some Ask the Expert sessions, for example, again, with the Wi-Fi 6. They got a few uh, people who were speaking uh, at Cisco Live as well and just say, hey, if you have any questions, just post them here. We'll ask them of, mm. the, uh, of the people. So it's always a, a surprise what's going to happen. It's not, it's not always the same. There's, I think I've completed hundreds of challenges by uh, by now but every time it's still a surprise for me when i open the app what's well what what kind of fun am i going to have today oh that's really nice nice bit it's, of excitement to your day I like that yeah and i would like to add with some of the challenges you also have the feeling, or i have the feeling i give some information to cisco that they better understand me as a customer so we might get a bit more influence in uh, shaping what cisco thinks it's yeah. correct for us or what's uh, relevant for us as customers so that's also fun and uh, also doing something where i feel yeah okay yeah. cisco hears me this way really part of something yeah um and so is that yeah so how would you say that your relationship has changed with cisco do you feel a lot more sort of in synergy as well yeah i as i said i feel like uh, i get more of a voice to inside yeah. of cisco if you talk here with uh, uh, the presenters or something, it's always only one person. But there, I think they do ask questions via the gateway where they say, okay, we would like to know what the customer thinks of it. And this way they get at least my voice and I know, okay, I'm counted and I might do an impact on what they are doing next. Uh, and, and when it comes to sort of building a personal brand, Walter, well, so how do you go about using the gateway to do that? Um, well, uh, with the social sharing, it really, uh, really helps. We did the Upshot uh, interview and also all these kind of like, speaking opportunities like uh, Christoph mentioned, you get, uh, they make a nice banner. I'm speaking at Cisco Live to put on uh, basically the info behind you. They just make a special banner and they say, hey, you can use this on Facebook, you can use this on LinkedIn, use this on Twitter and it really mm -hmm. helps. And also if you post, there's got to be, uh, well, lo all the other Cisco advocates, they will get a notification, they can like your post, it really helps. Yeah, being noticed. Okay. Um, and Barbara, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about Upshots and the opportunities that are available yep. to uh, gatewayers. So we, we, we will try to give uh, the gatewayers the opportunity to raise their voice and share their experience as customers. Also because, as, as they were saying, uh, customers trust customers when they are looking to make the purchasing decisions. So with Upshot, uh, in, in one week, you can uh, have a 30-minute interview about your project, uh, also a chance to recognize your team and to uh, get visibility within your company by sharing what you're doing. Um, the, the journalist writes, goes, goes writes the interview and allows you to review it online. And then, as Walter said, you can pin it in your LinkedIn profile and, and increase your personal branding. And I'd like to add also uh, one comment, uh, um, something Walter said. I've, I've heard you said the gateway is a bit like taking Cisco Live home for the, yep. for the yep. whole year. So the, the experts, the networking opportunities of being with other customers. So uh, I, I really like that quote when you mentioned. Can you expand a bit on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I had it after, after Cisco Live uh, in Berlin, uh, you had Cisco Live and after that, it's a, it's a bit of a downer. I mean, all the, the, the discoveries, all the excitement, all the, 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 the deep technical info, all the products, and then, then the week is, yeah, is gone, and then you're just back at your desk, back at your job. But with the gateway on your, uh, on your phone, you can still ha hang on to that feeling. You still, well, will get product launches. You can still interact with, uh, with the people there. So you take Cisco Live with you uh, if you become a member of the Gateway. 
so I've seen uh, up in the, the Gateway Lounge upstairs, there's a Hall of Fame and we've got a couple of rock stars here, as we mentioned. So what's your experiences of, of being a rock star? Tell me for us mere mortals. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it's nice that you, uh, at the Rockstar status, you get uh, a bit more, uh, well, there, there's, uh, there's a chat room as well. There's some uh, Cisco uh, VPs in there as well. So there's even more access to Cisco, even more exclusive things than being a, a, a gateway star. And you just have to, well, participate and you will rack up the points. You can trade them in for prizes as well. I don't think that's been mentioned yet. So that's, well, the first reason I, uh, I started playing was because there was I think it was a, a Nintendo you could win, oh, nice. and you could not get enough points in the first week, so you had to keep playing. That really, uh, well, really hooked me. <laughs> and that's yeah. I mean, you come for the prizes, but you stay for the uh, for the people, for the for the access, for the uh, the information, and yeah, everything you can do uh, with it. Okay, and how about you, Rockstar? Crystal. <laughs> yeah, first when I, I reached the rockstar level, it felt a bit surreal to say, okay, I'm even in this group. Yeah, you're on the top part of the group. But as I said before, for me, it's something also to represent, okay, it's something on my social profile to say, hey, I'm a rockstar, I'm connected, I get more information, maybe from Cisco, I'm better connected. Uh, and probably also uh, you recognize people speaking to you on the, uh, Cisco Live saying, hey, I've seen you, yours. <laughs> <laughs> you get noticed walking around. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Oh. And it's cool to see on the picture on the wall. I, I think it was from last year from Cisco Live. I, I haven't had this picture. It looks that good. And it was like, yeah, my picture on the wall. <laughs> it's like you're famous. <laughs> yeah. um, and have you, uh, well, to, perhaps you could start with this. Have you had any exclusive opportunities that you simply wouldn't have had had you not have been part of the gateway? Uh, well, like I mentioned, the engineering sample of the Wi-Fi 6 X point. And two years ago, there was the, a big contest and you could win a, a fully Paid trip to Cisco Live in the US, uh, Orlando, Florida. I was a lucky winner uh, then, oh, so I spent uh, a week at Cisco Live US. Oh, I mean, wow. Cisco Europe is huge, uh, Cisco US is more huge. And it's <laughs> incredible the size, the sessions, uh, everything that's going on there. It was a really great experience. Uh, and also, which is also nice, uh, after the, uh, the visits, uh, I wrote a blog post, also had got some help from the Gateway, just making it a, a nice post uh, yeah, to help me also well, present that story on, uh, on my LinkedIn profile. Yeah, I think we started that year. Now it's a tradition, the road to Cisco Life. So we always uh, have competitions to send gatewayers from across the regions to meet the, the gatewayers in the, in the other side of the world. So last week we closed the competition to go to Melbourne, for example. And uh, hopefully we'll have the one to, to go to Las Vegas. So it's a nice. tradition now. And we have one of the US members uh, with us here yeah. as well. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, and can you think of any um, any examples from perhaps other customers who have exclusive opportunities that have really stuck in your mind that you've thought, oh, yeah, that's that's really brilliant. They wouldn't have got that if they weren't part of the gateway. So we re we were recently in London for for a business meeting, and we got one of our London uh, uh, base gatewayers to join us in the city office. Uh, directly with our uh, with the vice president of, of our department, with Jeremy Biban, and uh, give the direct feedback about his experience being a Cisco customer to him, and uh, he, like he really takes notes and like it gets up high to Cisco to change things. So I think uh, I, I like to make those connections. And Walter has been with us in Rome too, uh, talking to to our uh, our senior leaders directly. So I like that part. Yeah. Nice. And um, so what would you say to people if they were thinking, oh, yeah, OK, uh, here I am in the Gateway hub. If they're thinking about joining the Gateway but haven't done it yet, what would each of you say to them about joining the Gateway? Chris, yeah, I would say you? definitely do it. There's nothing you can lose. It's only a win situation and especially the discussions. The more people are joining, the, so everybody here hopefully as well, the more people are joining the better uh, feedback we get. So we should be more connected. I've seen it in software development, like Stack Overflow. No, every programmer knows it. There you can exchange or post your problems. And if what that would be more into the gateway with more people, the more people, the better. So 
course. Yeah. Just do it. It's, it's no uh, especially on the communities, it's very easy yeah. to find companies who are facing the same challenges. Uh, they just ask, hey, does somebody have experience with this? Or, hey, we're thinking about this. Anybody? And then you can just, well, immediately connect with someone and they can walk you through how they solve that problem. So, yeah, please do join. It, it's a great, uh, great community. And Barbara? So I would say that for for us, uh, the, the more co the more close the closer we are to the customers, uh, the more we understand them, and the better we can do our jobs. So uh, please join us because we, we want to hear from you and we we want to focus on your your problems and and understand you better. So lovely. And and do you have any questions for one another whilst whilst we're here? A short one for Barbara. What will be happening with the gateway? It will be more of the same, more challenges. Anything special next year you can tease us about? Mm. <laughs> okay. What What can I say? What can I say? Uh, of yeah. course, everything. It's not like we're on camera or anything. <laughs> no, no, we're not being streamed. Uh, so we we've been thinking a lot about connecting you with the other regions. Uh, I don't. We're working on it, on how to do it. But we know that you want to chat with with rock stars in America and with rock stars in APJC. So yeah, that, that would be great because at the moment we're three separate communities, but we're all well facing the same problems, having the same successes. Okay. Be really good to connect with the other uh, continents. Yeah. So maybe connecting you with uh, people of your same size or your same industry, even if in, yeah. if they are in another in another region and in another geography, it's more important for you than just being connected within the, the geography. So we would like to explore that. Good idea. OK, it's great to be able to have that feedback. And that's definitely something that the, the gateway facilitates, isn't it? Um, and I want to open up questions from the floor if anybody has any questions for our advocates. And there's a microphone that we can bring over. Thank you. Um, I would ask both of you, what was the best reward you have gotten so far best <laughs> rewards um yep yeah, trip to cisco live us it was the best for me yeah uh, for me it's a problem with uh, compliance so we are very strict in germany as you probably know <laughs> so i would like to have more of like training opportunities or something like this where i say okay it's not for me it's for the company so i won't have a problem with any compliance rules about this any other questions from the floor? Over to Ben. Hi. Uh, so you talked a lot about um, you know the rewards you got, but I wondered, how's it helped your career to be part of the Gateway as well? Uh, well, one of the rewards I think there were uh, last year. There was some professional training as well. There was presentation training. Uh, there was um, I forgot the other one. There was one earlier also about. Uh, how to run an efficient meeting or something uh, that really helps as well. So it's also yeah, professional development. It's not just uh, gadgets or trips. It's also uh, yeah, becoming better at your job, better in your company. Yeah, for me, like Wouter said before, with this LinkedIn, it's much easier to post something on LinkedIn when you already have most of the. Uh, it, you agree with it, but it's much easier, and then you get more um, yeah, better seen from other uh, people. So that does help in the career, I think. Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, if anybody is interested in, in joining the Gateway, and there is about a thousand reasons why you should, um, then do go and chat to the people in the navy blue um, polo shirts, and they'll be happy to tell you all about how you can get all these wonderful benefits, like first access to news and building your personal brand. Um, and also, if you are a gateway already and you fancy winning 450 points by sharing some of your uh, thoughts on camera, Danny at the back waving a hand uh, will be delighted to chat to you. Um, and then we're going to be doing some more advert chatting at 3.30, but please join me in giving a huge thank you to Christoph, to Wouter and to Barbara. Thank you very much. Working in IT presents some unique challenges. I think I got a virus. Traditionally, we've needed an IT person on site to deal with any issues 24 hours a day. But with the Meraki dashboard, we can monitor our networks and troubleshoot issues from anywhere. So the IT team finally got to take a happiness day. 
We went to the beach. Tracy really took advantage of it. No regrets. Al convitto nazionale Umberto I ci sono circa 300 insegnanti, educatori, personale di supporto che lavorano con circa 1500 studenti che provengono dall'Italia ma anche dal resto del mondo. E gli studenti vivono in due campus separati. È una grossa comunità che si affida alla rete cablata ma al wireless anche per accedere alle risorse educative e nel caso degli studenti residenziali per connettersi con le proprie famiglie sia in Italia che all'estero. Il mio compito è garantire che gli studenti e il personale dispongano degli strumenti di cui hanno bisogno per collegarsi online. Dal 2014 ci affidiamo all'esperienza del partner NSC che ci aiuta a selezionare, a impostare e a gestire la nostra infrastruttura. Circa tre anni fa è emerso con forza che la nostra infrastruttura di rete esistente non era più adeguata. E se da una parte l'Università di Torino ci garantisce un'ampia larghezza di banda, noi ci siamo resi conto che dall'altra parte il nostro hardware e software di sicurezza erano carenti. Sono stati due i problemi da affrontare. Il primo era la mancanza di uniformità. Il secondo problema era l'inadeguatezza della sicurezza della rete e degli strumenti di gestione delle autorizzazioni. Avevamo bisogno di una soluzione flessibile per poter filtrare i contenuti online, visto che noi abbiamo una popolazione studentesca che spazia dalla scuola primaria fino ai licei. Per risolvere il problema dell'affidabilità e della sicurezza della rete del convitto bisognava prima di tutto lavorare su un'infrastruttura stabile e sicura. Per questo abbiamo proposto subito Firewall Cisco, Switch Cisco e Access Point Cisco su tutta la rete. Una volta predisposta un'infrastruttura stabile e facile da gestire, abbiamo rivolto l'attenzione alla sicurezza della rete e anche in questo caso abbiamo proposto la tecnologia Firepower di Cisco, una solida soluzione di sicurezza che automatizza la gestione delle minacce e fornisce strumenti di configurazione della rete basate su dashboard. E dimostrando che questa soluzione era compatibile con le limitazioni di budget esistenti nel conflitto. Possiamo assegnare i profili utente a gruppi specifici per gli studenti in base all'età e al livello scolastico e impostare i privilegi di accesso per contenuto e posizione. Siamo in grado di inserire nelle white list i contenuti educativi appropriati e nella lista nera materiale non idoneo. Gran parte del processo è automatizzato, ma è anche facile modificare le richieste che pervengono da insegnanti e da studenti. Le soluzioni Cisco hanno offerto ai nostri studenti una connettività affidabile e sicura e abbiamo fatto molto affidamento sul partner NSC e continueremo a farlo in futuro. Il nostro compito è fornire ai nostri studenti le migliori opzioni per imparare. Ora possiamo farlo e possiamo stare tranquilli sapendo che sono protetti, concentrati sui contenuti appropriati e utilizzano la tecnologia per ottenere la migliore istruzione possibile. Cisco bridge to possible. What does the future hold for transportation? In five years? Ten? How will we continue to move through our communities and around the world? Today, autonomous mobility teases us with the possibility of decreased congestion and heightened safety on the not-so-distant horizon. However, Any system that supports autonomous vehicle technology will not simply manifest overnight. We must adapt for a more user-centric, securely connected infrastructure that allows autonomous vehicles to communicate, process data, and collaborate across transportation systems. Machines coupled with artificial intelligence-powered technology can mimic humans, automate tasks, and learn dynamically, just as we do. AI in transportation is expected to surge as organizations look to generate more revenue and maintain a competitive edge. As intelligent transportation and volumes of data continue to grow, AI will help us create better and safer experiences for those on the go.
A new age of sustainable, accessible, and inclusive mobility is driving the transportation industry. Mobility as a service will require innovations in our existing transportation infrastructure that can transcend the disparate modes of transportation. Mobility as a service is not just a vision for transportation nirvana, it is a lever that can empower networked, livable communities to benefit all people. The Internet of Things has dramatically accelerated the pace of disruption in the transportation industry. IoT coordinated systems can help alleviate traffic congestion and allow emergency service vehicles to reach incidents faster. Even so, as more things become a part of the vast, connected web of IoT, transportation organizations must be vigilant in their approach to network security, regulatory compliance, and cyber resilience. Everything you do today and tomorrow, from perfecting the passenger experience for ultra-high-speed rail travel to laying the foundation for the driverless revolution, depends on a secure, reliable IT infrastructure. It will require a deepened commitment to digital transformation that supports the changing face of transportation. Cisco is here to help. These days, you want more from the multi-cloud world. More application flexibility, more cost savings, more opportunity and less worrying about making everything work together. We get it, which is why we're here to make the process easier and help accelerate IT adoption, allowing you to do more than ever. With our technical expertise and best practices, we'll help you transform your business, accelerate growth, and create a cloud strategy that aligns with your needs. One that brings together networking, analytics, application management, and cloud governance with around-the-clock support to make sure all your clouds work together seamlessly and securely. Because in today's world, you must adapt faster than ever before. And we're here to help align your business with the multi-cloud world. Get the most out of your technology investment with Cisco Customer Experience for Cloud. Our next sponsor here during this uh, particular segment is Cisco Customer Experience, and Cisco CX has been right out of the gate, such a powerful, powerful conversation uh, here at the show. CX is delivering all those outcomes that business really demands in this hyper-connected digital world. It's all about the digital transformation. Uh, there's a lot of challenge and risk in it, but of course what's happening with CX is a life cycle approach. It touches mm. across so many different aspects of our Cisco portfolio, and we're really excited to talk about it right now. So I should introduce who I have with me. Phil Wolfen didn't hear our VP of Customer Experience experience centers in EMIR, and I'm especially excited to have Mena Ayad here with us, a consulting engineer for CX EMIR, and also, I need to let all of you know, uh, Mena is the youngest CCIE that we have in Africa, and uh, that's really <laughs> incredibly so cool. And I wanted to make sure that we got that in. So welcome, guys, thank you so much, and, and glad to have you with us. Thank you for having us. So Phil, let's talk about, right out of the gate at the keynote yesterday, mm. CX, a big part of the story, and maybe for the first time at one of our Cisco Lives where CX takes such a front seat at the event. For How sure. exciting was that for you after all the years that you've put in to build this up? Yeah, and um, you, know, you and I have talked most years about, uh, about this exact thing, Steve, so, um, in previous years, I, I remember coming and saying, you know, we're, we're, we're incrementally we stepping said, forward. Sorry, what are you doing? What are you doing? We're, we're getting doing? a little bit more <laughs> famous in the company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a mention sometime in the, on the third day. Right. Um, this year, it's taken a huge leap forward. It's, it's like we have, we're, we're now part of the company strategy. And honestly, that's, I've been here longer than I, I care to. <laughs> Inform everybody, <laughs> this is the very first time. 20 years, time. by the way, I should say, 20 years uh, building this up. Indeed, indeed. And it's, it's the most traction, the most airtime, and the most relevance we've had at a company level ever. 
It's really incredibly exciting. Um, Mena, you heard Alistair talking yesterday that CX is really a, a people business. What does he mean by that? What do you mean by that when we talk about this as being a people-focused business? Yeah, so I totally agree with Alistair. The CX is a people business, and I'm really happy to be part of this organization as it shares the same value as what I value the most, which is caring about people. Uh, so I think that CX, we have a pool of diverse talents, which not only bring technical experience to the customers and partners, but also take them through the great customer experience, which aims at achieving the customer success. So what I personally do at CX is that I'm a consulting engineer, so I love to be part of the customer success journey, which starts from gathering the requirements and then putting the design on based on this uh, requirements and then uh, implementing and testing uh, this new design in the uh, environment. At the end, I believe that CX, that we build our CX, CX uh, success portfolio based upon our customers and partners' success. Which is really so perfectly put. I, I don't think you could have encapsulated it any better. To me, and I always talk about this, this goes to the heart of who we are at Cisco. As much technology as we want to talk about, it's great. We've got the tech, everybody can go and check it out for themselves, but it's sometimes very hard for people to understand who we are as a corporate culture, how we feel about our customers. Are they getting it? Do they understand what is available to them through the CX offering? I don't know, is the answer. Okay. I hope they do. I mean, when you walk around a show floor like this, what are the responses that you get? Well, I, I, can, I heard some stats yesterday. So for those who haven't seen it, World of Solutions, you go in, there's the CX stand, right there mm -hmm. in front of you, and it's, and it's enormous. Which tells you, the fact that it's right up front, that tells you a lot you of what go. you need to know. So go, go visit that. Uh, I was told yesterday, unofficially, that uh, <laughs> the CX stand was the second busiest in World of Solutions. Uh, we were only beaten by collaboration, but they cheated because they were giving away a device. So we didn't say that uh, live on there. We go. No, no, no. So um, <laughs> uh, on, on, if we're all playing fair, yeah. uh, then the CX uh, stand was the, was the most popular in World of Solutions, and that's amazing. All right. So that does mean that people are starting to get the story. They know what's available. What about visits to the CX centers? Mm. So the 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 engagement levels that we have are just going off the chart. And the strategy we have now about the, uh, managing people around that life cycle and delivering business value that they define, we don't define what they want from the solution, the customers define what they, they want from the solution, the impact we're having of escorting them, a white glove service, escorting them around that life cycle to those objectives is having tremendous impact. And we're, we're so busy. You know, we talked about it being a people business. Honestly, I can't hire people fast enough. Sure. Uh, there, aren't, there aren't that many talent, talented people in the world right now uh, for me to be able to hire them all. So, um, so it's, it's, it's going great. What a, what a wonderful problem to have. And, and then I think that sort of puts you into rarefied air, the fact that you are actually in the door. You're still fairly new to the team here at this point. What has the Cisco experience been like, being a part of this particular organization and what it tries to accomplish? Yeah, so uh, after graduation from university, actually I started in one of the CX centers in Krakow, Poland for six months. And actually I started my network journey from scratch uh, in the CX center. And we started there from, with the CCNA, the associate level in routing and switching. And then I wanted to understand things deeper. So I went for the CCNT, which is the professional level, and then the CCIE. And um, all of my studying materials was from the online learning platforms at Cisco. So I think as a graduate within one year and a half to start from scratch at Cisco, and then using the CX Services Academy programs and the online learning platforms is a great example and they really encourage uh, every graduate to join this uh, CX graduate programs because he will not only learn the technical knowledge but he will also like gain the connections and bonds with all of his colleagues from the region that will last along his career. And I believe at Cisco, if you would like to learn, uh, it's not only for young graduates, it's for everyone. And if you want to learn and develop all of the like the, everything is available for you. Opportunity, opportunity. By the way, I, I, I don't want to miss mentioning that yesterday, uh, CX posted out one of the coolest videos that I've seen in a while from Newcastle. Uh, oh, yeah. Their implementation of what was happening in CX, and I was just really impressed with it. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's again all about that digital transformation story. Uh, finding better outcomes for local residents in Newcastle, better cost savings, um, making sure that the area is known for tech innovation, and to me that speaks to so much of what CX is trying to accomplish. So congratulations on that, and go check out that vi video again from the Newcastle City Council. Um, Phil Mena, thank you. I'm really, really glad to have you guys in here with me. I'm glad to be able to hear this story. Thank you for the sponsorship. Congratulations on the success, and I hope we get a lot more opportunity to talk with one another.
Hope so. Thank, Thank you, you Steve. so much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. All right, so now we have got a short video, very short video that we are going to play for you that helps sort of take you on that customer journey. Enjoy the video. We're going to see you back here in just a little over 20 seconds. We'll be back shortly. What does it look like when Cisco accelerates your success with the right data, insights, and expertise at the right time? Introducing Cisco Collaborative Intelligence, a digital experience fueled by pervasive telemetry, powerful guidance for your most strategic use cases, proven lifecycle best practices, contextual learning to embrace innovation, all powered by AI, ML, and Cisco's intellectual capital. With Cisco Customer Experience, you'll find a complete view of assets and intelligent recommendations, integrated case management, and use case-driven guidance every step of the way. Between human experiences and digital experiences, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. It's now official. Your organization wants to embrace all that the cloud has to offer to accelerate innovation balanced against existing application and infrastructure investments. Your developers are now asking to use Kubernetes to deploy applications both on-premises and in the cloud. Well, guess who needs to manage all that? Clustering, configuration, networking, monitoring, security? In the data center you manage and in the cloud, while making sure those two look the same as much as possible. And let's not forget, you still need to support your existing non-containerized applications. Hmm. That sounds like a lot of work and having to use many different tools. If only there was one single solution to make things easier. Introducing the Cisco hybrid solution for Kubernetes on AWS. One solution that speeds and simplifies Kubernetes deployment and management across on-premises and AWS, directly integrating with the Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service, Amazon EKS for short to offer a common experience when working with containerized applications. With optional components that support the full lifecycle of not just your Kubernetes-based applications, but also your existing on-premises investments. Fully extensible to all your clouds and with first-line support from Cisco across all components, including open source and AWS services. There you go. You just made your life and your developers' lives easier. Oh and your networking and security teams will be happy as well. With Cisco, containers on-prem and in the cloud can be easy. We're here with the International Society for Technology and Education, partnering with Cisco in order to create very immersive, hands-on experiences. We've created the Mars Classroom Simulator up on the trade show floor, and what this is is an escape experience where teachers solve challenges to qualify to teach on Mars using Wi-Fi 6 and wireless networks and technologies to be able to communicate back to the Earth base station. They're going to be in there with a group of eight people at a time, working together to see if they have what it takes. Welcome to the Cisco Mars Classroom Simulator. We are currently seeking out the best and brightest teachers. What we're really trying to do is provide an experience for educators so that they can create active learning environments that help students to solve difficult problems. Welcome to the Mars Classroom Simulator. As you look around, there's many system malfunctions happening within the game. And so you have to put the passcodes into each of these in order to successfully escape. There's bad weather coming through Mars, and so they have to use the emergency alert system to get everyone to safety. Over here we have the WebEx boards with Cisco, and this is actually how they're going to call mission control in order to help collaborate with a team on the outside to solve the challenge. And inside here is our medical bay room. Everybody on the team, please scan your faces. We'll have facial recognition where they go through and they have to scan and find the person who's ill in order to help them recover. Throughout here, they have to create a solar panel where they have to use light with a flashlight in order to make it spin. They have a radiation box here where they have to decode something. And so there's all sorts of puzzles embedded within the Cisco experience to create that full immersion. This is the Milwaukee Station, which is all about device management, but they're also all about safety and security. And so here we've got cameras set up throughout the escape room. And one of the cameras is a fisheye lens that actually puts the user in the room live as if they're one of the players in the escape room. 
We have VR goggles that are hooked up to Meraki security cameras to help them escape. Now we have the ability to basically replicate this experience, improve upon it at many different shows uh, throughout education. And that is amazing because it's a quick and easy way to really create that emotional connection, create hands-on experiences for Cisco to really showcase the great things they're doing. It's clear today that, for most city leaders, the question isn't whether to embark on a digital transformation, but how and when. Doing so requires clear vision and sustained long-term investment from governments and their leadership. To maximize your chances of success, there are three critical components to any smart city and digital transformation initiative. Municipal modernized broadband and Wi-Fi networks an effective end-to-end -end cybersecurity approach that underpins everything, and an investment plan that reinvests the savings or revenue generated by each project into the next one. Let's take a closer look at each. Modernized broadband and public Wi-Fi lay the true foundation of a connected city. Without broadband and Wi-Fi networks, installing remote sensors of any kind can be cost prohibitive. Jesse Burst of the Smart Cities Council said it best. You have to have citywide connectivity, not just for your people, not just for your smartphones, but for your sensors and other devices. And that's what unleashes all of these other opportunities. But helping your city become smart and connected won't mean anything if the city's network isn't secure. Cybersecurity is critical to the success and growth of digital cities, especially considering that government networks, with their wealth of public data and complex systems, are a prime target of hackers and terrorists alike. Cybersecurity is a growth enabler that ensures confidence among city workers and residents and the community as a whole. And of course, nothing in government can happen without the budget and commitment for it. Implementing digital capabilities requires vision, political will, and money. For cities in particular, the costs of adoption tend to be concentrated, but the benefits are often dispersed. While funding is likely to come from the city budget, the biggest benefits may flow to other agencies or even private businesses. That requires careful cultivation of public and private investments and management of disparate government agencies, all of which stand to benefit. There, there is a common thread for each city that hopes to become smart and connected. They must start with a strong foundation of digital infrastructure. They must have the network and core capabilities to connect employees, residents, sensors, and even private vehicles. From this base, they can continue to innovate and grow. Their success shows in their ongoing digital transformations. We'll take a look at how one city started on their journey in Lesson 3. Hi there, we're here at Cisco Live Barcelona 2020 and we're talking uh, collaborations. A collaboration has had a massive feature right across the show. We saw it in the keynote and for me it's one of the favorite things and favorite topics to talk about because it's technology that you actually can get your hands on, touch and feel, and it changes the way that people work, live, play and learn. So collaboration, specifically workplace transformation, gets more and more focused all the time and that's especially relevant now more than ever because there are five different generations of people in the workforce. So so this needs people who are um, solutions that are flexible, uh, minimum constraints, smarter options, um, and free from things like meetings, things like contact center, especially with the focus on customer experience. And so with that, of course, we need IT to be secure, we need it to be reliable, we need it to be scalable, and that's why there are so many customers here at Cisco Live Barcelona taking a look at some of the solutions um, and getting to understand some of the WebEx portfolio a little bit further. So to see this all in action, let's take a look at this really short video all about collaboration and how it's uh, helping transform the workplace in Singapore.
We just saw how Cisco is transforming our own workplaces with the example of the beautiful new office in Singapore. Let me tell you, our office in Dusseldorf was just transformed and it is now a beautiful place to work. Transforming the workplace is a, is a part of empowering, our, uh, empowering teams to do the best work that they can, which is one of the ways that Cisco helps our customers and also a, a key pillar of Cisco's overall strategy. So we want to talk about this topic a little bit more, and I'm joined by a great guest, Scott Edwards, who's a Senior Director of Collaboration Solutions Marketing at Cisco. Hi, Scott. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for having us. And uh, I love that video that we just saw on the Singapore transformation. You know, we're hearing that a lot from our customers that they need to transform, for sure. Absolutely. So um, talk to me about some of the new things that Cisco is doing to enable these frictionless work experiences. Yeah, you know, and, and just going back to the workplace transformation, and it's all about people. You know, we're seeing more and more that companies need to innovate. They feel that pressure to innovate, but they look at collaboration as the tool to enable that. And, and sometimes the collaboration experiences between those employees as well as the customers aren't very good. You have to be able to empower the employees to have a fantastic frictionless experience when they communicate with each other. And that's what you see is part of that um, Cisco Singapore office. They looked at the work styles, they worked at the workspaces, and then how they integrate, how they work with the tool sets they work with to make sure that they can transform and, and, and be stronger and better at what they do. Well, I hope I get a chance to check it out in person. Uh, unfortunately, don't get over to Singapore that often. Um, just a couple of months ago, Cisco introduced this concept of a, a single collaboration platform uh, and the benefits that brings to IT and, and the users. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like and how it works and why it's important for customers to know? Yeah, we, we talked about the single platform advantage and, and why that's important. Again, how people communicate and how they work to, with, with the tools and with, with each other. You know, it used to be that IT had to stitch together a variety of different applications, right? Calling and messaging and meeting applications. That's, that's, that's friction, that's a hard thing. And they had a hard and, and not a very good experience when they would interact with those tools. With this idea and the concept of the single platform advantage, we're stitching together all that technology so it's a seamless experience for the user. So no matter where I work throughout the day, right? If I start my day in the coffee shop, if I move to a home office, if I go into work, it should be the exact same experience. And you think about it from an IT perspective, they want to be able to manage everything from a single spot and a single location. That's critical. Now, what we do with the WebEx Control Hub is, is we enable that. And, and if, I'd like to show you exactly kind of how that works in the, in the Control Hub of managing it all together. So here is, the, here is an overview of our, our Control Hub. And what you see here is, as I mentioned, you get to see messaging, I get to see team collaboration, I get to see calling, I get to see my hybrid services, whether I'm on-prem or, or in the cloud and the, and the integration between that. I get to see all the different devices. It's all right here in the collaboration, in the Cisco WebEx control hub, so I can see it all in one place. I can dive in to understand and get a better sense of, you know, if there's an issue, what's wrong? I can, I can, I can troubleshoot and identify what the issue is with the devices or the users all right here in the control hub. Amazing, so great, thanks for that great insight on what WebEx Control Hub can do. It looks like there's a lot of green check marks on there, so. It's all going well, yeah. Everything going well, <laughs> awesome. So um, earlier you talked about the, um, the importance of security and yes, collaboration. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I think security a lot in, in the past was as much of a siloed topic, but it's definitely now pervasive across all, of, all types of technologies that you deploy. Compliance and security are huge topics, uh, have been big topics this week as well. How do you ensure that in this open world where everyone needs to be able to collaborate with each other? I mean, everyone no, Cisco is built for security. From the ground up, security is our number one focus point. And we have to make sure that happens. We call it collaboration without compromise. We don't compromise simplicity or ease of use just, just to make that happen. We have to have security as a, as a single point. You see this right here in the control hub where I can come into settings and I can ensure all my security policies right here how I want to have every collaboration with my team, outside my team, if I'm doing external communications, how I can whitelist certain domains so I can accept communications from those. All the different devices, I mean, it just goes on and on. All my cognitive intelligence AI collaboration, I can set policies for those right here. Perfect, and uh, cognitive, great keyword, because we do want to move on to that topic now. Let's um, wander over here, because I think we've got another demo that we want to show. We right? do, we do, so um, we're going we're gonna to wander, right? So. <laughs> Uh, Cisco has been investing heavily in this area, cognitive collaboration. How does it fit within this unified platform that we're offering? 
It, it fits big, right? So we look at this as part of a, a key differentiator for us. Um, cognitive collaboration is something that, that brings intelligence into the platform. So let's, let's walk around right here. We're going to go over into this booth. It's busy. It's a busy booth here. So <laughs> that's what happens when you're on live TV. Yep. And I'm going to ask uh, Maureen. We're going we're gonna to start this uh, right now. So let's talk about cognitive collaboration. It, it is something that we want to provide insights into, into every element of the, the platform that I talked about before. And um, we can then pull a bunch of insight and intelligence into that, uh, from that and understand we, how we deliver the right information to the right people at the right time. And I hear there's some new things that you guys have announced with cognitive collaboration. Can you tell us a bit more about what those are and, and maybe if you've got something to show us and that'd be awesome as well. Yeah, so that's why we wanted to walk over here, right? So here we are at the WebEx Meetings booth. And one of the things that we've announced this week is the integration of Voicea into our WebEx platform. Notice I said platform because it's not just into WebEx Meetings, it's into a variety of elements into our platform, including the contact center. What Voicea does is extremely powerful, okay? So here I am, I'm in a meeting, right? And and I'm gonna be talking, you and I are gonna be talking, I'm gonna pretend like I'm on a phone in that meeting, and uh, here we're having a conversation. And what you see on the screen right over here is oh, wow, that- it's writing down what you're saying. It's writing down, it's real live, uh, real-time transcription that is, that is happening right here on, on, uh, on our WebEx meetings. Now that sounds cool and that sounds impressive, and it is. But there might be things like, I want to take an action item. So I'll say, OK, WebEx. And you see our little icon will we'll wake up. OK, WebEx, take an action item to send David the presentation. OK, so captures all this. And that's, that's rich details. And what you can see, this is, this is happening in real time right here. And then I could go over and I can see the highlights of the meetings. I can see action items that have happened and so forth. And then after the meeting, I can come over into my uh, personal meeting room, and here I can see all the different highlights that happened, the different action items, and then I can share that with the people afterwards. So it's a pretty powerful tool. Amazing. Uh, it looks like we need that kind of thing for our broadcast, so hard of hearing people can join in as well. Um, I think that's all we've got time for, yeah. unfortunately, but thank you so much for being on the show, and I think uh, we're heading back over to the studio with Nish. Nish, are you there for us? I'm here for you, David. Thank you so much for that. It was really interesting. So many things stood out to me. I noted one single platform for collaboration and collaboration without compromise. That was really great to hear. Um, and do you know what I find really funny, actually, is I'm here with a lot of my different teammates. We work in a virtual team, so we're based in all different countries. My manager's in Spain. My colleagues are in the US and Switzerland. We see each other here at Cisco Live a couple of times every year and it feels like we're always working together and we're never apart so I love that the collaboration is that great that you don't even realize that you're collaborating with technology it feels like you're there in person Zane now you're out in the uh, world of solutions you're going to tell us a little bit more about contact center right I'm indeed Nish thanks very much we're back here in the collaboration center but now we're speaking all about contact center and I'm here with Kurt May Kurt is going to tell us a little bit about contact center but first Kurt Introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Kurt May. I'm a business development manager with the Contact Center Business Unit. Welcome to Barcelona. Fantastic, Kurt. So, Kurt, look, we know this is an exciting space for Cisco. A lot's happening around Contact Center at the moment. Can you give us a lowdown? Sure, yeah. Really uh, a great, uh, exciting time uh, with Contact Center uh, for Cisco. Um, made a couple announcements this week. Probably the biggest thing is there's been an enormous amount of investments you know, with Cisco fairly recently. Um, two major uh, announcements around CloudCherry, what's being called WebEx Experience Management, kind of bridging the gap between customer experience and customer servicing. And then, of course, you probably heard some other things earlier about Voicea. So where it was a WebEx uh, Teams application, there's an enormous amount of applicability in the contact center. That ability to get transcripts, leverage that information, make contact centers uh, more efficient, has been absolutely excited. You know, we haven't seen some investments in a while, so we're seeing it now. It's all about the cloud, cloud-delivered services, you know, and it's all about business outcomes and the customer experience, so it's, it's really, really exciting. Uh, it's exciting. Now, I heard you mention the cloud there. Tell us more about how Cisco really helping our customers move to the cloud. What are we doing in this area? And that's great. So another announcement this week that we made, you know, of course, we have a, uh, a, a multi-tenant public cloud offering, WebEx Contact Center. This week, we announced WebEx Contact Center Enterprise. So this is a solution designed for our largest customers, 
um, that have very complex, high security, highly scalable, require an enormous amount of flexibility. It's foundationally the same as our uh, premise-based product, Contact Center Enterprise, um, but it's basically uh, being brought into the cloud, inside of Cisco data centers that we own, we operate it for them. So we've taken all the drudgery associated with racking and stacking servers, uh, building applications, uh, building, building, building the information itself, and then really putting the power back into the customers and to our uh, partner communities around delivering on, on applications, business outcomes, and, and, and really you know, meeting the requirements that, that we're being told on a regular basis. They want to be out of the infrastructure business. So it's about moving to the cloud. And then with programs like Flex, we make it extremely easy for customers to start on premise, move to the cloud. It's absolutely fantastic. Fantastic, Kurt. And look, it's really, really exciting. I'm super excited to see what's going to happen next in this space. Last thing before we go, what are you doing tonight? I heard there's a party on. I heard there's a party going on, so I'm going to get my finest on and ready to go. So I, it should be a lot of fun. I have no idea who's performing, but that's half the fun. I think he's looking good already. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks you very go. much for your time, Kurt. Thanks, Ed. So guys, look, we're going to head back into the studio where Nish is waiting on us. Thanks, Zane. That was really interesting to hear from you and from David and the people that you're spoke, speaking to. Sounds like a really great um, platform that we've launched. Obviously, we're talking about it all being one single platform, but it's great to see it actually in the world of solutions, see all the demos um, and see people wandering around, actually touching our technology, trying it out. Loved seeing the, the live uh, transcription that we had. And I actually can't wait to get home because I'm excited to try out some of these features myself. So even I'm learning things at the show where I'm here, speaking to people, interviewing them, seeing all the demos, which is great. So this morning, actually, Zane and I, uh, we ran over and stuck into the world of solutions a little bit early with our staff badges, and we were speaking to a guy called Brian, and he was showing us the Panorama endpoint. So actually getting to experience that, I think it's one of only a few in the world as we're starting to roll them out. And so actually getting the experience, I know Zane's got some really cool selfies. I'm sure he's going to be sharing those with CLEUR. Remember, hashtag CLEUR. For now, enjoy the Workplace Transformation uh, Innovation Talk. Stay right there. We'll be back. Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the Innovation Talks Theater. My name's Toby and I have the pleasure of being your host today. A big warm welcome to Cisco Live 2020. It's great seeing everyone here. There's a lot of us, but together we're going to build the bridge to get you where you need to go so you can accomplish anything. Now here at Cisco Live you're going to learn new things, be inspired and create a path to endless opportunities. We have 14 Innovation Talks here in this theater where we will share with you our latest solutions, innovations, and of course, best practices. Today we are looking into workplace transformation, and it's my pleasure to welcome two great speakers. Now, Sandeep Mayrock truly is a global citizen, currently located in Oslo, Norway, and is the Vice President and General Manager of WebEx Rooms in Telepresence. In his current role, Sandeep is responsible for the global strategy and business growth for the WebEx Devices Business Unit. And joining him today is Amit Barave, the Senior Director and Head of Product Management for WebEx Meetings. Please give a warm welcome to Sandeep and Amit. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for being here. My name is Sandeep. My name is Amit. And in the next 30 minutes, we're going to take you through a little journey of workplace transformation and how we believe this is going to be a massive shift that you can drive in each of your workplaces. So if I can grab the clicker. Now, it goes without saying that the future of work, and you've been hearing about it the last couple of days at this event, well, the future of work isn't out in the future. It is now. And this requires your attention. This requires action right now. And why is that? Well, very simply, the way we work and the workplace has gone through a massive change. Let's think about some of the key care abouts of every leader out there, including your CEO. The first and important one is agility is the new currency. Does your your company, does your office, does the workplace have a culture of innovation and being able to drive you know, great ideation and, and innovation across 
all the ways that they, they do things. A key care about for every CEO is about talent retention. Can I attract talent? And can I make sure that we retain that talent? And to that point, is the workplace that you have, does it really inspire folks, including millennials, or all the other types of folks in your, in your organization? Is it driving a culture where they get things done? A key area that many of you have been involved with is building these buildings, but are you able to unlock the value of this real estate? How many of you have seen this where you built these beautiful rooms for actually eight people, but typically used by one person? Yes? And the fact that we also live in an environment where we use so many tools. In fact, in Cisco, we did a survey ourselves on a daily basis, every Cisco employee touches about 34 plus tools. So think about the friction that that creates. So your teams really, what they need is they want to work from anywhere, they want to get things done, and they want to be able to have that innovation culture and, and do things at light speed. So let's think of the challenges that we've seen, and let's consider a beautiful room like this. I'm sure it's quite familiar. Many of you have a beautiful space like this, or also think about the complexity in that space. To, to just start a simple meeting, the user probably would have had to use three remotes. There's no memory, there's no persistence, and it just created so much friction. So over the last decade, we at Cisco have been very hard at work to really reimagine how you think about the modern workplace. Making it at a core team-centric, it has to be intelligent, invisible, where magic and magic moments just happen on the fly. It has to be integrated with how you do things, which is workflows, and most importantly, your customers, your partners, and you have made choices, technology choices. Cisco and all of these technology partners need to come together and provide an open platform. And this is what we've been driving towards. But if you really think to the next level, so it's not just the physical space. Teams need workplaces built for speed and innovation along the physical, the virtual too. I mean, just by show of hands, how many of you Every morning, the first thing which you do when you wake up is reach for the mobile phone. Well, I do that too. In fact, uh, you probably saw that even in the keynote. 64% of us, every, the first thing that we do is reach for that mobile phone. So our journeys start with that. And lastly, I spoke about the 34 plus tools. You probably have, in, a, in your environment, a similar number which your users are going through. And this is what Cisco has been very hard at work to see how we can really bring all of this together and drive innovation and speed. And then what we're doing is really taking this to the next level. Just by show of hands again, how many of you over here drive a self-driving car or a smart car? Okay, many of you. The reason I put this up here is the fact that the same technologies that you find in a device like this, in this beautiful car, is what we've embedded also at the platform. What that means then is you're having invisible, super intelligent moments in every part of how you think about the collaboration journey. Whether it is as you're starting the meeting, whether it is the fact that when you are in the meeting, or as you exit the meeting, how can you have these magical, invisible moments which drive aha for all your users? So let me take you through a few examples. Let's take a simple example. Your users walk into a meeting space, and what is the first thing they do? They're looking for cables, dongles, things to connect and share content. What if that became just so simple, I didn't need to do even lift a finger, one click, and I'm able to share that content seamlessly from any device and, and be able to pair and share. 
What about the fact that your users a lot of times even have friction? What button do I press? We spent a lot of time bringing the big green button to every one of your experiences in terms of starting meetings. We're now taking it to the next level where the user doesn't even need to press the button. He can just speak to the device and say, hey, WebEx, can you start my meeting? Easy? What about the fact that every meeting that you join, typically there's 15 to 20 minutes of conversation happening where folks are just going around introducing themselves. What if that just went away where your name, your name label, your title, and even getting inside of who you are is just visually available to everybody? That took 20 minutes of that meeting, but think across your company the productivity gain that you could have. What about the fact that in every meeting, we always have the angry typer, somebody just banging away. I have one. Jason from my team, you know, is, is very, he does this all the time, where he would just bang away at, at his keyboard. Eight seconds later, he is muted. How, how good is that? What about the fact that many of you at times will work from home, and you have next door your, your neighbor's dog who is barking away? What if the platform was, was, was intelligent where it knew what was the human voice and the dog voice and just suppressed the dog voice? And yes, this is happening. And lastly, as you close out on that meeting, having meeting notes, we always are scrambling around asking each other, hey, did you take notes? Can we compare? What if this happened invisibly? Recording, translation, and transcription, all happening on the fly. And lastly, many of you have built these beautiful rooms and beautiful spaces. How do you get analytics? How do you drive business decisions? How do you start thinking about utilization of these spaces? Again, all something that we've spent a lot of time superpowering through that platform and delivering to your users. So should I show you what the new WebEx is all about? Let's roll the video. Thank you, Sandeep. So what you just saw, this is WebEx here and now. If you went to WebEx today and started using it, this is how it looks like. And every single month, it's going to keep getting better from here on in. So I'm going to touch upon some of the key updates that are coming in in the next two to four months, starting with that first meeting of the day. The meeting that we are driving in, we are on our mobile. That has to be way simpler than it is, right? fumbling for, is my video on, where's the mute button? Available now is the simple mode, or the car mode. You get in, you just swipe right, a simple mute, unmute, your video is already off, you get out, swipe left, and the normal mode is back. Your second meeting of the day could be even more interesting with what we have as the dual camera support. So we've been keeping up with Apple and iOS, the dual cameras, what this is going to allow people to do is, as you see me as a meeting participant, you're also able to see what the other camera is seeing. So see what I'm seeing. And the kind of use cases this can enable, we haven't even scratched the surface. iOS introduced this, so we've incorporated it in the uh, WebEx meetings. So these were quick uh, uh, mobile enhancements. But by far, 
the most significant thing that we have launched this week is the WebEx Assistant for WebEx meetings. Think of this assistant as it's going to grow, get smarter, and get more and more skills over time. But at the get-go, the four things it's going to be able to do is live transcriptions, closed captioning, meeting summaries, and highlights. Uh, the transcriptions are natively supported in English at the get-go. Spanish, French, and German are the next in line. Uh, same thing for translation. I think we're working on Spanish. The other languages will follow um, in the coming months. Uh, the, the transcription itself, you might say, is not new news, right? Have, have any of you used it before in your meetings? No? The, uh, they've, they've always been uh, third-party options available. So whichever meeting conferencing solution you use, you could use a third-party integration, get closed captioning and transcriptions. But that has always been an experiment. People have toyed with it, but never embraced it really. And the reason for that has been the privacy concerns. Every single CIO that we've had conversations with has said, it's my meeting and my intellectual property, my company's intellectual property. And if that's going to go over to a third party somewhere with data centers, God knows where, on top of that, train their AI, they're not going to be comfortable about it. So for them, the baseline has to be that the transcription, the extraction of language or, or summaries from there has to be under a vendor like Cisco, where we have the privacy, data governance, e-discovery, all of that infrastructure already built in and ready. And this, by far, is going to unblock a bunch of use cases where people have just been testing this and never really jumped into it. As we save all of these transcripts within our data centers or our, our data lakes, there's another little use case that it opens up. Um, search and recall. We always go back to our mail clients, search for emails, search for old messages, what was said when and all of that. But we're never able to do that about our meetings. Are we like, the meetings I had, all the meetings I had leading up to this event here, prep, whom did I meet with, what did we discuss, what were the key topics, the follow-ons from there, it was never available. With this, people are able to extract highlights, then edit the, the key points captured by WebEx Assistant, and then share with others, and then search, search through the history. So this almost makes all of our meetings as meetings in the Evernote, if, you, if any of you use uh, Evernote. Um, the skills keep going, growing, and as I said, the interesting skill, Sandeep alluded to it, is the conference room booking problem. How many of you work in open floor plan environments over here? More and more of us are doing that, and the most common scenario, three or four of us get together, we're walking about, can we find a room, can we find a room? And you find one unoccupied one, and you want to lock it down, you want to get it, right? There's no easy way today to get it. You're, you're then going to fumble in your Outlook and try to see the availability and all of that. As opposed to that, talk to the endpoint over there, reserve this room for the next 60 minutes. After you reserve it for 60 minutes, sure enough, there are going to be times when you're running over, you see that you're not wrapping up, tell the WebEx device to say, extend the booking by another 30 minutes. All of these skills uh, that we're talking about, the one common theme you'll notice going forward is whether it's our mobile apps, desktop apps, or the devices, all of these things are showing up concurrently. We're not solving problems differently in all of these uh, different things. And the reason for that is finally, all of our infrastructure, whether it's meetings, calling, messaging, intelligence, it ties together in a single WebEx platform. The way the, the, way the picture describes, it's very clear. On the one hand, you have the experience centers, the same experience delivered, whether it's web, mobile, desktop, Cisco devices, third-party devices, the same flexibility of deployment. It could be in the cloud. There are cases when it makes sense to go hybrid, or it could be on-prem. And then on the other end, it's as open as open can be. Every single software tool your workforce might be using, be it Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, and thousands of workflow apps, we integrate with them at a platform level. What that means is if you're using WebEx Meetings, you'll benefit there. If you're using WebEx Teams, you'll benefit over there. 
And this has been uh, a fairly uh, involved work for the past 12 to 18 months. We've really, really been conscious about pulling it together as a platform. But the endeavor for 2020 is the unified client. And there's a very good reasoning behind that. Having a single platform um, only solves half the problem. Um, so many times, Cisco and others have tried to solve this as, we're going to build that one Uber client, which you're going to uh, use for doing everything. But the problem with that is nobody's going to embrace that one client for doing everything when you've got a platform chosen for messaging, some other platform chosen for maybe calling. And that kind of makes the getting started or adoption difficult. And that's why it's, it's not really unified. Actually, the key word here is modular. The app is becoming modular in that the same WebEx app could be used in the messaging only mode, in the meetings only mode, calling only mode, and we won't stop there, even in a device companion mode. And the reason for that is uh, everything you do in your apps and you're walking about in your open offices, it only comes to life when you pair it with an intelligent WebEx device. More on that, Sandeep? Thank you very much, uh, Amit. That was fantastic. And you know, no event at Cisco Live will go without us making some incredible announcements of our device portfolio. And I want to talk you now through one of the devices which is my favorite. I call it the instant office because it transforms how you think about the modern workplace, bringing intelligence absolutely across every part of how you think about experiences. So let's go ahead and roll with a little video. Can we roll with the video, please? <laughs> Okay, WebEx, book this room for 30 minutes. Got it. The WebEx Desk Pro, 27-inch, 4K, amazing display, intelligence built, built into every part of the experiences that you have from this device. Supports whiteboarding, applications, games, USB-C. It is the most intelligent device that we have built. By the way, who wants to take one of these back with, with them? OK. You're in for a surprise. We are actually giving these away. We call it Spin It to Win It. Go to the World of Solutions, spin one of the wheels, and you could actually win one of these and take it back with you. The Instant Office. Next, I want to talk to you about something that you have been pushing us very hard. Thank you very much for really adopting Huddle in your workplace. The RoomKit Mini, it's been a fantastic success. We provide incredible manageability. But you told us you want us to even help you go into those smaller spaces, start small, and then start thinking about going really big. Well, introducing for the first time is the WebEx Room USB. Incredible device because you bring in your laptop, plug it in, and now with any meeting client, have rich very engaging video. It has a premium sound, wireless sharing. Yes, you can share content. And it also has a remote. So really making it super simple to bring it across, start small, and bring it across all those different spaces. And here's the other thing. We are the first in industry to also allow for an upgrade path. So as you start thinking then of bringing it into 
all the other spaces and have manageability. Very important. When you've got 100 of these devices across your different floor plan, you want to manage them at scale from a single pane of glass. Yes, with the room, room kit mini and the entire portfolio that we have, we will help you manage it at scale. So industry first in terms of providing this up, easy upgrade path and making this transition. I also want to talk about something that you've been with us on, on this journey the last couple of years. I'm so pleased to talk to you about the WebEx board because we started this journey a few years ago. It is something we are truly delivering in terms of the tablet on the wall. It is for business. It is incredible for communication, for video, whiteboarding, but the same device can have applications. Trello, O365, Jira, and yes, even games. So drive engagement on this particular device across the entire workplace. And in recognition of all the great effort that we've done, you know, we've had industry analysts. Wayne House just published a report as of yesterday just talking about the fact that the WebEx board is the most sophisticated, complete solution in terms of driving engagement across the workplace. So I really want you to try the WebEx board, get familiar with it. It is going to drive engagement across your workplace. Lastly, you have been pounding the table and telling us to think, rethink and reimagine immersive in the new, in the new age. How many of you had a chance to take a look at WebEx Room Panorama, our new immersive for the modern C-suite? This is going to win hearts and minds of every C-suite and every boardroom. Please take a look at it at the World of Solutions. We've got an incredible demo, and I believe that this will really drive in, you know, some amazing moments with all these different board, boardrooms and C-suite. For that matter, We've also provided incredible flexibility, which allows you to start thinking about other types of you know, ways to scale this. And let me go ahead and ask them to play the video. Go visit the, the, the panorama at the World of Solutions. So moving forwards, we've also been very hard at work to help drive manageability of all these assets across your platform. To give you more, Amit. Thank you. So Sandeep, all these devices you're going to ship, the hundreds and thousands of them, they're going to create more and more complicated IT challenges. And along everything, right, management, diagnostics, analytics, all of those aspects. Um, about a year ago, this time last year, we didn't really have uh, much of a game in terms of diagnostics or analytics, but we've really, really take, uh, taken big strides in here. I think the key improvements you will see are the live or, or real-time diagnost diagnostics for all of the meetings that might be active at any given point. And to the level, the level at which we are able to uh, manifest that data Every single participant, doesn't matter mobile, um, devices, apps, right down to the packet loss, jitter, all kinds of data that a typical IT support desk would need handy when someone's complaining that a meeting is not going right. This is live, and this actually sets the foundation for how AI will help it get better going forward. Because in the coming months, we're going to have tons and tons of data collected about everywhere, of course, anonymized. But for a given uh, customer or a partner, they now have a, sense, have a sense for, is there a particular location that was running into more reds than others? Is there a particular user or a group of users that is experiencing poor quality than others? And they could build quick correlations to actually get to some proactive steps, as in even avoid that trouble ticket call. In terms of management, the uh, device management in terms of cloud, or even the on-prem devices. We didn't talk about WebEx Edge uh, for devices, but we've also created a way for on-prem devices to get their management and analytics into the control hub. 
And all of these are foundations of building blocks, ultimately, for the control hub to be IT's best friend. Right? It, you can avoid the trouble tickets. If, so, if get one, diagnose those. And more importantly, do cool stuff to optimize your real estate resources. Because the tons of data that we are going to have with the room in-room analytics, what was the occupancy? Was it an eight-person room typically occupied by two people? All of that's now available, and it's going to be mined proactively. Sandeep, if you want to add something here. Now, this is absolutely something which I believe will help drive decision-making, analytics, and optimiz optimization as you're thinking about the next generation of your workplace. So, Amit. What does that look like? We spent time hopefully taking you through a journey of winning hearts and minds for your users. We've also been very focused about winning hearts and minds for IT. But is this all real? And I want to take you through a little journey within Cisco ourselves. We ourselves have actually taken this same playbook and applied it internally. So I want to show you a little video of our office in Singapore. And this is very dear to me because actually about a year ago, I moved to Oslo. And prior to that, I used to be based out of this office in Singapore. And when I went there to Singapore about four years ago, it wasn't the most inspiring office. It was one which was unengaging. You know, we found that folks didn't want to come back into the office because they just didn't drive engagement. We did certain very unique things to bring back that engagement. Let's go ahead and play the video, please. And folks, that is all real. And you know what? Here's how we started tracking engagement. We now have things like we look at badge in rates. 40% increase in badge in. The people in that office, they love coming into work. We're in fact also finding that while talent retention in the past used to be a challenge, we're now getting a flurry of resumes from companies, even our competitors. They want to come and work for Cisco. And lastly, this big exercise that was done, it actually gave a massive cost saving to, uh, to the company, 12 and a half million over five years. And that actually gave the opportunity to go transform that office. So a hugely powerful story. I'd love to have you also join in that journey to think about how you can modernize that experience and win hearts and minds across the workplace. So as I end along with Amit, whether your users are working from home, on their mobile phone, in huddle spaces, large spaces, the boardroom, we at Cisco have you covered with the most incredible capabilities to drive uh, engagement and win hearts and minds of all of those users. So with that, thank you so much for being here. And begin the journey by going to the booth, spin to win at De Desk Pro. World of Solutions. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. What a great innovation talk about collaboration. And uh, let's keep talking collaboration now. So this show, what I find is always a 
uh, gets, attracts a lot of the techies, it's the people that want to learn more and more about the technology. But it's also at the end of the day about our people and that's what collaboration is all about. Uh, WebEx teams and WebEx, uh, the actual WebEx platform is all about humanizing technology. And so David's out in the world of solutions in the collaboration booth and you're going to talk a little bit more about the collaboration platform. Who have you got there, David? Yeah, hi Nish, thanks. Uh, I'm in the collaboration booth and it's very busy outside, but luckily we've managed to snag the, I think, the only quiet room at Cisco Live. So it's a bit of a luxury, we can talk a little bit quieter than we've had to in the past couple of days. Um, I'm here with uh, Anders Modvet, who's a um, senior product manager for Cisco, and Andy Johnson, product marketing manager for Cisco. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Now we're talking here about collaboration, and I just spied uh, on the desk there, that is a really cool looking piece of kit that you've got there, Anders. What are we looking at? This is our brand new WebEx Desk Pro. Uh, it's an all-in-one device with everything you need. It's designed to be on the desk uh, in your office or in a kind of a jump room, a small huddle room where it could be two or three people sitting together and using this. Um, there's a lot of really nice features on this uh, system. It's a 4K screen that allows you to use this as your PC monitor. You connect your laptop only with one cable, and that is USB-C. That also gives you power to charge your laptop. Perfect for the huddle spaces and the shared environments. And of course, it's a super nice video conferencing device as well with an automatic camera, inbuilt microphones that will really create this bubble around you to uh, move out all the noise in the background. And it's also a fantastic audio system, which is actually is more than just in front of here, but it goes inside the system as well and use the whole volume of the system. So the team has done a fantastic job. And the feedback we've had this week has been tremendous and uh, customers are lining up to see it and the feedback, as I said, has been fantastic. Now this is the first look that we're getting at these devices, correct? Yes. Absolutely. So you've got to hear an exclusive from Cisco Live in Barcelona. And uh, just as you were speaking, I spied this headset that you've got on the side of the, uh, the Desk Pro there. Uh, great new looking things. Um, as the workplace is transforming, is it sort of a, a growing requirement for headsets, Andy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as, uh, as employees are becoming more mobile, uh, so they need to uh, use their headsets uh, with their, their, their smartphones, their, their PCs, their Macs, and with their desktop systems, uh, particularly as uh, some of the modern workplaces, they're more of an open office environment, there's a lot of background noise. So uh, we, we set out really to design a headset that is uh, designed for, for business use, for personal use, and the journey between. And the guys have done a great job, we think they're fantastic looking. Yeah, perfect. And obviously Cisco may not be as well known as other headset manufacturers. Why would Cisco pick, uh, sorry, why would a customer pick a Cisco headset over one from an a, a established competitor or, or even uh, from a consumer headset? Well, there are two, two main reasons. First of all, if you focus on the user experience. As you can see, it's a, it's a really convenient and comfortable, uh, boomless design. And we've put a lot of work into the, the audio systems here uh, with uh, fantastic high quality 40 millimeter speakers and uh, uh, a lot of um, voice honing, uh, noise cancelling and uh, background noise suppression in the microphone arrays on both sides here so that y you as the user of these headsets gets an amazing audio experience but also the person you're speaking to uh, uh, gets crystal clear audio on the, on the other end of the call as well. The second thing is, is our benefits for the IT team. So uh, first of all, we've, we've done some uh, quite unique things in terms of hardware and software uh, protection for Bluetooth devices. But we've also, uh, because we don't see these as an accessory, uh, because they're part of our overall collaboration system, we can make it easy for IT managers to uh, provision, uh, maintain, uh, deploy, and troubleshoot. Perfect. And this is all very good for the individual worker, but what have we got for the boardroom? Yes, the, uh, the good thing is that we have some fantastic news from, uh, for the boardroom as well. Uh, so we're in this uh, WebEx room, panorama room here, which is actually a meeting room for the executives. It's actually solving the meeting room, allowing the people sitting here in the room to have a really good dialogue in between themselves, having a great local meeting, but at the same time be able to speak to any location around the world and get the feeling of actually being in the same room. And in the past, these kind of experiences have been kind of locked into, you have to build a dedicated studio, it's dedicated furniture. So the new thing about this is that we're now bringing this super experience into the actual meeting room where people meet and sit and work. And you can have your local meeting, you can have your video meeting, or you can have your immersive video seeing 
all the participants on the other side at any given time at the same time and also have the presentation there. So feedback on this product here as well has been fantastic and our existing customers just love it. Perfect. So you've heard it here. A couple of great new, uh, brand new devices uh, to enable some really amazing new collaboration experiences from the collaboration team here. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to describe what these look like over video, but you definitely have to try and uh, get down to a Cisco Live to see them in person. Or alternatively, you know, get in touch with your Cisco account management team, organize a demo or a tour in one of our centers. And I think uh, we're heading back to the studio with Nish. Yes, that's right, Thanks, David. Nish. Thank you, David. So I was taking a look at the hashtag CLEUR on Twitter, and I saw as well that the collaboration booth are giving away WebEx Pros at uh, Desk Pros if you do take a look. So make sure you go down to the collaboration booth. But I'm here in the studio at the moment. I'm with Johan. Johan, you're our collaboration technology leader uh, here at Cisco in EMEA. How are you doing? That's right. Thank you very much for having us. I'm doing fine, thank you. Thank you for joining us. So obviously collaboration seems to have a lot of excitement around the show. We saw it in the keynote, we saw some demos as well. Um, and we've heard about some of the great exciting things that are coming up here, obviously from Sandeep and from Amit as well in the innovation uh, showcase. So how much are you seeing customers trying to transform and, and change their workplace? What are you seeing when you meet customers? We see a tremendous amount of requests coming in. You know, many of the companies, the budgets are not going up, they're rather going down and mm -hmm. people are trying to look to productivity. How can we do more efficient operation um, in, in the business we're in? So we do see um, the, the era of knowledge is power has gone away. It's now sharing is caring. So yes. if you want to do sharing is caring, obviously you need the right tools to be able to do that, to work together either remotely or in the same office. So we see a lot of this, uh, I'd say modernize the workforce is, is a, good, uh, a good theme to summarize it in. Uh, so we see that in the offices, we see, we see that in team tools. And I think the technology that we've brought out is, is, uh, is facilitating that. It's making you know, all the cognitive stuff. It's making that all much easier for people to start working together, either with visuals or texting or persistent messaging, uh, or just easy to use. Absolutely, and so here at the show, you've been meeting with customers, you've been meeting with Cisco partners as well. So what would you say are some of your key takeaways uh, from the show so far? Because I know we've got a little bit of time left. Yeah, we see, we see a lot of customers. I've been doing executive tools in the booth, um, and many of the things, there's, there's actually a few topics that keep on coming back. So I'd say the number one request is like, hey, this modernize, help me modernize the workforce experience, right? So with the new launch of the endpoints, the products, the Room Panorama, the Desk Pro, the Room Kit USB, that's not my num the number one topic I'm being asked for. And then number two, obviously, is, is our announcements with Microsoft and the CVI, the cloud uh, uh, you know, interoperability, the validation uh, with Microsoft, because pretty much every, every of our customers has got some way or form of Microsoft in their, in their workforce. And then the third one is very specific to Europe, and it's, it's really down to privacy, compliance. Yes. It, we're a US-based company, obviously, but you know, we do have a lot of data centers, and you know, there's Brexit, and there's a, there's a few other things happening, so people just ask questions, like, hey, how is this working with privacy, compliance, where are your data centers, and, and how is the operation actually running? And I heard a phrase earlier, it was collaboration without compromise, right? And I love that phrase, specifically around like, the security piece of there's no compromise when you get this great single meeting platform. Um, so talking about the single collaboration platform, we're talking about calling, meeting, man, um, and device management as well. What value do customers see in all of this coming together into this single WebEx platform? So when, when I talk to the multinational customers, many of them go like, listen, we're, we're global. Yeah. So we need to have a platform, one single platform that allows us to see everything. So that's, that's, a, that's a number one ask. You know, that's one of the main advantages of having one platform. Obviously having all of the workloads on this platform allows you to migrate seamlessly. And you, we have this mantra that goes like this, cloud first, but not cloud only. So it allows us to migrate from on-prem into the cloud, so like the typical hybrid solutions. Um, obviously, as I mentioned before, the security is crucial. Absolutely. You cannot afford to be non-secure as a cloud vendor. Um, and the interoperability key uh, is, is obviously a key. Now, the last one, and that is really the ace card, is, is if, if, if you have one platform, you obviously have a lot of data. So we, have, we collect about more than 200 million QoS, quality of service data endpoints per day on all the meetings. Wow. Imagine you could start linking that into other solutions like, hey, there's something wrong with your flow, if there's some delay or some jitter, or some, something not right. How about automating that into your LAN, into your WAN, and making sure there's no IT ticket opened 
Well, that's what the, the single platform allows you to do. That's amazing. It's coming in phase, obviously, but that's the, that's the promise of a single platform. So, and also the, leveraging the power of all that data that's collecting, right? So we've talked a little bit about small business here at the show as well. Um, and obviously Cisco has launched Design for Business. So obviously I think, I mean, you can tell us a little bit more maybe about how that collaboration platform is suitable for small businesses as well, right, with the WebEx platform. So we, we, we want to make um, a, a platform and a product and a service that is very intuitive and is, is going to be optimized from the biggest enterprise as well down to the, uh, the smaller medium business. So we try and make it very intuitive, very easy to sign up um, and, and then very easy to use, obviously. Um, so it's, it's right there from the top enterprise with all the compliance and you know data privacy, data loss prevention, all their systems and demands, as well as down to the individual user where they can actually easily sign up and get things done. So it really is a one for all <laughs> with the, the customization as well. So uh, for those customers that are here at the show or maybe they're taking a look and joining us online, what's the first step that they can take towards really kind of starting to learn more about the, the Cisco collaboration platform? Nish, thank you for that question. I, <laughs> I love that question because I get a lot like, yeah, I'm sold. Now where, what? Where, <laughs> now what? Where do we go? So it's just it's super easy. Go on, on WebEx.com and sign up for a WebEx Teams account. It comes with a lot of free, uh, we call this uh, the freemium model, right? a lot of features. You don't need to pay for anything. It just, it's just there for you to use. And uh, you, you can download it on, on your smartphone. The moment you walked into a collaboration-enabled room, these devices will start talking to each other. And there you have it. That's your remote control. Your meetings, your information, your information is all there already on your smartphone. One click or one tap in this case, and your meeting happens. That's the magic of collaboration. I know, and I so can say I've experienced easy. that firsthand, right? Because being at Cisco, we're using our own technology, we're collaborating with each other. We're a big enough company as it is, but it feels like the world can be a very small place when you have some of the great technology Absolutely. That we have. So thank you so much for joining me, Johan. So we're now going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to wrap up the collaboration session, and we're moving into the Advo chat for security. So this is a customer speaking opportunity. It's hosted in a talk show format. It's taking place at the Gateway booth, just along behind me here at uh, Cisco Live Europe 2020. And this time we're going to be spoken, focusing specifically around security. So we're going to have with us uh, Michael Jenkins. He joined us in the studio earlier this week talking about Brunel University and some of the challenges and experiences that he has as a CISO there. Uh, enjoy the Advo chat for security and don't go anywhere, stay right there. Thanks. Fire, humanity's first brilliant idea, until it wasn't. Walls, more human progress. Build one, then knock your head against it. In 1851, humanity had the good sense to put fire and wall together, creating the firewall, keeping the inside safe and the outside danger out. It worked for buildings, cars, even rocket ships. 130 years later, the internet, humanity's second most brilliant idea fired up, a wide open network. The problem? Well, it's a wide open network. What did we need to keep the nasty things out and prevent the whole business from being torched? Once again, a firewall is the answer. An electronic wall with controlled access, connecting the good outside with the good inside, keeping bad actors, both human and cyber, on the outside. In the 90s, stateful inspection fine-tuned practices and permissions, and VPN allowed authorized users outside to be treated like they were inside your four walls. In the 2000s, we added stateful firewalling with application visibility and control, AVC, next-gen intrusion prevention systems, IPS, and URL filtering.